Section 1 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. O. Martin. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Section 1. Charlie Aarons, Personal Contact with Uncle Charlie Aarons, Oak Grove, Alabama, written by Mary A. Poole. He loved young Marster John. Some friends driving to Oak Grove, Alabama, gave the writer the opportunity on August 4th to interview an old ex-slave, Charlie Aarons, who is quite venerable in appearance and who, when asked his age, replied, Madam, I don't know, but I sure been round here a long time. And when asked how old he was at the time of the surrender, he answered, I was a man able to do a man's work, so I specs I was 18 or 20 years old. Uncle Charlie, as he is known among his own color and the white people who know him, told the writer he was born at Petersburg, Virginia, and his parents, Aaron and Louisa, were owned by a Mr. J. H. White, who had a store in the city, but no plantation. His parents had three children, two boys and one girl, and when Uncle Charlie was about ten years of age, he was sold by Mr. White to a speculator named Jones, who brought him to Mobile. He recalled being placed on the block at the slave mart on Royal and State Streets, and the anxiety of hearing the different people bidding for him, and being finally sold to a Mr. Jason Harris, who lived near Newton Station in Jasper County, Mississippi. Uncle Charlie never saw or heard of his parents or brother and sister again and never knew what became of them. Uncle Charlie said Mr. Harris was a pretty rough master and somewhat close. All rations were weighed out and limited. He had a white overseer and a Negro driver who was the meanest of all. Mr. Jason Harris had about 60 slaves and a large plantation of a 100 acres. The men and women worked in the fields from six to six, except on Saturday, when they had half-day holiday to clean up generally. The home of the Harris family was a large two-story house, and the quarters were the regular log cabins with clay chimneys. They cooked in their cabins, but during the busy season in the fields, their dinners were sent out to them, each slave having his own tin pail marked with his name. Water would be sent out in a barrel mounted on an ox cart. The old men and women looked after the children of the slaves while their parents worked in the fields. When the writer asked Uncle Charlie if his master or mistress ever taught him to read or write, he smiled and said, No, madam, only to work. When asked if they had any special festivities at Christmas or any other holiday, he replied, no, we had no special jollifications. Saturday nights they would sing and dance in the quarters and have prayer meetings. Then on some Sundays they would hitch up the mules to a big wagon and all go to the white folks church. And again there would be camp meetings held and the slaves from all the surrounding plantations would attend, going to same in these large wagons, sometimes having four mules to a wagon. They then would have a jolly time along the way, singing and calling to one another and making friends. Uncle Charlie said he drove many a load of cotton in the large mule wagons from Newton Station to Enterprise, Mississippi. When asked if that wasn't a chance to run away, he replied, Get away, why, madam, those nigger dogs would track you and all you got was a beating. Uncle Charlie seemed to look off in the distance and said, you know, madam, I never saw a slave rebuked until I came to Mississippi, and I just couldn't understand at first. But he grinned and said, Lordy, madam, some of those niggers were ornery, too, and a nigger driver was a driver sure enough. When the master's son, John Harris, went to war, Charlie went with him as his bodyguard, and when asked what his duties were, he replied, I looked after Master John. 
tended the horses and the tents. I recalls well, madam, the siege of Vicksburg. The writer then asked him if he wasn't afraid of the shot and shell all around him. No, madam, he replied. I kept way in the back where the camp was, for I didn't like to feel the earth trembling neath my feet. But you see, madam, I loved young Master John, and he loved me, and I just had to watch over that boy, and he came through all right. Uncle Charlie said that when they were told the Yankees were coming through from their headquarters in, in Meridian, Mississippi, and warned of their raids, they all made to the swamps and stayed until they had passed on, but that the Yankees did not disturb the Jason Harris plantation. After the surrender, Charlie came to Mobile and worked at the Yankee camp, living in the quarters located in Holly's Garden. He drove their wagons and was paid $14 a month and his keep. After his discharge, he worked on steamboats and followed different lines of work, being employed for several years at Mr. M. L. Davis's sawmill and is at present living on the Davis Place at Oak Grove, Alabama, an old southern home with quarters originally built for the employees of the mill and still known as the quarters, and like other antebellum homes, they have their private burying ground on the place. Uncle Charlie was married four times, but now a widower. He had four children, two boys who are dead, and two girls, one Carrie Johnson, a widow living in Kushla, Alabama, and the other Ella Ahrens, a grass widow living in Mobile, Alabama. Uncle Charlie says he saw Jeff Davis as an old man after the war at Mississippi City, Mississippi, and then his face lit up and he said, Wait a minute, madam. I saw another president. Let me think. Yes, madam. I saw President Grant. He came through Mobile from New Orleans, and my, there was a big parade that day. When asked about Abraham Lincoln, Uncle Charlie thought a while and answered, According to what was issued out in the Bible, there was a time for slavery. People had to be punished for their sin, and then there was a time for it not to be, and the Lord had opened a good view to Mr. Lincoln, and he promoted a good idea. When he was asked about Booker T. Washington, he replied, It was traversed out to him until the white folks took part with him and helped him carry on. Uncle Charlie thinks the present-day folks are bad and wicked and don't realize anything like the old folks. Charlie is a Baptist, became one when he sought the Lord, and thinks all people should be religious. End of section 1section two of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dr martin Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, Section 2, Anthony Abercrombie, Interview with Anthony Abercrombie, Susan R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama. Old Joe Can Keep His Two Bits. Uncle Anthony sat dozing in the early morning sunshine on his rickety front porch. He is a thin little old man with patches of white wool here and there on his bald head and an expression of kindness and gentleness on his wrinkled old face. As I went cautiously up the steps, which appeared none too safe, his cane, which had been leaning against his chair, fell to the floor with a clatter. He awoke with a start and began fumbling around for it with his trembling and bony hands. Uncle Anthony, you don't see so well, do you? I asked as I recovered the stick for him. No, ma'am, I sure don't, he replied. I ain't seen none out in one of my eyes in near about sixty years, and the doctor say I got a Cadillac on the other one, but I knows you as white folks. I always has been puny, but I reckon I does pretty well considering I is a hundred years old. How do you know you are that old? I inquired of him. 
Without hesitation, he answered, I knows I's that old, cause my mistress put it down in de Bible. I was born on de fourth day, and I was a full growed man when de war come on in 61. My mind kinder comes and goes, but I can always remember about slavery time. It's de things what happen in these days that's so easy for me to just remember. I belong to Master Jim Abercrombie. His plantation was about 16 miles north of Marion in Bibb County. When his son, young Jim, married all Mars Jim gave me to him and he fetched me to Perry County. No, old master didn't go to war cause he was corrupted. He was deaf in both ears and couldn't see good nother. But he didn't care much about me cause I was puny like and weren't much count in the field. My mistress, Miss Lou, was raising me up to be a carriage driver, and she was just as good to me as she could be. She used to dose me up with castor oil, jimson root, and dogwood tea when I'd be feeling holy, and she'd always take up for me when Marsh Jim get in behind me about something. I reckon though I was a pretty worrisome nigger in them days, always getting in some kind of mischief. Oh, yes, am I used to go to meetin'. Us niggers didn't have no meetin' house on de plantation, but Mars Jim allowed us to build a brush arbor. Then two years atter de surrender, I took consideration and jined up with de lard. That's how come I live so long. De lard done told me, Antony, you got a hundred and twenty miles to travel. That mean you're going to live a hundred and twenty years if you stay on de straight and narrow road. But if you don't, you gotta go just the same as all the others. Tell me something about your master's slaves and his overseers, I asked him. Well, he said, Marsh Jim had about 300 slaves, and he had one mighty bad overseer. But he got killed down on the bank of the creek one night. They never did find out who killed him, but Marsh Jim always believed the field hands done it. For that, us niggers used to go down to the creek to wash ourselves, but atter the overseer got killed down dar, us just leave off dat washin, cause some of em see the overseers can't down dar floatin over the creek. Dar was another hand on the plantation too. Marsh Jim had some trouble with a big double jointed nigger named Joe. One day he turned on Marsh Jim with a fence rail, and Marsh Jim had to pull his gun and kill him. Well, that happened in a skirt of woods, what I get my light wood, what I used to start a fire. One day I went to them same woods to get some simmons. Another nigger went with me, and he clung the tree to shake the simmons down whilst I be picking em up. For long I heard another tree shaking every time us shake our tree. That other tree shaked too, and down came the simmons from it. I say to myself, that's Joe, cause he likes Simmons too. Then I grab up my basket and holler to the boy in the tree. Nigger, turn loose and drop down from dar, and catch up with me if you can. I's leaving here right now, cause old Joe is over dar getting Simmons too. Then another time I was in the woods chopping lightwood. It was about sundown, and every time my axe go whack on the lightwood knot, I hear another whack sides mine. I stops and listens and don't hear nothing. Then I starts chopping again. I hears the other whacks. By that time, my hound dog was crouching at my feet with the hair standing up on his back, and I couldn't make him get up nor budge. This time, I didn't stop for nothing. I just dropped my axe right thar, and me and that hound dog tore out for home. Look at he split. When us got thar, Mars Jim was sitting on the porch, and he say, Nigger, you been up to something. You got no business. You is all out in breath. Who you running from? Then I say, Mars Jim, somebody besides me is chopping in your woods, and I can't see him. And Marsh Jim, he say, ah, that ain't nobody but old Joe. Did he owe you anything? And I say, yes, sir, he owe me two bits for helping him shuck corn. Well, Marsh Jim say, don't pay him no mind. It just old Joe come back to pay you. Anyhow, I didn't go back to them woods no more. 
old Joe can just have the two bits what he owe me, cause I don't want him follerin round at me. When he do, I can't keep my mind on my business. End of section two. Section 3 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by various. Molly Ammond, Ammons. Interview with Molly Ammond, Ammons. Gertha Corrick. Jesus has my chill encountered. I walked along a dusty road under the blazing sun. In the shade of a willow tree, a negro man was seated with his legs drawn up and his arms crossed upon his knees. His head rested face downward upon his arms, as he had the aspect of one in deep slumber. Beside him, munching on a few straggly weeds, a cantankerous mule took little notice of his surroundings. "'Can you tell me where Aunt Molly Ammons lives?' I asked in a loud voice. The negro stirred slowly, finally raising his head and displaying three rabbit teeth. He accompanied his answer with a slight gesture of his hand. Yes, sir. Da her house right across de road. De house wid de climbing roses on it. Thank you, I said. Yes, sir, was the drawled response, and the negro quickly resumed his former posture. Aunt Molly Ammons is as gentle as a little child, her voice is soft and each phrase measured to the slow functionings of her aged mind. Honey, she said, you ain't gwine to believe this. But I is de mammy of thirty chillins. Jesus got em counted and so is me. I was born in a log cabin dat had a loft, and it was on Mars Lee Cato's plantation five miles west of you Fowler. My pappy's name was Toby Cato, and my mammy's was Sophia. I had one sister, Marthy, and two brothers, Bong and Togue. My pappy made all de furniture dat went in our house, and it were might good furniture too. Us used to cook on de fireplace, us would cook ash cakes, they was made out in meal, water, and a little pinch of lard. On Sundays, they was made out in flour, buttermilk, and lard. Mammy would rake all the ashes out de fireplace, then kiver de cake with de hot ashes and let it cool till it was done. Yes, Missy, she continued. I recollect that I was about twelve or fourteen when de surrender come. Cause a little after that, I made past almonds. We walked over to Georgetown, and it was de first time I ever had shoes and I got them from old Massa. I remembers that I made in a striped calico dress. Aunt Molly, I said, you're getting a little ahead of your story. Tell me something about your plantation life before the war. Well, honey, Massa Lee's place was about three miles long and two miles wide. We raised cotton, corn, taters, and all sorts of vegetables. We the mean overseer did always wanted to whoop us, but Massa wouldn't allow no whooping. Sometimes the Massa would ride over the place on a horse, and when he come up on the overseer a fussin at a nigger, Massa say, Don't talk rough to dat nigger when he doin de best he can. My pappy had a little garden of his own back of his cabin, and he raised some chickens for us to eat, and we'd eggs nearly every morning. The only work I done on de plantation was de nuss some little niggers when their mammy and pappy was in de fields. Twant hard. No, sir, I ain't never seed no slave in chains. Massa Lee was a good man. He had a church built called de brush house that had a flow and some seats and a top made out in pine bows and Massa's pa, Mr. Cato, would preach every Sunday. We sung songs like, I hear de voice of Jesus say, and I's gwine to die no mo. We was all baptized in de creek, but none of us was taught to read or write. No, sir, I ain't never seed no slave run away. Us was treated fine. Our folks was quality. We had plenty some and teat. But dem slaves had to work powerful hard, though. Either they come home from de fields, they was so tired that they go right to sleep, except when de Massa had barbecues. Christmas was de big time. There were several days to rest and make merry, and lots of dem no-count niggers got drunk. When our slaves were sick, Massa Lee would send to you Fowler to fetch Dr. Thornton to give us some medicine. We had de best treatment ever. Yes, sir, white folks, dem days is long ago. All my chillins done died or wandered away and my old man been dead going on twenty years. I been here a long time by myself. Aunt Molly, I interrupted, there's one thing I've always been wanting to ask one of you ex-slaves, and that is, what do you thought of people like Abraham Lincoln, 
Jeffrey Davis, and Booker T. Washington. A puzzled expression came off the face of the old Negro. White folks, she said after a moment's deliberation. I don't believe I has had the pleasure of meeting them gentlemen's. End of section three, read by Inkel. Section four of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume one, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dr. O. Martin. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Section 4. Interview with Charity Anderson. Isla B. Prine. Charity Anderson, who believes she is 101 years old, was born at Bell's Landing on the Alabama River, where her owner, Leslie Johnson, operated a woodyard, which supplied fuel to the river steamers and a tavern where travelers whiled away the delays of a dubious riverboat schedule. Rheumatic and weak, she no longer ventures from her house in Tolmanville on the outskirts of Mobile, but sits with her turbaned head and bespectacled eyes, rocking the long hours away in a creaky old chair and knitting or sewing or just gazing into a past painted by the crackling flames in the fireplace. I has so much trouble getting up and down de steps and over de ground. I just makes myself happy here, cause, thank de Lord, eyes on Zion's march, is her resigned comment. Missy, peoples don't live now, and niggers ain't got no manners, and don't know nothin' about waitin' on folks. I can remember the days when I was one of de house servants. There was six of us in de old massa's house. Me, Sarah, Lou, Hester, Jerry, and Joe. Us didn't know nothin' but good times done. My job was lookin' at her de corner table, where nothin' but de dessert set. Joe and Jerry, they was de table boys. They never touched nothin' with their hands, but used a waiter to pass things with. My old master was a good man. He treated all his slaves kind and took good care of em. But honey, all de white folks wasn't good to their slaves. I seen po niggers most tore up by dogs and whooped till they bled when they didn't do like de white folks say. But thank de Lord, I had good white folks and they show did trust me too. I had charge of all de keys to de house and I waited on de missus and de chillin. I laid out all the clothes on Saturday night and then Sunday mornings I'd pick up all de dirty things. They didn't have a thing to do. Us house servants had a hard job keeping the pickaninnies out of the dining room where old massa et, cause when they would slip in and stand by his chair, when he finished eating, he would fix a plate for em and let em set on the hearth. No, ma'am, missy, I ain't never worked in the fields. Old massa, he never planted no cotton, and I ain't seen none planted till after I was free. But, honey, I could show enough wash, iron, and knit and weave. Sometimes I weaved six or seven yards of cloth and do my housework, too. I learned the chillin' how to weave and wash and iron and knit, too, and I's waited on the fourth generation of our family. I just wish I could tell these young chillin' how to do. If and they would only suffer me to talk to them, I'd tell them to be more respectful to their mammies and to their white folks and say yes ma'am and no ma'am instead of yes and no like they do now. All this generation thinks of is amusement. I never had seen a show in my whole life till just this past year when one of them carnival things with the swings and lights and all the doings they have stopped right in front of our house here. And I ain't never been in no trouble in all my life, ain't been in no lawsuits, and ain't been no witness even. I always treat 
everybody as good as I can, and I uses my manners as good as I knows how, and the Lord show has took good care of me. Why, when my house burned up, the white folks helped me so that in no time you couldn't tell I ever lost a thing. But honey, the good old days is now gone forever. The old days was really the good times. How I wish I could go back to the days when we lived at Johnson's Landing on the river, when the folks would come to catch the steamboats, and we never knowed how many to put on breakfast, dinner, or supper foe, cause the boats might be behind times. I ain't never had to pay a fare to ride a steamboat, neither. I was a good-looking yeller gal in them days and rid free wherever I wanted to go. But what's the use dreamin' bout the old times? Days gone, and the world is gettin' wickeder and wickeder. Sin grows bolder and bolder, and religion colder and colder. End of section 4「Section Five of Slave Narratives: A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume One, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc Deal Martin. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, Section 5. Interview with Gus Askew, Gerta Horick. That was one time when the band was playing and flags was flying that us little niggers didn't get no joy out in it. Gus Askew smiled at the thought of the occasion as he sat on the sunny steps of his comfortable house in Eufaula. Gus was telling about the investment of Eufaula during the war between the states. General Gerson and his men marched right through town, Gus went on with his story of his boyhood. Mr. Lincoln done said we was free, but us little niggers was too scared to listen to any band music, even if in the soldiers had come to set us free. Peers like us was all us gettin' in somebody's way in dem days and gettin' scared of somethin'. But we went on away from the soldiers and had a good time amongst ourselves like we always done when there wasn't any cotton pickin'. Cotton pickin' time was when we didn't have any chance to do any playin'. After the surrender, I didn't have to do any more cotton picking, and I went blacksmithing for Joe Sturgis. He was the first blacksmith in dis here town. I was the second. Now my son done took on to work. They ain't so much sense all these here automobiles done got so plentiful and might nigh ruin the business. But for seventy years, I rise with your son and went to that blacksmith shop. I's enjoying a little misery now, so I's taken my rest. Gus Askew was born a slave of the Edwards family in Henry County in 1853. He was brought to Eufaula just before the close of the war and stayed on as a blacksmith after he was freed. In his 70 years of hard work, he saved enough to buy his home and some property, which maintains him and his wife, since age and infirmity forced him to turn over the work to his son. He has been married 54 years, numbers his white friends by the hundreds, and is held in great respect by his own race. End of section 5 Section 6 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc Deal Martin. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, Section 6. Interview with Tom Baker, Susie R. O'Brien. 
Show, I recollects about his slavery days, said Uncle Tom as he whittled shavings from a soft piece of white pine. I lived on a plantation down in Perry County, and I remembers a story about something that happened to me away back dar. I was a water boy for fifty field hands that worked in the sun all day long, and I had a carry many a bucket from the spring that was one field over from where most of them was workin'. The spring run down between some willow trees, and it was powerful cool down there in the shade. I used to lie on the moss and let my bare belly get cool and put my face in the outlet of the spring and let the water trickle over my head. Just about the time I gets a little rest, one of them niggers would call, Water boy, bring that bucket. Then I grab up the bucket and run back out in the hot sun. One day, on my last trip, I was mighty tired, and I flopped down on that moss with the sweat a-drippin' from my body, and, though I knowed it, I done fell slap to sleep. When I woke up, it was almost dark, and I couldn't hear the slaves a-singing in the fields, so I knowed that they had gone home. I shake my head and look about me, and my eyes came to rest on a little black bear cub a-drinkin' out in the spring. He so was a cute little booger, and I made up my mind right then to try and catch him. I was just a little nigger, about ten year old, and I didn't have no sense, but I sure wanted that little bear. He ain't seed me a settin' there, so I snuck up real cautious like, and afore he knowed it, I had that little devil a squealin' in my hands. I was just about to start home with him when I hears a rustlin' in the bushes, and afore I went ten feet, here come a big black bear a lopin along right out in them willow trees. I dropped that little critter, cause I knowed that was his mammy, and she was ravin' mad. When I let the little feller fall, it must have hurt him something awful, cause he how mowed an ebber and went a limpin up to his mammy. Well, sir, that old woman, she got so mad she made for me like two bolts of lightning. But these here feats of mine begin a doin' their stuff. I knowed she was a gainin' on me, so I lets out a hoop for help. She chased me across that empty field, and about that time I seen Big Jim a comin' through a row of con. Hurry, Big Jim, I calls. A bear is at her me. Big Jim was the biggest nigger on our place. He must have weighed as much as half a bale of cotton. I was just about getting to the edge of the con when that bear catched me. He give me a slap with his paw and I goes down with my mouth a scooping up the dust. My back felt like somebody done put a hot iron on it. That bear was a mean one. I was expecting her to chaw me up and I drawed my body up in a knot and kivered my head with my hands and waited. But that bear never touched me again. I kind of snuck my eye around, and I saw Big Jim having it out with her. Jim, he had a long knife, and they was a tumbling and a rolling in the dust, while I sat there with my eyes a popping out of my head and my back feeling like it was broke. Jim, he wrapped his legs round that bear, and for you knowed it, he had done stuck that old critter a dozen times with that knife. About fifteen minutes later, me and Jim was a-walkin' back through the con field, and I guess we looked a sight, cause I was all tore up, and Jim, he looked like he'd done mess up with a family of wildcats. He was bleeding from head to foot. When we walked into the big house to get some treatments and medicine for our hurts, Mistress was a-standin' there, and when she seed me and Jim, she almost faint. She say, what done happened to my niggers? Atter me and Jim got fixed up, I was just as happy, as I done seed the best fight there ever was, and I had me a little orphan bear cub. End of section six. Section seven of Slave Narratives. A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dr. Martin.
slave narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, Section 7. Interview with Henry Barnes, Isla B. Prine, Mobile. He misses them set down hogs. In Pritchard, a suburb of Mobile, lives an old blind Negro, Uncle Henry Barnes, who says he was born in 1858 near Shugsville, Clark County, Alabama. Cause I was born to slave, but I don't remember much about it, cause I was little. There is one thing I does remember, and that was when they cut watermelons at the overseer's house, and they want us little niggers run races to get our peace. I just wouldn't run, and my mammy, she whup me, case I so stubborn, and when I get my piece of melon, I fly down the lane where our log cabins was. Them cabins was daubed with clay, and the chimneys was built out in clay and stick. Our beds was homemade and had tree legs with the other side nailed to the wall. I remember at her I got a big boy. My mammy had a bed made out in lumber and I slept in that bed while I was growed and married. I remembers us as old mistress, Miss Dell. Miss Dell was a good mistress as she used to have Sunday school ever Sunday morning at the big house and all us little niggers went up there for her to teach us about the Bible and Jesus. Mars John was good to all his slaves and he wouldn't stand no rush or meanness to his niggers. If an the overseer got mean, old Marster would turn him off. Old Marster always took good care of his slaves. Cause when they got sick, he had the doctor, just like when the white folks got sick. One of Mars John's boys, Mars Benny, was a doctor, and he was a good doctor, seppin he gin us bad medicine, but he cured you. Cause us hab our medicine sick lack elderbush tea. It was red most lack whiskey, and us used hit for fever. Then there was red sassafras tea for spring fever, and they made Jerusalem oak candy full of seeds and give them to the chillins to eat so they could get rid of worms. Dennis had mullen and pine top tea for colds and fever, and when us had a swellin', they made a poultice of mullen leaves to take the swellin' out. Sometimes I wishes that I could be back to the old place, cause us did have plenty to eat, and at hog killin' time, us had a mornin' a plenty. Old Marster kill eight or ten set down hogs at one time, and a meat, and a lard, and a hog dough, and a chitlins. Mmm, I can see em now. What a set down hog? It's a hog what done et so much corn he got so fat that he feet can't hold him up and he just sit on he hind quarters and grunts and eats and eats and grunts twill they knock him in the head. Then was show good times, case us had all us could eat then, and plenty sugar cane to make lasses outen, and they made up biscuits in the big wood trays. Them trays was made out in tupelo gum, and they was light as a feather. Us had plenty then, all the time, and at Christmas, and when the white folks get married, they kill hogs, turkeys, and chickens, and sometimes a yearling. And they cook the hogs whole, barbecue them, and fix them with a big apple in any mouth. When the big wedding come off, they cook in the big pots, so's to have enough for everybody. Cause us didn't have eaten like that all the time. Case the regular rations was three pound meat and a peck of meal for ever, hand from Saturday to Saturday. The niggers was allowed to have a little patch of their own that they could walk up night and Saturday evening. What they made on this patch was then, and old master pay him money for it. Nobody didn't make niggers work the patches. If and they want the grass to took em, that's all right with old master. Old master have a big garden, most big as a field, where there are raised greens and collards and turnips for the whole place. 
My grandpappy was a carpenter and old master contract him out to the other plantations to build day houses. The grown niggers had to be up for day. The overseer blow he horn fast to get up by, and then the next time he blow the hatter be ready to go to the field. There was an old woman what kept all the little niggers whilst they mammies was in the field. This old woman cooked for the little ones and fed em all day, and they mammies tuck em at night. Us's clothes was made out in Osnaburg cloth and dyed with copperas, and sometimes to mix terbaki and peach tree leaves with the dye. Us had a big orchard with apples and peaches and pears, more in us and the hogs together could eat up. When a nigger died, they was buried in the graveyard like they do now, and they shouted and hollered, and sometime a woman she faint and had to be towed home. The song they sing most at the funeral was Hark from the Tomb. Us show did have plenty singing our hymns and shouting at night in the cabins. If and the men want to break a night rest, he go possum hunting or rabbit hunting, just so he get past from old Marster and was at the field next morning on time with the other hands. I knowed old Marster want to do more, case I heard the folks talking about it and wondering if an old Marster gwine get killed. Then I heard him say the niggers was free, but us didn't leave old Marster for about a year after this surrender. Dennis went to live on the young mistress place at Barlow Bend. At her she married Mr. Bob Flynn. Right dar I stayed till I was grown and married. Then the fust moved to town. Us come up the Alabama River to James Landon. I members all the big boats on the river. They show us finance. Den, I members adder I grown up, they tell about how the Yankees come in here and how they pestered the white folks and the niggers too. Broke into smokehouses, burn em up and throw things away and left nobody nothing to eat. I don't remember that cause I was too little. Lady, you ask me if an us knowed anything about hoodoo. Yes, ma'am, there show sure us folks is what could put spells on you. I show was scared of them kind, too. Adder I was nearly growed. There was a gal named Penny, what been down sick a long time, and there was a conjure doctor walking on her trying cure her. But her wasn't agreeable, so he let her die. Then a boy named Ed, he had a misery in his foot, and hit went up, he leg, and he crippled. There was a hoodoo doctor in the forks of Bigby River come tend on him, and he told everybody, get out in the house, seppin him and Ed and the devil. He cured Ed smack well. My mammy said I was born with a zernin eye to see spirits, and I seed something like a cow with no hain. So mammy made me stir the fresh lard when they was rendin it, case that cures you of seeing the spirits. After I stirred the lard, I didn't see him no more. One time I was splitting rails with a nigger what could do anything, but he was a bad man, and I was feared of him. I told him, if an I had a pain or anything hurt me, I sure would kill him with my axe. I would have split that nigger wide open, just like I split them rails if an he tried that hoodoo on me. Talking about fishing, I members when us would be plowing down by the river when hit come dinner time and whilst the mules eaten, us go down to the river and fish. Then every Saturday evenings, us had fish. Us catch gar, jack, and carp. May was when the carp bite. They were so fat then that you could cook them by day self without no grease. Then us catch turkeys in pole pens baited with corn. Laura, what's the use me talking about them times? They all pass and gone. Sometimes I gets to studying about all the folks most is dead, and I is here yet living and blind. But I specs it won't be long till I is over the river with the bless. End of section seven. Section 8 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, 
Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D.L. Martin. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Section 8. Interview with Nathan Beecham. Gerta Corrup, Eufaula, Alabama. Half-breed. I walked up a little path bordered with small stones an atmosphere of solitude surrounding me. In the sky, large white cumulus clouds like great bowls of cotton flooded leisurely northward. Far down the road, a ramshackle buckboard disappeared over a slight hill. Directly in front, the path ran at twenty yards into the dilapidated steps of a negro cabin, while an old colored man in a vegetable garden to the left to the cabin broke the stillness with the intermittent metallic sounds of his spade digging into thirsty soil. I knew at a glance that this was Nathan Beecham. Hello, Uncle Nathan, I called. Mornin' white folks, he answered as he discontinued his spading and raised his hand in a friendly gesture. I walked over to where Uncle Nathan was standing and stopped in the little furrows of brown earth. Already a thick coat of dust had formed on my shoes. Uncle Nathan, I said, I'd like to have a brief chat with you about slavery days if you can spare a few minutes from your garden here. Yes, sir, boss, he said punctuating his reply with a spat of tobacco that was soon nothing but a dark mark in the parched ground, glad to be of any assistance. We moved to the shade of a large oak where we sat down together on a sturdy homemade bench. Well, white folks, he went on after taking a long turn at the dipper hanging on the tree which shades a well, I'll tell you a story of my mammy and pappy. Nathan Beecham, my pappy, belonged to Massa Green Beecham at White Oak Springs near Eufaula. Massa Green was a member of the legislature when the capital was at Tuscaloosa. He had many a acre of land and hundreds of slaves. Pappy used to drive the wagon into Eufaula to get supplies, and on the way, he would meet up with an Injun gal a carrying big baskets that she was a goin' to sell there. He would ask her if she wanted to ride, and she always say yes. So one day, Pappy came to the master and tell him that there was an Injun gal on the St. Francis Indian village that he wanted for a wife, and the boss say all right, so Pappy married the Indian gal. Her name was Mimi, so I is half nigger and half Injun. My mammy died about five year after freedom, but I can remembers that she had long black hair, and I remembers the way the sun sparkle on her teeth when she smile. At her she married Peppy. She still carried her pretty baskets to you fall at your cell. Sometimes she walk all the way there and back twenty four miles. I been living here in Eufaula fifty year or mo white folks, and I owns my little cabin and the land around it. Tain't much, but it's enough to keep me going, just with the little stow I owns. End of section 8section nine of Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D.L. Martin. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Section 9. Interview with Oliver Bell, Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, the best friend a nigger ever had. Oliver Bell says the first thing he remembers was seeing his mother whipped. 
He was born in slavery, but most of his knowledge of the evils, as well as the joys of antebellum days, is by hearsay only. I was born on the de Graffenride place, he said, nine miles west of Livingston Boyd Road. My mother was Luella de Graffenride, and my pappy was Edmund de Graffenride. Then they changed my name to Belle. I had one brother, Nat, and two sisters, Justina and Clara. I has about sixteen chillins, all born on the same place, and most of them is livin' there yet. My chillin' by my first wife are Ed, Jack, Holly, Buck, Clarence, Sally, Liza, Megan, Luella. De Ma was Mandy Powell from York. Then my second wife, Betty Brown, gived me the rest of my chillins. Let's see, they is Jimmy, J.W., Alfonso Wallace, Henry, Edna, and he hesitated, explained. That's as many as I can remember just now. My grandma's name was Sally de Graffenride, and my grandpa's name was Peter. He was a shoemaker for the place and made plows, too. He was a worker, and he learnt me how to pull fodder and chop corn and cotton when I was just a little scamp, just a little black nigger. Us all belonged to Mr. Tresven de Graffenride and Mrs. Rebecca, and they was all good to us. Old Mistis read the Bible to us and got us baptized in the river at Horn's Bridge, but that was at our surrender. In slavery times, they didn't like for us to sing and play loud in the quarters. Honey, I members when us had the big prayer meetings. They would shut the door so the voice won't get out, and they would turn the wash pot down the door. That was to keep the voice inside, they told me. Oliver mused a moment, recalling the old times. Us chillins used to have a good time singing and a playin, he said. I members one of our little verses run something like this. Shoo, 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 gander, though your feathers weigh yander. Us had old corn haulers, too, but I forget some now. I does remember, though, you could hear dem niggers holler a whole mile. No, um, it warn't so bad with us. The white folks was good to us niggers. Us had enough to eat, lack greens, from the big house. Us had our rations waited out, peck a meal, three pounds of meat, half gallon of lasses, made at home in wadden meals, and that was for a week. And sometimes on a Sunday, us had a little sugar, coffee, and flour. No, um, us didn't know what rice was. What I seed of slavery was a bad idea, I reckon, but everybody thought they master was the best in the land. Us didn't know no better. A man was grud plum green, for he knew the whole world didn't belong to his old master. Us didn't have no bought medicine in them days, just what us got out of the woods like slippery alum for fever and poke salad root. They help a lot, and may apple root would help you, same as castor oil. Didn't nobody help us learn nothing much, but most of my chillins went to Booker T's school. They say he's a mighty smart man, and my chillins think so too. It's all right. I wish I could read and write. Then I'd tell you things you'd like to know. His face clouded for the briefest moment. I tell you the first thing I remembers, and I don't know what started it. One day my mammy done something, and old Marster made her pull her dress down round her waist and made her lay down across the door. Then he taken a leather strop and hooped her. I remembers that I started crying, and Mrs. Becky said, Go get that boy a biscuit. I recollect my mammy was a plow hand, and she'd go to work soon and put me under the shade of a big old post oak tree. There I sat all day, and that tree was my nurse. It's still standing there yet, and I won't let nobody cut it down. Mammy say I never did learn to walk. Just one day, she sought me down under the oak, and fust thing she knowed, she look up, and there I was walking down the middle of a cotton row. Another thing I remembers when I was a little boy, that they was vitin' the corn at her to surrender. Dr. de Garfin Ride measured the corn out to all of em what was share hands. He'd take a bushel and give em a bushel. 
when he mows through, he grow a ear of corn to this one, and give himself a ear. Then he break a ear in two, and he take part, and give them part. That was close measuring, I tell you. Us lived in the third house, from the big house in the quarter, and when I was a boy, it was my job to set out shade trees. And one day, the Ku Klux Klan come riding by, and their leader was Mr. Steve Renfro, Alabama bandit of Reconstruction days. He wore long hair, and he called my pappy out and asked him a heap of questions. While he sitting there, his horse pull up nigh about all the trees I done sought out. At her talking to my pappy, he rode on cross Horns Bridge, about two miles south of here. And there he met old man Enoch Sledge and Frank Sledge. They was darkies, what belonged to Marsa Semi Sledge's father, old Dr. Sledge. Slaves on that plantation was loud, pretty good privilege at her to surrender and was working on heavens. Uncle Enoch and Frank was in town trading some, and Mr. Renfro didn't want him to have anything. When they left town, they passed the Ku Klux's rat on to Slough Bridge. Mr. Renfro asked Enoch to give him a piece of string to fix his saddle with, then shot him. Frank ran to the river, but the Ku Klux's clutched him and shot him too. The niggers went down to the river that night and got the bodies and buried them in the old Travis graveyard. My mammy and daddy is buried there too. Didn't nobody do nothing about Mr. Renfro till he went on and got to messin' with Marsa Sammy Sledge's things, stole a pair of mules, and the white folks rambled at him till they found him in Linden. They got so hot at him that he went to his camp in the flat woods down on Bear Creek. Them was scary times, cause that man never had no mercy for nobody. There's a cave down by the burial grounds what the slaves dug when they run away, and Mr. Renfro stayed there. It's on the river bank and it's dug up. You digs and starts slow and pushes the dirt out and digs up and makes a big room up so the water won't get you. I know where there's two of the caves on the place. My cow fell in one yesterday. When old Master Amos Travis came out here from California, he taken a lake into me and wanted me to leave the other side of the place and move down this side of the big house to take care of this swamp and look at her to hands. But I wanted a big house with four rooms and two brick chimneys, and I had to talk five years to get it. I's got some rose bushes now that was at the big house right at her to surrender, and they's growing in my yard now. Speaking about graveyard, I was passing there one night, riding on about midnight, and something come dragging a chain by me like a dog. I got down off in my horse, but couldn't see nothing with no chain, so I got back on the horse, and there rat in front of me was a jack me lantern with the brightest light you ever see. It was trying to lead me off, and every time I'd get back in the road, it would lead me off again. You sure will get lost if you follow a jack me lantern. One of them led a man down to the creek by them double bridges, said he found he was traveling in the wrong direction, getting from home stitter cluster, so he just sat down under a tree and waited till daylight. I ain't scared of nothing but them jack me lanterns, but they stirs you up in your mind till you can't tell where you's at, and they so bright. They nigh bout puts your eyes out. They is plenty of em over by the graveyard, rat right over yonder where all my white folks is buried, and mammy and pappy too. They's all there, cept Marsa Jess Travis. He was the next what come in line for the place, and he was the best friend this nigger ever had. Fact was, that's what he call me. Twas nigger. He and Mistress Mag lived right there in the big house. Then they moved into town, and that's where he died. Me and Marcy Jess made an agreement, and he said if he was the longest liver, he'd see me buried. And if I be the longest liver, I see him buried. So that day, I went to his office in the coat house, 
and he say he want to talk with me. He say, you members us agreement. And I say, what agreement, Mar suggests? And he say, about burying. Then I say, show, I remembers that. Then he got up and give me some papers about some land. And I say, what do all this here mean, Mars Jess? He say, nothing, nigger, except I just going out of business. Then I say, goodbye, Mars Jess. And he say, goodbye, nigger. And I walked on across the street. Then Mr. Killian say, Oliver, what's happened over at the courthouse? And I say, ain't nothing as I know as of. Then he say, yes, they is. Just look at the people's going in a hurry. Then I turn round and run back and there lay Mars Jess. Mr. Smith was getting him up and Mars Jess say to me, well, nigger, I didn't do what I tended to. I missed it. And I say, boss, for God's sake, go to the hospital. I'll go with you and stay with you. Mr. Smag, she asked me to beg him, but he shook his head and say, if I had a wanted to live, I would have shot myself. He rests a minute, then say, nigger, write Miss Kelleen and tell her, I says, to always be good to you as long as you lives. Yes, um, I was right there, done just what I told him I'd do, kept my agreement and followed him to the grave. Cause that last bout Mars Jess ain't no slavery tale, but I thought you was out of here all about the family what owned this old place, and Mars Jess was the best white friend a nigger ever had. Dis nigger, anyhow. End of section 9《Section 10 of Slave Narratives — A Folk History of Slavery in the United States — From Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives — This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Maria Angela Aragon Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Nelson Birdsong Nelson Birdsong Remembers His Master Nelson Birdsong, who lives on Front Street in the old suburb of Somerville, about three miles from Mobile, Alabama, was born a slave. A tall, dark, negro man, with white hair and whiskers, he says he was born at Montgomery Hill, Alabama, in Baldwin County, and that his people and he were owned by Mr. Tom Adkins. Nelson said he was very small at the time of the surrender, and could not tell very much about slavery days. In fact, he adds, You know, Missy, old folks in them days didn't lo chillin to stand round when they was talking we chillin was like a shot out of a gun when anybody come in we was glad when folks come in cause we could run out and play chillin nowadays know as much as we did when we was twenty five years old nelson does remember his massa saying he never was going to let that little nigger work he did not remember much about coming to mobile but seemed like his mammy worked for Mrs. Dunn on Monroe Street, and later they moved out in Old Napoleonville, which is now Crichton, Alabama, a suburb of Mobile. He said his pa and mammy then worked for grist mill out there, and also owned a big grist mill in the fork where the big fire station is now, which is located at the intersection of St. Francis Street and Washington Avenue the latter formerly Wilkinson Street. This grist mill was burned in the 1870s. Nelson says the first work he remembered doing was nussing a baby boy of Mr. Bramwell Burden, a grandson of Old Man Burden. Nelson has owned his little farm and three-room house until the past two or three years. He said he scuffled and tried to pay the taxes, 
but had got so old and his niece had given out on him and i said i was going to lose my place so i turned it over to a man to keep up my taxes so i'd have a place to live the relief gives me a little help now and me and my wife makes out the best we can the house is the familiar type of two-room negro house with a porch across the front and a shed room on the back the bedroom had been papered with scraps of wallpaper of varied design and so old that most of it had fallen off the mantel is covered with the colored comic section cut in a fancy pattern of scallops at the entrance of the house is a sack nailed to the floor and used for a footmat and at the two upper corners of the door are horseshoes for good luck nelson said he is a member of the african methodist episcopal zion church and has been a methodist all his life that he and his wife virginia had only two children and they were both dead nelson's wife virginia came from a family of slaves although she was not one herself she said her folks were owned by mr joe pickett of camden wilcox county alabama she said she just can remember mr joe taking her in his buggy and she called him toto as she couldn't say his name plainly she also said that she grew older she always spoke of mr joe as my papa instead of my master for he show sure was good to me she remembers her mother being chambermaid on the old eleonora a boat on the alabama river and as a small child going back and forth on the boat with her when they finally settled in mobile her mother worked for the family of dr hustis who lived in the corner house now occupied by the new federal courthouse and custom house at st louis and st joseph streets End of section 10. Section 11 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States, from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Ank Bishop. Interview with Ank Bishop, Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, Alabama. Gabriel Blows Off, Gabriel blow loud. When Gabriel take his silver trump, he is going to blow soft for the saved and loud for the lost souls, according to Ank Bishop, who was born into slavery 89 years ago and lives in Livingston, Alabama. The days before the war were as good as the present, Ank believes. He tells of them in the following story of his life. My name is Ank Bishop, and I was born in 1849, August 16th, at Ward, Alabama. My mother's name was Amy Larkin, and my father was Tom Bishop. I had three brothers, Alf, Volan, and Jim, and two sisters, Celie and Matilde. Us belonged to Lady Liza Larkin at Ward, right nigh Coke's Chapel. My mother was brought out from South Carolina in a speculator drove, and Lady Liza bought her at the auction at Coke's Chapel. She left her mammy and daddy back there in South Carolina, and never did see him no more in this life. She was bitted off, and Lady Liza got her, just her one, from all her family. She was got for Lady Liza's house gal, but sometimes she cooked or was to wash her, then again to milk her. T'was my job to mind the calves. Sometimes I went to Mr. Ed Weston's store at Gaston, three miles from us house, to see if in was any mail for Lady Liza, but t'want none. They was good to us, cause Lady Liza's son, Mr. Willie Larkin, was the overseer for his ma, but cause sometimes they get among em and thrashed em out. 
One time, one de niggas runned away, old Caesar Townsy, and they sent for Dick Peters to come and bring his nigger dogs. Them dogs was trained to catch a nigger, same as rabbit dogs is trained to catch a rabbit. So Mr. Willie Larkin told Stewart for to say, told man Dick Peters when he come, I'm gone, but for him to come on, I'm going to keep the road, he say, and cross Bigby at Moscow Landing. So old Dick Peters, he kept the road like he told him to, and he crossed Bigby at Moscow Landing over in the cane break. But them nigger dogs didn't ever catch old man Caesar. He stayed right wherever he was at twelve after surrender, and the war done ceased. Then he came out, but if he had been caught, they'd have used him up pretty rough. But he stayed hid twelve the time done passed. All the women on Lady Liza's place had to go to the field every day, and them what had suckling babies would come in about nine o'clock in the morning, and when the bell ring at twelve and suckling em. One woman tended to all of em in one house. Her name was Ellie Larkin, and they called her Mammy Larkin. She all time sent me down in the field for to get him come suckle to chillin, cause that made it hard on her when they gets hungry and cry. Us didn't go to church none, and us weren't learnt nothin. I'm nigh about ninety, and I can't read a line. I got some chillin can read. One can't what is sixty-five, but Henry, he fifteen, and he can't. The ma, she go by the name of Pearly Beasley. She can't read neither. But she's a good feel hand, and she patched these britches I'm wearin' and this old shirt. Miss, I ain't got a coat to my name. Can't go to church. So I don't know that this any better in slavery time. It's hard. Any way you got to travel. Got your nose on the ground rock all the time. When payday come, ain't nothing pay with. Come get the rent, then you outdoes again. Bread and bone in Sumter County. Wore out in Sumter County. Specs to die in Sumter County. And what is I got? Ain't got nothing. Ain't got nothing. Ain't got nothing. But I'm a believer, and this here voodoo and hoodoo and spurts ain't nothing but a lot of folks out in Christ. Haunts ain't nothing but somebody died out in Christ, and his spirit ain't at rest, just in a wandering condition in the world. This is the evil spirit what the Bible tells about when it say a person's got two spirits, a good one and an evil one. The good spirit goes to a place of happiness and rest, and you don't see it no more. But the evil spirit ain't got no place to go. It's dwelling place on tore down when the body die, and it's just a wondering and a waiting for Gabriel to blow his trump. Then the world going to come to an end. But when God say, Take down the silver mouth trump and blow, Gabriel. And Gabriel say, Lord, how loud shall I blow? Then the Lord say, Blow easy, Gabriel, and calm, not to alarm my lilies. The second time Gabriel say, How loud must I blow, Lord? Then the Lord say, Blow it as loud as seven claps of thunder, all added into one echo, so as to wake up them damnal spirits sleeping in the graveyards what ain't never made no peace with their God, just a layin' there in their sins. But the Christian army, it gets up with the first trump, and then what is deaf is the evil ones, what anybody could see, any time. I ain't scared of them, though. I passes them and goes right on plowing. But if and you wants them to get out in your way, all you gotta do is just turn your head least bit and look back. They gone just like that. When my first wife died, about thirty years ago, I was going up to Caston to see Sarah Drayden, old Scott Drayden's wife, and I took out through Kennedy Bottom about sundown, right after a rain. I seed something coming down the road, about that high, about size of a little black shaggy dog, and I says, What's that I sees coming down the road? Ain't nobody round here got no black shaggy dog. It keep a coming and keep it getting bigger, and bigger, and closer, and closer, and time it got right to me, twas as big as a half-growed yearling, black as a crow. It had four feet and drop years, just like a dog, but twan't no dog, I knows that. Then he shy out in the bushes, 
and he come right back in the road, and it went on the way I was coming from, so I went on the way it was coming from. I ain't never seen that thing no more, but I's got a pretty good notion about who it was. End of section 11. Read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, January 14th, 2023. Section 12 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Sinny Bonner Hear that whistle? The speaker was Sinny Bonner, an ex-slave, now living in the Norwood section of Birmingham. She had stopped for a confab where a group of other elderly Negroes of the neighborhood had gathered. Them whistles on them big jacks, what pull these high steppin' I see trains, mind me of them steamboats, what used to pull up at the landing at old Pickensville on the Tom Bigby River. Cause there were no railroads them days, and the only way folks had travelin' about was the steamboat which passed most every week, and the stagecoach which passed twice a week. Lows it, man, them was the days. And many the time out of my daddy, whose name was Green Bonner, heard that steamboat blow below Pickensville. He would hitch up the mules to the wagon and follow Master John on horseback down to the landing to fetch back the supply of sugar and coffee and plow tools needed on the plantation. They would take me long to hold the mules and watch the wagon, and it was a regular picnic to me to see the big shiny boat and watch the goings on. Massa John Bonner show dead pen on my daddy. The massa paid a thousand greenback dollars for him down to Mobile. Enough greenbacks to wrap him up in, he said, so he named him Green Bonner. Yes, sir, we was all Baptists, the deep water kind, and every Sunday they used to pile us into the wagons and pull out bright and early for Big Creek Church on the Carrollton Road. Everybody fetched a big basket of grub and six alive. Sick another dinner you never see. All spread out on the grassy grove by the old graveyard. Most all the quality white folks belonged at Big Creek, and when their slaves got shown a religion, they have them done at Big Creek and be baptized at this women all. Some of the niggers want to have their own meetings, but Lord child. Them niggers get happy and get to shouting all over the meadow where they built a brush arbor. Master John quick put a stop to that. He say, If you go on a preach and saying you must turn the wash pot bottom up, meaning no shouting. Them Baptists at Big Creek was so tight with their rules too. Turn you out show if you drink too much corn liquor, or dance, or cuss. Massa John had a big, fine bird dog. She was a mammy dog, and one day she found six puppies out in their harness house. They was most all girl puppies, so Massa one drowned them. I asked them to give them to me, and pretty soon the Massa sent me to the post office. So I put the puppies in the basket and took them with me. Dr. Lass come by where I was sitting, and he say, Want to sell them pups any? I tell him, uh-huh. Then he say, what nomination is they? I tell him, they's Methodist dogs. He didn't say no more. About a week after that, old missus sent me to the post office again, so I took my basket of puppies. Joan off, long come Dr. Lyles, and he say, Sidney, see you still ain't sold them pups. I say, no, sir. Then he asked me again what nomination they belonged to. I told him they was Baptist dogs. 
He say, how come? He told me last week Dan was mad at this pups. <laughs> Bless God, look like he had me. But I say, yes, sir, you see, doctor. They got their eyes open since then. He laugh and go on down to his newspaper office. How old is I? Lord, child, I don't know. My mammy say I was 15 year old time of the surrender. I remembers that mighty well. Massa John called all the niggas on the plantation round him at the big house and he say to him, Now, you all just as free as I is. I ain't your master no more. I was trying to be good to you and take care of all of you. You is all welcome to stay and we'll all work together and make a living somehow. If you don't want to stay, then that girl will just have to root, pig, or die. Some stayed and some left. My daddy stayed with Marshall John till he was called home to glory. Now they all gone but Sinny, and I was just here, waiting for him to call me. Yes, sir, I've been round Carrollton a heap. Adam, Marsh, John, and my daddy both died. I walked round from place to place. Used to work for Mrs. Roper at the old Phoenix Hotel. I recollect when the new brick courthouse was built. The old courthouse had been burned and they arrested a nigger named Bill Burkhalter for setting it on fire. They sent him to the pen and some officers started with him to Montgomery. When they got to Sipsy River, a mob catched up with him and took Bill and hung him there in the swamp. About that time, a bad cloud come up. They asked Bill, did he have anything to say? He say, I ain't burned no courthouse, and if you all kill me, my face gonna always haunt you. Whilst he's still hanging there in that swamp, the lightning flash and the thunder and wind was something awful. Next morning, when the sun come up, Bless my soul. Right there on the winder in the courthouse tower was a photograph of the face of the nigger they done hung for burning the old courthouse. Yes, sir, I done seen that with my own eyes, and I spec that picture still there. But lousy me, I got to get going. Because I was cooking me a mess of poke salad I picked down by the railroad tracks this morning. That poke salad and young onions gonna be mighty good. And they show mind me of them good old days in Pickens County. End of section 12. Section 13 of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States From Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1 Alabama Narratives this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States From Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1 Alabama Narratives By Various Jenny Bowen no bell brung him. Jenny Bowen was surrounded by numerous little colored children as I came upon her sitting on her front porch. She answered my questions through a mouth void of teeth and with a constant blinking of her brown eyes with their muddy whites. Her little grandchild had to act to some extent as an interpreter, as her speech was at times most indistinct. Yes, um, I remember lots of things that happened back in the days of the Civil War, she said. I remember the place where I lived. It were the prettiest house you ever seed. It were on a high hill overlooking a small creek, and the flowers round in the yard was some sea shown off. I was born in 1847 on Massa Fisher's and Mrs. Fisher's plantation near Camden, Alabama. Us slaves lived in a row of whitewashed cabins in the rear of the big house. We used to have a mean overseer, white folks, 
and all the time there were slaves on our place a running away. I acted as nice for master's three chillings, and they learned me to read and write. My pappy was named Bo Fisher, and he come from Virginia when Captain Fisher brung him. My mammy was named Grace Fisher, and she was round the big house most of the time a weaving and a cotton wool for the slaves, who wore calico spun in the summer and wool in the winter. An old nigger man rung a bell for us to get up by, and to call the field hands in the evenings. At a surrender, this old nigger stayed right on the plantation and was a working in the fields one day when the fisher boy rung the bell for the niggers to come in. All of them came except this old man, and later on they asked him why he don't come when they ring the bell. He answered, there ain't no more bell ringing for this nigger, cause I is free. The fishers was Presbyterians, and they had their own church on the place. Everybody had to go on Sunday. The white folks sit in the front, the colored folks in the back. The only holidays as niggers had was Christmas and New Year's. On these days, us all exchanged gifts. My papa and mammy out of the war farmed on shares with Captain Fisher. I was mad about this time. White folks to Sam Bowen, who long been dead. Us had a big wedding and the two Mrs. Fishers, Mrs. Daughters, picked us a gig and I sold a piece to all my white friends for them to dream on. Had I come to Mobile, I changed my religion to being a Baptist. I had ten chillings, but seven of them is dead. I's even got four great grandchildrens. Yes, some um, us had pulled white trash back in them days of the war. They lived near our place, and some of them didn't have no niggers at all. They worked theirself in the fields. Us didn't fool along with them kinds of people, though. White folks. Us kept mostly to ourselves. Yes, some um, us house niggers ate in the kitchens. That was separated from the main building by a walkway, it at the top but not at the sides. All the slave children had a grown nigger woman and a young gal about sixteen to look at them. We all had a good time and us was happy and secure. End of section thirteen. Section 14 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Nanny Bradfield, Interview with Nanny Bradfield, Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama. What I care about being free. Nanny Bradford is a fat little old woman, almost as broad as she is long, with a pleasant face and a broad smile which displays white teeth, still good at the age of 85. She lives alone in a dilapidated cabin which rests in a clump of trees by the side of the railroad. The sagging roof is patched with pieces of rusty tin of many shapes and sizes. Nanny, I said, aren't you afraid to live here alone? How come I be scared? Ain't nobody going to bother me less than it be a spirit, and they don't come round supping on rainy nights. Then all you got to do is say, Lord, have mercy. What you want here? And they go away and leave you alone. Anyhow, I's getting pretty old, and I won't be here so very much longer, so I just as well start getting acquainted with the spirits. 
Tell me something about yourself and your family, Nanny, I said. There ain't nothing much to tell, except I was born in slavery times, and I was about 12 years old in May when emancipation come. My pa and ma belonged to Mars James and Miss Rebecca Chambers. The plantation was just on the edge of town, and that's what I was born. Mars James' son William was in the war, and old Miss would send me to town where all the soldiers' tents was to tote something good to eat to them. I don't remember much about the war except the tents and the bomb shells shooting. I was little and couldn't do much, but I waited on Miss Elizabeth, my young miss, and waited on table, toted baddie cakes and such like. No, ma'am, I don't know nothing at all about the powder rollers or the clue cluxers, but I know all about the conjure doctors. They sure can fix you. They can take your garter or your stocking top and drop it in running water and make you run the rest of your life. You be in a hurry all the time, and if they gets hold of a piece of deceit of your drawers, they sprinkles a little conjure powder on it and burns it. Then you can't never sit down in no peace. You just like you settin' on a coal of fire till you get somebody to take the spell off in you. Nanny, were you glad when the war was over and you were free? What well, I care about being free? Didn't old master give us plenty good something to eat and clothes to wear? I stayed on the plantation till I married. My old miss gave me a brown dress and hat. Well, that dress put me in the country. If you marry in brown, you live in the country. Marry in brown, you'll live out of town, I quoted. That's it. My remembrance ain't so good and I forgets. No, ma'am, I ain't got no chillin', but Bradford had plenty of them. I was his fourth wife. He died about three years ago. He ain't done well to live that long with all them women to nag him. The Bible say it's better to climb on top of the house and sit than to live inside with a nagging almond. In the section 14, read by Carol Sutton, Knox, Pennsylvania, October 24, 2022. Section 15 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Florence Short. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Section 15, Martha Bradley. Interview with Martha Bradley, Mabel Farrier, Montgomery, Alabama. In Slavery Time, Aunt Martha, as she is known to all her white folks, claims to be a hundred years old. She was a slave to Dr. Lucas of Mount Meg's neighborhood long before the war between the states. Dr. Lucas is one of the well-known Lucas family, with whom General Lafayette spent some time while touring the United States in 1824. Our master was so good to all his niggers, she said. Us alls had plenty to eat and plenty to wear. But the days now is hard. If white folks gin you a nickel or dime to get you something to eat, you has to write everything down in a book before you can get it. I allus worked in the field. Had to carry big logs, had strops in my arms, and them logs was put in the strop and hauled to a pile where they all was. One morning it was raining and I didn't want to go to the field. But the overseer, he come and got me and started whooping me. I jumped on him and bit and kicked him till he let me go. I didn't know no better then. I didn't know he was the one to do that. But Martha Lucas gin us big times on Christmas in July. Us'd have big dinners and all the lemonade us could drink. 
the dinner be spread out on de ground and all de niggers would stand round and eat all dey wanted what was left us would take it to our cabins nancy lucas with de cook for everybody well she sure cooked good cake and had plenty of em but she wouldn't like to cut dem cakes often she keep em in de safe one day i go to dat safe and i see some and i wanted it so bad till i just had to have some nancy says to me martha did you cut dat cake i say no sir dat knife just flew round by itself and cut dat cake one day i was working in the field and the overseer he come round and say something to me he had no business say i took my hoe and knocked him plumb down i knowed i done something bad so i run to de bushes master lucas came and got me and stirred a whoopin me i say to master lucas what dat overseer says to me and master lucas didn't hit me no more master lewis was awful good to us and he wouldn't let nobody run over his diggers there was plenty white folks dat was sure bad to de niggers and specially dem overseers a nigger what lived on the plantation joinin ours shot and killed an overseer den he run away he come to de river and see de white man on other side and said come and get me well when dey got him dey found out what he'd done and was gwine to burn him live judge clemens demanded keep law and order say he wouldn't burn a dog live so he left but dey sure burned dat nigger live for i seed him atter he was burned up us it go to meetin to de antioch church some sundays us it go to de house and get a pass when us it passed by de patrol us just hold up a pass and den us go on there was a meetin twixt de niggers and de white folks de white preacher preach den de colored man us a stay church most all day when we didn't go to church us a get together in de quarters and have preaching and singing amongst ourselves in cotton picking time us a stay in de field till way atter dark and us a pick by candlelight and den carry it and put it on de scaffold in de winter time us a quilt just go from one house to another in de quarter us it weave all our everyday clothes but marster lucas it go to mobile ever july and christmas and get our sunday clothes get us dresses and shoes and we'd sure be proud of em in slavery time they doctor de sick folk different from what they does now i see de man so sick they had to put medicine down his foot like he was a horse dat man got well and sure lived to turn the key in de jail if it was in dese days dat man would be carried to de hospital and cut open like a hog there was a slave what lived in macon county he run way and when he was catched they dug a hole in de ground and put him crossed it and beat him nigh to death End of section fifteen Section 16 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various section sixteen allen brown interview with allen brown goethe Corrick is nigh a hundred uncle allen is a thin little man with a short white beard that hides nothing of his ready toothless smile always evident when conversing with the white folks, and contributes to his dignified mien when solemnly lecturing to the niggers about their no-count ways. He is as deaf as the proverbial post, and once launched into a discourse, rambles on to its end without regard to interruptions. Asked to tell something of his early life, he said, I is not on a hundred years old, sir, 
and I was brought to this country from Virginia, where I was born. My mammy's master was moving from Virginia to Texas, and when he go this far, he sold me and my mammy to Master McRae. Then Master McRae, he give me to Miss Julia. Then Miss Julia, she married Master Henry Young, and I was their carriage driver. Mas Henry soon went off to the wall and was killed in the Battle of Gettysburg, and that nearly about killed Miss Julia. After the surrender, nothing never was the same. Just had times mostly. Never been any times like days when I was driving my carriage amongst the Eflahai Resteppers, and I reckon there never will be again. The old man too old to walk down to walk now, and I gets long with what the warfare gives me. End of section 16section seventeen of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by greg giordano slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the United States, from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, Section 17, Gus Brown. Interview with Gus Brown, Alexander B. Johnson, Birmingham, Alabama. Gus saw Massa's hat shot off. They is all gone, scattered, and old Massa and Mussus have died. That was the sequence of the tragic tale of Uncle Gus Brown, the body servant of William Brown, who fought beside him in the war between the states, and who knew Stonewall Jackson. Uncle Gus recalled happenings of the old plantation where he was reared. His master was a king man, he said, on whose plantation in Richmond, Virginia, Uncle Gus waited on the tables at large feasts and functions of the spacious days before the war. He was entrusted to go with the master's boys down to the old swimming hole and go in washing. They would take off their clothes, hide them in the bushes on the side of the bank, put a big plank by the side of the old water hole, and go in diving, swimming, and have all the fun that youngsters would want, he said. Apparently his master's home was a plantation house with large columns, with all the glitter and glamour that the homes around Richmond have to offer. About it were large grain storage places, for the master was a grain dealer, and men on the plantation produced and ground large quantities into flour. Gus worked around the house, and he remembers well the corn shuckings, as he called them, on which occasions the negroes gave vent to emotion in the form of dancing and music. On those occasions we all got together and had a regular good time, he said. Uncle, he was asked. Do you remember any of the old superstitions on the plantation? Did they have any black cat stories? No, sir, boss. We was educated Negroes on our plantation. The old boss man taught us Negroes not to believe in that sort of thing. I well remember when the war came. Old Massa had told his folks before the war began that it was coming, so we was ready for it. Beforehand, the master called all the servants he could trust and told them to get together all the silver and other things of value. They did that. He explained, and afterward, they took the big box of treasures and carried it out in the forest, and hid it under the trunk of a tree, which was marked. None of the Negroes ever told the Yankees where it was, so when the war ended, the master had his silver back. Of course, the war left him without some of the things which he used to have, but he never suffered. Then the war came, and we all went to fight the Yankees. I was a body servant to the master, and once a bullet took off his hat. We all thought he was shot, but he wasn't, and I was standing by his side all the time. I remember Stonewall Jackson. He was a big man, with long whiskers, and very brave. We all fought with him until his death. We wasn't beaten. We was starved out. Sometimes we had purchased corn to eat. And sometimes we didn't have a bite o' nothing 
because the union men's come and tuck all the food for theirselves. I can still remember part of my ninety years. I remember we fought all the way from Virginia and winded up in Manassas Gap. When time came for freedom, most of us was glad. We liked the Yankees. They was good to us. You was all now free. You could stay on the plantation, or you can go. We all stayed there until old Massa died. Then I worked on the seaboard airline when it came to Birmingham. I have been here ever since. In all the years since the war, I cannot forget the old Massa. He was good and kind. He never believed in slavery, but his money was tied up in slaves, and he didn't want to lose all he had. I know that I will see him in heaven, and even though I have to walk ten miles for a bite of bread, I can still be happy to think about the good times we had then. I am a Confederate veteran, but my house burned up with the medals, and I don't get a pension. Thank you, Master Bossman, for the quarter. You will buy me a little grub. I's too old to work, but I has to. The reporter left him sitting with his little pack and a long fork in his hands. In his eyes, dimmed with age, a far-off look and a tear of longing for the old plantation. End of section 17Section 18 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives. A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, with Interviews from Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. 18. Walter Carraway. Interview with Walter Carraway, W. F. Jordan. Old Joe had real religion. Walter Calloway lives alone half a block off Avenue F the thoroughfare on the south side of Birmingham, on which live many of the leaders in the Negro life of the city. For his eighty-nine years, he was apparently vigorous except for temporary illness. A glance at the interior of his cabin disclosed the fact that it was scrupulously neat and quite orderly in arrangement, a characteristic of great many ex-slaves. As he sat in the sunshine on this tiny front porch, his greeting was, Come in, white folks. You ain't no doctor, is ya? To a negative reply, he explained as he continued, For the last past twenty-five years I've been keeping right on, working for the city and the street department. About two months ago, this misery attacked me, and don't peak luck nor nothing term doctors give me to do no good. The preacher he come to see me this morning, and he says he knows a white German doctor. Would he grin? to send him to see me. I shall wins to get well again, powerful bad, but maybe I done live long enough, and my time bout come. Quizzed about his age and antecedents, he began his story. Well, sir, Cap, I was born in Richmond, Virginia, in 1848. Before I was old enough to remember much, my mammy with me and my older brother was sold to Mars John Calloway at Snowdon in Montgomery County ten miles south of the town of Montgomery. Marsh John had a big plantation and lots of slaves. They treat us pretty good, but we have to work hard. Time I was ten years old, I was making a regular hand in the plow. Oh, massa, Marsh John good enough to us, and we get plain to eat. But he had a overseer named Green Bush, what show whop us even when we don't do to suit him. Yes, sir, he was mighty rough with us. But he didn't do the whopping himself. He had a big black boy named Mose, mean as the devil and strong as an ox. And the observer let him do all of the whooping. And man, he could show Leon that raw high lash. He whooped a nigger gal about thirteen year old so hard she nearly die. And all us afterwards, she ab spells of fits or something that made Mars John powerful mad. So he run that overseer off the place 
and Mose did know no more whoopin. Same time, Mars John by a mammy and us boys. He by a black man named Joe. He a preacher, and de master led to slaves. Bill brush arbor in de pecan grove, over in de big pasture, and when de wetter wasn't too cold, all de slaves was allowed to meet there on Sunday for preaching. Yes, uh, old Joe do pretty good. I spec he had more religion than some of de high flute niggers tending to preach nowadays. De white folks church, hit at Hope Hill over on de stage road, and sometimes they fetch their preachers to the plantation to preach to de slaves. But they, brother Joe, hey Joe, nah, sir, we didn't get no schoolin' sepin before we got big enough to work in de field. We go long to school, and de white chillin to take care of em. They show us pictures and tell us all they can, but it didn't amount to much. When de war started, what was all I know about was it was all de white men's go to Montgomery and gin de army. My brooder, he about fifteen year old, so he go long with de ration wagon to Montgomery most every week. One day he come back from Montgomery and he say, Hell done broke loose and goggy. He couldn't tell us much about what happened. But these slaves, they get all excited because they didn't know what to expect. Pretty soon we find out that some of the big men's call a meeting at the Capitol on Goat Hill of Montgomery. They elected Mr. Jeff Davis president and done busted the nuntered states wide open. After that, there wasn't much happened on the plantation. Seven gangs of soldiers passing through went off to the war. Then about every so often a squad of Confederate soldiers would come to the neighborhood, gathering up rations for General Lee's army, they say. They make it pretty hard on both for whites and blacks, taking up some of the best stock and running us low on grub. But we work right on, for one day, somebody sent a runner saying the Yankees coming. Oh, mistress, tell me to hurry over to Mrs. Freeman's and tell him Wilson's Yankee Rager is on the way on coming like a hurricane. I hop on them mule and go just as fast as I can make him travel. But before I get back, they done wretched the plantation, smashing things, coming and groan. They break on the smoke house and take all the hams and the other rations. They find what they want and burn up the rest. Then they ramshack the big house, looking for money and jewelry and raise cane with the women folks, because they didn't find what they wanted. Then they leave their old bosses and mules and take the best we got. After they done that, they burned down the smokehouse, the barns, the cribs, and some other property. Then they skedaddle someplace else. I wasn't up thar, but I heard tell they burn up piles and piles of cotton and lots of steamboats in Montgomery, and leave the whole town just about ruined. Twarn't long after that they tell us we're free. But lordy, Cap'n, we ain't never been what I calls free, cause old master didn't own us no more and all de folks soon scatter all over. But if they did all take me day, they'd still have to work just as hard as some does have less than we used to have when we stay on Marsh John's plantation. Well, Cap'n, that's about all I know. I feel that misery coming on me now. Will you please, sir, uh, give me a life back in de house? I wish that white gentleman, doctor, come on, if in he coming. End of section 18。section 19 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume 1 alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox Org. Read by Florence Short. Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives by Various. Section 19. Esther King Casey. Interview with Esther King Casey. Edward F. Harper, Birmingham. Living with her grandchildren at 801 Washington Avenue, Birmingham, Alabama, Esther King Casey, former slave of Captain Henry King of America's Georgia, recalls from fading memory a few vivid scenes 
of the days when men in grey moved hurriedly about the town suddenly disappeared for a while and then returned one by one with weary halting tread and hollow faces while gloom and despair hovered over the town like a pall of desolation less vivid in her memory are the stories told her by her grandmother of a long voyage across the ocean of the arrival in a new land called mobile and of slaves being sold at public auction less vivid too are the memories of her own journey to georgia where she with her parents and brother were brought to be the slaves of captain king i was only four or five years old when we came to captain king's big house said the old woman brightening with pride in her ability to recollect her manners bore the marks of culture and refinement and her speech was surprisingly void of the usual negro dialect she is an example of the former slave who was educated along with the white children in the family there were eight or ten slaves in all esther continued we lived in a house in the back yard of captain king's big house my mamma was the cook papa was a mechanic he built houses and made tools and machinery captain king gave me to the white lady that was miss susan the captain's wife captain king was a fine man he treated all of us just like his own family the white lady taught us to be respectable and truthful when asked if she had ever been punished for misbehavior the old woman smiled and said once the white lady whipped me for playing with the jailer's children she had told me not to play with them because they were not good company for me she said that she wanted to raise me to be a good and truthful and that the jailer's little white children told lies and talked bad esther remembers well the mobilization of gray uniformed troops at the courthouse which stood only a block away from the king residence the town was filled with soldiers for several days she said they assembled about the courthouse and had speakings one day i passed there with my papa and saw abraham lincoln hanging from a noose in the courthouse square of course it was only an effigy of abraham lincoln which was used to show what the soldiers thought of him papa told me that the soldiers shot the effigy full of bullet holes before they left town before captain king left he brought a man with him from the courthouse to value his property the slaves were valued too i remember captain king lifting me high above his head and saying to the man i wouldn't take a thousand dollars for this little gem she paused a moment the light in her eyes showed that she was reliving the thrill of that childhood incident then captain king left with the other soldiers papa stayed and took care of the white lady and the house after a while my brother ran away and joined the troops to fight for captain king he came back after the war but captain king did not several years later i saw a man down in south georgia who told me that he belonged to captain king's troops he said that he was standing near him when he was killed after the proclamation the slaves were free most of them leased out to plantation owners i stayed with mamma and the white lady mrs king had taught the little slave girl to read and write and when schools were open for the freed slaves she told the child's mother to send her to school fees of fifty cents a month were charged which mrs king paid as long as the child remained with her at eighteen years of age the girl had acquired sufficient education to qualify to teach in the public schools for negroes after three years of teaching she married jim casey an ex-slave who took her to his three plough farm in south georgia no man ever lived who was finer than jim said the old woman my daughter used to say that i loved him more than god and that god was jealous and took him away from me after her only daughter's death in nineteen nineteen esther was brought to birmingham by her grandson who has kept her comfortably ever since her hair is just turning gray though she was born in eighteen fifty six the little briar pipe which she endeavors to conceal from strangers is the only outward evidence that she has anything in common with others of her generation End of section nineteen.
Section 20 of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1 Alabama Narratives This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Florence Short slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various amy chapman interview with amy chapman ruby f tart livingston alabama de masters good but overseers mean aunt amy paused as she worked among the small plants in her garden removing a weed here and there she pushed back the sunbonnet that shaded her eyes and began i was born on governor reuben chapman's place five miles north of livingston on may fourteenth eighteen forty three my name is amy chapman my mother was clary chapman and my pappy was bob chapman they both come from virginny my mammy from petersburg and my pappy from richmond they was driven down to alabama and like cattle and marsh reuben bought em he had a lot of slaves cause he had a heap of plantations but him and his wife stay most of the time in huntsville and they had a heap of white overseers i had a plenty of shillings but not as many as my mammy who was my husband lord child i ain't never had no special husband i even forgets who was de pappy of some o dese childrens of mine us had a mean overseer and since mars reuben warn't never at home dem overseers used to treat us something awful one day mars reuben come home when he found out dat de overseer was mean to de slaves he commenced to give him a lecture but when miss felicia took a hand in the business she didn't stop at no lecture she told that overseer dis i hear you take my women and turn their clothes over their heads and whip em any man that's got a family and would do such a thing ought to be shamed of hisself and if in governor chapman can't make you leave i can so you see dat road there will make tracks then and mistis he left right then he didn't wait for no coaxin he was de meanest overseer us ever had he took my oldest brother and had him stretched out just like you see christ on de cross had him chained and i sat down on de ground by him and cried all night like mary and dem done dat overseer was de first one dat ever put me in de field and he whooped me with de cat o' nine tails when i was stark naked den there was another mean man named dot 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 who was always a beaten nigger woman cause dey wouldn't mind him us warn't learned to read and write but mr jerry brown's slaves were he owned a big plantation us didn't go to no nigger church cause dere warn't none i was baptized in jones creek and dr edmonds a white preacher jane me to de jones creek baptist church long for de war and de song i lacked best was a white folk song twarn't no nigger song it was like dey sing it now set more lovely miss more lovely dark was de night cold was de ground on which my saviour lay blood in drabs of sweat run down in agony he pray lord move de bitter cup is such thy sacred will if not content i'll drink it up whose pleasure i'll fulfil and another one us niggers used to sing was mighty pretty in evil long i took delight and led by shame and fear when a new object stopped my flight and stopped my wild career i saw him hanging on a tree in agony and blood he fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross i stood sure never till my latter breath can i forget that look he seemed to change me with his death yet not a word he spoke my conscience felt an ode to quip 
that plunged me in despair i saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there yes'm i can tell you things about slavery times that would make your blood boil but they's too terrible i just tried to forget i could tell you about being run myself with dem nigger dogs but i ain't gonna do it i will tell you though about a mean man who whooped a colored woman near about to death she got so mad at him that she took his baby shell what was playing round the yard and grab him up and throwed it in a pot of lye that she was using to wash with his wife come a-hollin and run her arms down in the boilin lye to get the child out and she near about burned her arms off but it didn't do no good cause when she jerked the child out he was dead one day i seed old unker tiptoe all bent over a comin down the road and i ax him what ails him and he say i's been in de stocks and been beat till de blood come de old massa noited my flesh with big pepper in turpentine and i's been most dead but i is somewhat better now unker tiptoe belonged to de meanest old master round here but honey i ain't never told nobody all dis and ain't gonna tell you no more ride me home now cause i's crippled a cow was de cause of it she drug me round dat new orchard what i planted last fall she done run away wid me mistis i wish you would do me a favor and write my son in texas and tell him dat i say if it he specs me to make him any mo of them star quilts he better come on here and kiver my house de roof sure does leak bad end of section twenty Section 21 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Deanna Lee. Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Emma Chapman Interview with Emma Chapman Mary A. Poole Living in a small room in the rear of a house at 361 Augusta Street, Mobile, Alabama, the writer located an interesting ex-slave, Emma Chapman, who when first approached was somewhat reticent. I soon learned I had arrived just as she was ready to have her breakfast, which consisted of bread and coffee, and insisted she eat first and talk afterwards, as she had made just about enough fire in the open fireplace to boil the coffee. While she followed my suggestion, I glanced about the room and found it very neat and tidy, and an unusually comfortable looking double bed, a mirrored door chiffon robe, and two trunks one rocking chair and a couple of straight chairs, a table containing all cooking utensils and food containers. The walls were covered with sheets of manila wrapping paper, tacked on, and part of the ceiling patched with odds and ends of corrugated paper. Emma is small in stature, of light complexion with graying hair, arranged in neat braids around her head, very clean in appearance. Emma said she was about 13 years of age at the time of the surrender, and that she was born on the plantation of Reverend Mr. Montgomery Curry of Charleston, South Carolina. When she was about three years of age, Mr. Curry moved to Pickens County, Alabama, about five miles from Carrollton and eight miles from Pickenville. When I asked why they moved to Alabama, Emma laughed and said they expected to find money growing on trees in Alabama, and that she as a child came near being snake bit many a time digging around the roots of old trees, trying to find money. Reverend Montgomery Curry, said Emma, was married to Anne Haney, whose parents were Aaron and Frances Hudson Haney, and Emma's grandmother was Lucy Lanier, who was born in Virginia and was sold to Mr. Haney to pay a debt. 
Lucy Lanier was nurse for his daughter, Anne, and when she married Mr. Curry, she brought Lucy with her to her new home. The Currys had three children, a boy and two girls, and it was Lucy Lanier's daughter, Patsy, who acted as their nurse. The home of Reverend and Mrs. Montgomery Curry was a two-story log house with wide-open hall running the entire length of the house and with two rooms opening off either side. The kitchen was out a short distance from the main house with the dairy between the two under a large hickory tree. The slave quarters were also built of logs with space between for a shed room and small garden plot and a few chickens. The slave women did not go to the fields on Saturday as that was their day to clean up around their homes. They usually washed their clothes at night and hung them on the bushes where they were left to dry in the sunshine, maybe a couple of days, as no one could or would disturb them. Reverend Montgomery Curry was a Baptist preacher and had no overseer except Lucy Lanier and her husband, Emma's grandparents, who kept a supervision over the slaves, about 40 in number. There was no whipping allowed on the Curry plantation, and after the death of Reverend Curry, Mrs. Ann Curry, his widow, ran the plantation under the same system. The patrollers had no jurisdiction over the Curry slaves. They were given permits by the Currys to go and come, and Emma said if one of those patrollers whipped one of old Mrs. Slaves, she would have sure sued them. Emma laughingly said the slaves on other plantations always said the Curry slaves were free niggers, as they could always get permits and had plenty to eat and milk to drink. The slaves cooked their breakfasts in their own cabins, but dinner and supper was cooked in the kitchen, and each came with their pan to be filled and had their own gourds, which were grown on the place to drink their milk, and of which they could have full and plenty. During the war, they cooked for the Confederate soldiers encamped nearby, and great quantities were prepared. Emma was one of those delegated to carry the food to the camp. All she ever saw of the Yankees were two who stopped at the house and asked for something to eat. Mrs. Montgomery invited the men and served the best she had. One of the men wanted to take the last mule she had, and the other said, No, Mrs. Montgomery is a widow, and from the appearance of her slaves she has treated them well. Mrs. Montgomery told them that someone had stolen her saddle horse, and the soldier who had remonstrated with the other replied, Madam, your saddle horse will be returned in three weeks. And sure enough, one night about midnight they heard a horse whinny, and Emma's grandfather said, There is old Spunk, and there was old Spunk waiting outside. Emma said the first whipping she ever had was after the surrender, given her by her own father when they left Alabama and went to live near Columbus, Mississippi. She had always lived in the house with the old miss and her young miss, and when she had to leave them, she cried, and so did they. Her grandmother, Lucy Lanier, nursed Miss Anne. Lucy's daughter, Patsy, nursed Miss Anne's children, and was the special property of Fanny Montgomery Curry, who married a Mr. Sidney Lipscomb, and whose children Emma helped to look after, so the three generations were interwoven. Emma only wishes she could go back to plantation days. All her trials and suffering came after she left Old Miss and went to live with her father and mother, George and Patsy Curry, who had 14 children and of which Emma was the eldest. Her father, who was a quadroon in caste, was cruel to his family, and especially so to her. He made her work like a man, cutting timber, splitting rails, digging, planting, and all work of the farm. Now, Emma is the only member of her family left. She married three times, having only two children, a girl and a boy, these by her last husband, Frank Chapman, now dead, and Emma has no knowledge of her children's whereabouts. She gave them an education so they could write to her if they wanted to, the girl married and left Mobile. The boy went to Chicago, was a chauffeur for some rich folks. His last letter several years ago, in which he enclosed $25, stated he was going on a trip to Jerusalem with one of the young men of the family. End of Section 21
Section 22 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives. A Folk History of Slavery from the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives by Various. Henry Cheatham. Interview with Henry Cheatham by Illa B. Prine. I heard Lincoln set us free. White folks, I was glad you drapped by to have a talk with me. I was getting powerfully lonely, said Henry Cheatham, who lives in Marysville, a mobile suburb. So I'll be glad to tell you some about de slave days. I show members plenty. Well, to begin with, I was born in 1850 near West Point. That's in Clay County, Mississippi, you know. I belong to Mr. Tom Hollingshead, who was killed in the Civil War. I remember as all de slaves are going in and take a last look at him. After day done, brung his body home. My mammy's name was Emmeline Cheatham, and my pappy's was Sam Cheatham. I don't remember my grandpappy and grandmammy's at all. Us slaves lived in log cabins, but was daubed with clay to keep the rain out, wind out, and the chimneys was made of clay and sticks. The beds was homemade and nailed again the wall with legs on the outer side. The mass's house was built of logs too. But it was much bigger in de nigger cabins and so it went out in front of iron. After de massa was killed, old miss had a nigger overseer, and that was de meanest double that ever lived on de lord's green yarth. I promised myself when I growed up that I was again to kill dat nigger iffin if it was the last thing I ever done. Lots of times I've seen him beat my mammy, and one day I seen him beat my auntie who was big with a child and that man dug a round hole in the ground and put her stomach in it and beat her and beat her for half an hour straight till the baby came out right there in the hole why did mistis low such treatment a heap of times old miss didn't know nothing about it and the slaves better not tell her cause that observer whoop em if he finds out that they done gone and told yes and white folks I seed some terrible things in my time. When these slaves would try to run away, our overseer would put chains on their legs with big long spikes between their feet, so they couldn't get away. Then I seen great bunches of slaves put up on the block, and so would just take there was cows. Sometimes their chillins would be separated from their maws and paws. I come pretty near to being took away from my maw when these slaves was being invited. One of old Mrs. Datters was again to Texas, and I was going to have to go when somebody hollered freedom, and I sure was glad cause I could stay with my mammy now. In those days us had plenty of good plain food, such as pot liquor greens, corn bread, taters, peas, pears, and at hog killin us had chitlins and pig jowls and backbone. Then us would catch possums at night when they come up in the cornfield us never seed no flower dough as for fishin we never did none cause we had to work too hard we worked from can to can't get up at sunrise go to the field and stay till dark in the middle of the day they would send out our something to eat to the field with a barrel of water but for breakfast and supper us had to cook our own grub they give us our clothes weren't many us chillins wore a one-piece suit made out of Onisberg, and us would have to take that off at night, wash it, and put it back on the next day. As for shoes, Chilla never had none. You see, white folks, I was just a child, was big enough to tote water to the fields. I remember when the Yankees was a coming, though. I hoped cause they houses to do woods and hoped to hide the meat and bury the valuables, cause them Yankees took whatever they wanted, and you better not say nothing neither cause they had them long swords hanging at their sides. In them days, the slaves done all the work and carried all the news. 
De marsters sent notes from one plantation to another, and when dey wanted de niggers to come to de big house, dey would blow an old cow horn. Dey had certain number of blows for certain niggers, that is, de niggers dat was something. Dey would also use his horn for possum and coon hunting at night. De little niggers at night went to de big house to spin and weave. I spun a many roll and carted a many bout of cotton. I also made a many tallow candle by tying strings onto a long stick and dropping em down into molds filled with tallow. I was hid many a night in defense corners when I'd be a goin' summers to get my mammy some bacco. De patty rollers would be out looking for slaves that didn't have no pass from their overseer, and I'd hear them a comin and I'd hide till they pass on, cause if in they catch me, I shall go and have a sound beatin'. The owners always took care of us, and when us got sick, they would get a doctor, and old miss was all right, but that overseer was a double. He wouldn't blow no meetin' on the place. Sometimes us would slip down the hill and turn the wash pot bottom upwards, so the sound of our voices would go under the pot, and us we'd have a singin' and prayin' right there. Most of the slave could go sometimes to do white folks' church when they gets a pass from their massa. But that mean overseer always tried to keep us from going, so us couldn't learn nothin'. He didn't want us to learn to read or write, neither. No, us didn't have nothin' that like matches till I was growed. Us used flint rocks and cotton to start the fires. Us didn't have nothin' but food and clothes didn't have no garden of our own and there was no celebrating except in that hog killing that was the biggest day of the year on saturday afternoon we was allowed to play but i can't remember none of the games i just played like all little niggers did then and i time i just went to our cabins and went to bed cause we weren't allowed to do no singing most of the singing was done in the fields corn shucking time come when they wanted to get this sooty corn for plantin, and us would commence de shuckin when it commenced rainin. You axed me about funerals and weddin's. Us niggers never married and didn't remember any big weddin's of the white folks. But they buried folks then, de same as they does now, in a box. They would bury the slaves, same as they done the white folks. But us didn't happen no baptism in count of that observer. He didn't like for us to get in no religion, cause all slaves didn't have treatment hard like we did, cause their overseer and master weren't as mean as ourn. No, um, we didn't know nothing about no hoodoo stuff in them days. They only had homemade medicines. That is, unless they got so enough powerful sick em and they would go to see a doctor. Us used bone set tea made from a weed. Lord, it was bitter and then quinine, and it were good for the chills and fever, and it would purge you too. Then as you was life everlasting tea forever, and Jerusalem rush reed to get rid of worms. But, miss, I knows there is ghosts, cause when I was a little boy, my mammy come in from the field, and lay across the bed, and I was sitting in front of the fireplace on a big something like a cow without no hide, come in in to do and i commence to be on with it my fists then my mammy say what matter with you nigger then that critter he walked right out the door i looked out the window and there it was a goin in aunt martha's cabin never did see it come no on then another time white man died and my mammy was a stayin with his sister and the spirit like an angel come to my mammy and tell her to tell the white lady to read the bible backwards three times cause there was one talent between her and jesus outer that she were comforted another time my pappy sam cheatin who was a wicked man was a sittin in front of the fire and a big brindle dog came to do and started barkin my pappy say what in the hell am that and snapped his fingers at the dog the dog he then dropped dead some folks say that there ain't no such things as ghosters but I know there is, cause there's good spirits and bad spirits. There was good old days, Mister. Even if and us did have a hard time, and I didn't know if and it weren't better than it is now, I has to almost go hungry, and I can't get no help from the government, cause I is over sixty-five years old. 
fact is i believe i'd rather be a livin back there than to-day cause as at least had plenty something to eat and nothing to worry about and as for beatin they folks now if they didn't do right so what's the difference yes sir mistis i worked as long as i was able it didn't ax anybody for nothin now it's different cause i ain't able to do no work i tried to do right and ain't never been in but one fight in my life i now belongs to the corinthian baptist church and i's trying to live so when the good lord calls i'll be ready to answer with a clean soul i's had two wives but i was only a younger nigger when i had the first one and had two chillin by her then i left her cause she was no count that's been forty year ago and i ain't never seen my chillins in all dem years my second wife i got when i lived thirty miles below birmingham alabama at the old bank mines that's been thirty-five years ago and us is still together us ain't never had no chillins no m i don't know nothing about abe lincoln exceptin they say he set us free and i don't know nothing about that neither End of section 22section 23 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by florence short slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various laura clark interview with laura clark ruby pickens tart livingston alabama shulin in every graveyard laura clark black and wrinkled with her eighty-six years moved limpingly about the tiny porch of her cabin on the outskirts of livingston battered cans and rickety boxes were filled with a profusion of flowers of the common variety laura offered me a split-bottomed chair and lowered herself slowly into a rocker that creaked even under her frail body polly miss polly she responded to my query about her health tain't like de old days i's crippled and most blind now after all de years what i got i was born on mr pleasant powell's place in north carolina and when i was bout six or seven year old i reckon twas mr garrett from right up yonder into ben bout eight miles from livingston gwine north on to livingston and epps road bought ten of us shillings in north carolina and sunk two white men and one was mr skinner to fotch us back in wagons and he fotch old julie powell and henry to look at us wa'n't none of dem ten shillin no kin to me and he never bought my mammy so i had to leave her behind i recollect mammy said to old julie take care my baby child that was me and if an i never sees her no more raise her for god then she fell off de wagon where us were all settin and rolled over on de ground just crying but us was eatin candy what dey done give us for to keep us quiet and i didn't have sense enough for to know what ailed mommy but i knows now and i never seed her no more in dis life when i heard from her at her surrender she done dead and buried her name was rachel powell my pappy's name i don't know cause he done been sold to some wires else when i was too little to recollect but my mammy was de mother of twenty-two shillings and she had twins in her lap when us drive off my grandmammy said when i left pray laura and be a good gal and mine both white and black everybody will like you and if and you never see me no more pray to meet me in heaven then she cried her name was rose powell us all started den for mr garris plantation down yonder in de bend ten shillin and two old uns 
and two white men and us was travelling solid a month fust thing old marsa say was now be good to dees motherless shillin den he went to war and de overseas forgot all bout de promise when old marsa come back he done got his arm shot off but he let both dem overseers go cause dey done whipped dat old woman what come wid us to death she brought her two little boys colvin and at least but joe de poppy didn't come he was sold for elias was born joe never seed elias i sets cross de road here from dat church over yonder and can't go cause i'm cripple and blind but i hears him singin a motherless child sees a hard time o oh lord hep her on de road er sister will do de best she can this is a hard world lord for a motherless child and i jes busts out crying dat was de song i had in view to sing for you it's so mournful i know twent no real twent nothing like no real cause i been belonging to de church for fifty-five years and i don't fancy no real i'm glad i got it to my mind for you left but my recollection is shaller i ain't never read no verse in no bible in my life cause i can't read some my shillin can though my husband died and left me with nine shillin none of em couldn't pull the others out of de fire if and they fell in i had more'n dat but some come here dead and some didn't i got shillin dead in birmingham and bessemer there ain't a graveyard in dis here settlement round prospect where i ain't got shillin buried hetty ann right up dere to mr hawkins graveyard and my boy what got killed sittin on de side de road eatin his dinner he buried in captain jones's place in de ben yonder yes am i been drug about and put through de shackles so bad i done forgot some of de names and i'm most blind now and can't hear good neither but my eyes is good enough for to see ghosts but i don't believe in em cause i'd see dem shillin sometime if and day was ghosties i know i see my boy cause dey show me his head whir de miller boy hit him in de head with a spade and split his head wide open slip up behind him and all he said was squeak just like a hog and he was dead and de murderer live right here but dey move and now i'm here when it rain us just get under de bed cause de house ain't got no top on it i can't say marse garrett wasn't good to us motherless children but de overseer mr woodson tucker was mean as anybody he'd whoop you nigh about to death and had a whoopin log what he strip him buck naked and lay him on de log he whoop him wid a wide strop widen my hand den he pop de blisters what he raised and noint em wid red pepper salt and vinegar den he put em in de house dey call de best house and have a woman dey dare to keep de flies off in em twel dey get able to move den dey had regular men in de fields wid spades and if you didn't do what you get told de overseer would whop dat strap round his hand and hit you in de head with the wooden handle till he killed you den de mens would dig a hole wid de spades and throw him in it right there in de field just like they was cows didn't have no funeral nor nothing us had a heap of houses in de quarters right on both sides de big house us could step out of one house to t'other but miss i didn't work so hard or have no trouble either i was in de house at a master come home and found me splittin rails and plowin he lowed dey done put me in too hard a ship 
and i was too little so he took me to de house to draw water and wash dishes cause i was a little motherless gal oh master done a good part by me and i was married to my fust husband carrie crockett right there in de parlor he told the overseer dat us was human and had feelin' same as him so he rejected de powder rollers and made him get off de place i was treated good cause i remembered what my grandma said and whatever they told me to put my hand to i did and i was obedient and wasn't hard-headed like some of the rest i had no trouble and wasn't mute none but i's had more trouble last ten years with my own shillin than i ever did in slavey times they gives me such bitter words till i can't swaller em and i just sits and cries i can't read no songs to comfort me just catch em from de preacher on de stand and hold em dat's de way i catch my larnin last sermon i heard he took his text and said don't nobody rob god den he say ifen you is going to tend to serve god serve him in de full cause god don't never bat an eye nor turn his head and he can see you he frowns at every sin but he's a sin forgiven man i used to know a heap about de lord but i'm so crippled and blind since de calf jump on my foot i can't go to church no more so i don't forget you ax bout dem flowers on de porch i sure wish they was mine you could have em cause dey ain't room nuff with dem for me to sit where i desire us ain't got no meal and here tis just tuesday no more till Saturday. sure is bad us just pens on de neighbors and borrows end of section twenty three Section 24 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Hattie Clayton Interview with Hattie Clayton Preston Klein De Yanks dropped out in the sky. Aunt Hattie Clayton said, I's getting around a ninety notch, honey, and I reckon de kingdom ain't fur away. She lives in a tiny cabin not far from Opelika. Her shoulders are bent, her hair gray, but she still does a large amount of housework. She likes to sit on the tumble-down front porch on summer afternoons, plying her knitting needles and stretching her aged legs in the warm sunlight. "'Twas a long time ago, honey,' she observed when talk of slavery days was brought up. "'But I members as if twas yesterday. My old mistress was wit a day. She owned a plantation close to Lafayette, and she was mighty good to us niggers. Old mistress bought me when I was just a little tyke so I don't member about my pappy and mammy. Honey, I members that us little chillins didn't go to the fields till us was big enough to keep up a row. The overseer, Marsh Joe Harris, made us work, but he was good to us. Oh, mistress, she wouldn't let us work when it was raining and cold. Asked about pleasures of the old plantation life, she chuckled and recalled, I can hear the banjos yet. Law me... Us had a good time in them days. Us danced most every Saturday night, and us made the raft a shake with us foots. Lots of times, old missus would come to the dances and look on. And when a brash nigger boy cut a cute bunch of steps, the men folks would give him a dime or so. Honey, us went to the church on Sundays. I always did like singing, and I loved the old songs like Old Ship of Zion and Happy Land. 
Old Mistress used to take all the little scamp that was too little for church and read the book to them under the big oak tree in the front yard. Aunt Hattie, she was asked, do you remember anything about the war between the states? You mean the Yankees, honey? Yes, the Yankees. Her cold black face clouded. They scared us nearly to death, she began. They drive right out in the sky. Old mistress kept hearing they was coming, but they never show up. Then all to once, they was swarming all over the place with their blue coats a-shining and their horses a-rarin'. Us chillins running here in the fence corners and behind the quilts that was hanging on the line. And honey, them Yankees rid their horses right onto old mistress' flower beds. They hunted the silver, too, but us done hid that. I remember they was mad. They sought the house afire and took all the vittles they could find. I run away and got lost, and when I come back, all the folks was gone. And Hattie said she went down the big road and come to a lady's house, where she remained until she married. Us moved to Lafayette and then to Opelika, she concluded, and I've been here ever since. She lives with one of her numerous granddaughters now. She finds her great happiness in the promise and the moments when she can sit in the shade and dip her mind back into memory. End of section 24。section 25 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Wadley Shorty Clemens. Interview with Wadley Shorty Clemens. G. L. Clark. He was bent over the lawn, carefully trimming the border into a neat line. A small black figure in overalls, clean, but worn blue chambray shirt, the misshapen remains of shoes, and a nondescript hat from under which protruded thin white sideburns. Good morning, Uncle, I said. Mr. Lee was telling me about you. He said you lived back in slavery times. Is that right? Yes, sir, I sure did. I'll be ninety-two years old the second of August, and I was a slave for twenty years. I had a good old Mazza and mistress, the best there was. Old Mazza was a great big man, and he weren't scared of nothing there was. He wouldn't go nowhere without me. He always took me with him. My grandma was a cook, and my ma was a house girl. We lived in Pine Hill, a summer resort in Jefferson County, Georgia, across the river from Louisville. From home, we could look over and see the people walking about in Louisville. I remember the day the Yankees came to Louisville. We could see them going about from one house to another, setting fire. Then they come on to the river and sought fire to the bridge. They would use our bridge. They built these here pontoon bridges, and they could build them before you could look away and look back. Then they come across the river to Pine Hill. Old Massa had his horses and mules hid down in the swamp, but my Uncle Tom went and got them and brought them to the Yankees at the big gate. He didn't have to do it. He was just me. He hadn't been much good to Massa since the war commenced. Lay off in the swamp most of the time. After he brought Massa's horses and mules to the Yankees, he went with them into Massa's bedroom, and they just throw Massa and Mrs. Clothes all out of the closet and wardrobe and he give em Mrs. Gold earrings and bracelets, and they took the earrings and put them on the horse's ears, and put the bracelets on the horse's ankles. Old Massa was sitting on the long porch, smoking one of these motion pipes with a stem way so long, and that pipe was white as snow. He had a big can of tobacco on the table in front of him. In them days, people made their own tobacco, and I wished I had some of it now. Massa had about thirty fattening hogs, and the Yankees just went into pen and cut them hogs in two. 
He had just lots of turkeys and guineas, and the Yankees shot them down. He had thirty hives of bees in one long row, and one Yankee run up to the first hive and jump in it head first, and the bees stung him till he died. The others pulled him out and took him to the well and poured water over him, but he stayed dead. So they just dug a hole down by the side of the road and buried him in it. Yes, sir, that's the truth. They stayed there all night and camped out and cooked Massa's good smoked meat and burnt down the barns and done all the devilment they could. I couldn't see no use in their doing what they did, but that's what they done. Massa had 71 slaves when they was made free. The next county wasn't fit for much farming, and after we was freed, my Uncle Andy went there and bought a place. The land sold for fifty cents to acre after the timber was cut off. Uncle Andy had a brother Sam, and Sam had a steer. They plowed with the steer. Uncle Andy worked at the sawmill in daytime, and at night he cut two cords of wood before he go to bed. He make two bales of cotton the first year, and the next year he make four. Then he took up preaching. He was a Methodist preacher. Then old master die, and old missus lose all her land. Uncle Andy was right good fix, so he took care of her a year or more before she died. Then when she died, he went to pay all the expenses at the funeral, but the white folks won't let him, because they say he'd done his share already. My master's name was William Clemens, and they named me Wadley for old man Wadley, the president of the center road. Them days is gone a long time, and I still hear. But there was good times then. I had plenty to eat, plenty clothes to wear, and when I get sick, old Mazza come to give me some medicine, and I don't need no doctor. People worship God in them days, and not bother with church houses so much. Every Sunday, old Mazza got out by the back door and teach us Sunday school. Then we cut tree limbs and make brush arbors for preaching. In the summer, at a cross been laid by, us all, black and white, go to camp meeting and stay a week. The white preacher preach on one side and the nigger on the other. We carry lots of vittles and feed everybody. Niggers sure was better off in slavery times. End of section 25 Read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, January 12th, 2023. Section 26 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States. From Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives. By Various. William Colbert. Interview with William Colbert. John Morgan Smith. My master was a mean man. So, I remember the slavery days. How could I forget? Slowly Uncle Will spoke these words as he made his way up a few rickety steps with the aid of an old broomstick to his cabin door. We can just sit in the swing if you wants to hear a little about them old days. Cause I can show tell it. Well, first, Uncle Will, what's your full name, and where are you from? My name am William Colbert, and I's from Georgia. I was born in 1844 on my master's plantation in Fort Valley. My master's name was Jim Hardison. At one time, he had a 165 of us niggers. Uncle Will, a gaunt, black figure with two weeks' growth of gray hair upon his face, spoke in a soft, quaking voice, scarcely audible ten feet away. His eyes had a far-off, sad expression of one who had known suffering. 
They were set deep back in bony caverns. Well, Uncle Will, tell me something about the slave days. Was your master good to you? No, sir. He wasn't good to none of us niggers. All the niggers round hated to be brought by him, cause he was so mean. When he was too tired to whoop us, he had the overseer do it, and the overseer was meaner than the massa. But, mister, de peoples was de same as they is now. There was good uns and bad uns. I just happened to belong to a bad un. One day I remembers my brother. January was cotched over seeing a gal on de next plantation. He had a pass, but de time on it done gib out. Well, sir, when de massa found out that he was an hour late, he got as mad as a hive of bees. So when Brother January, he come home, de massa took down his long mule skinner and tied him with a rope to a pine tree. He stripped his shirt off and said, Now, digger, I'm going to teach you some sense. With that, he started laying on de lashes. January was a big, fine-looking nigger, the finest I ever seed. He was just four years older than me, and when de massa began a beating him, Jerry where he never said a word. De massa got madder and madder, cause he couldn't make January holla. What's the matter with you, nigga? he say. Don't it hurt? January, he never said nothing, and de massa kept a beatin' till little streams of blood started flowing down January's chest. But he never holler. His lips was a quiverin' and his body was a shakin', but his mouth it never opened. And all de while I sat on my mammies and pappy steps a crying. De niggers was all gathered about, and some of em couldn't stand it. They had to go inside their cabins. After a while, January, he couldn't stand it no longer hisself, and he say in a hoarse, loud whisper, Massa, Massa, have mercy on dis poor nigger. Will's eyes narrowed down to find creases as his thick lips came together in smacking noises, and the loose skin beneath his chin and jaws seemed to shake with the impact of dread memories. Then, he continued, after a brief pause in which time there was no sound except the constant drop of a bead of water in a lard bucket, the war came, the Yankees come in, and they pulled the fruit off the trees and ate it. They ate the hams and corn, but they never burned the houses. Seemed to me like they just stay round long enough to get plenty some eat, cause they left in two or three days, and we never see them since. The master had three boys to go to war, but there wasn't one to come home. All the children he had was killed. Massa, he lost all his money, and the house soon began dropping away to nothing. Us niggers one by one left the old place. The last time I seed the home plantation, I was a standin' on a hill. I looked back on it for the last time through a patch of scrub pines. It looked so lonely. There weren't but one person in sight. De massa, he was a settin' in a wicker chair in the yard, looking out over a small field of cotton and corn. There was fall crosses in the graveyard in the side lawn where he was settin'. The fourth one was his wife. I lost my old woman too, thirty-seven years ago, and all this time I've been carrying on like the massa, all alone. End of section twenty six. Section 27 of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1 Alabama Narratives This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Florence Short Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, 
Tildy Collins. Interview with Tildy Collins. Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama. In the Negro section of Uniontown, locally known as Rabbit Yard, named by the Negroes themselves, lives Ed Tildy Collins, a typical black mammy of orthodox type. She is a talkative old soul, running over with slavery tales and greatly beloved by a wide range of acquaintances among both races. Although eighty-four summers have passed over her snow-white head, Aunt Tildy's spirit is unconquered by time and her physical activity is truly remarkable for her age. She does her own housework and cares for her home without assistance. In front of her one-room cabin is a neat garden of vegetables and flowers combined, with morning glories trained carefully over the fence nearly all the way round. There is a saying in the South that cotton will grow better for a Negro than for any other race, and this might well be extended to include morning glories in Aunt Tildy's case, since none in Uniontown are quite so fine in growth or brilliance of coloring like nearly all old negroes aunt tildy goes to sleep very readily she was dozing in a rocker on her small porch while the scent of wood smoke and the odor of boiling vegetables issued from the cabin an iron pot hanging from a crane in the fireplace sending forth clouds of steam and an appetizing aroma she clings to old-fashioned equipment and disdains a stove for cooking her baled vegetables or meats in the hanging pot with baked potatoes and pone bread from the oven make up a meal that leaves little to be desired as many visitors who have shared her repast well know as the gate squeaked aunt tildy awoke with a start and a smile come in the white folks i was just a settin here waitin for my greens to bail and i must have dropped off to sleep sit down in dat cheer right there and take off your hat you sure is looking well and i's proud to see you yes ma'am i sure was born in slavery times and i wish to god i could get now what i used to have den cause dem was good times for de black folks dis free niggers don't know what tis to be took good care of course i mean dat I was born on a big plantation near about to Linden, and my old master was named Harris, yes, um, Dick Harris, and my old mistress was Miss Mandy. Before they boys fit in the war, and I members when they went off with the soldiers, old mistress, she cry and hug them boys and kiss em goodbye, and they was gone a long time i was a little gal whence they went to the war and i was most a grown woman when they come home and they both had whiskers young massa richard he limpin and look mighty pale and they say he been wounded and stay in prison on mr johnson's island somewhere up the river but mars willis he look all right except in whiskers old master had a big house in dat same house standin there right now us had plenty to eat and plenty to wear and dat's more'n what some folks got now old master was good to all he niggas and my pappy and my mammy both belonged to him there was a slave yard in uniontown and every time a spectator come with a lot of new niggers old master he buy four five niggers and that's how he come to buy my pappy at a speculator brought him a whole passel of niggers from north carolina my mammy here already long to old master her was born hisn some time a no count nigger take and run away but de overseer he put de hounds on he track and dey run him up a tree and de overseer fetch him back next morning oh took it out and he glad to stay home for a spell and behave himself old master had a good overseer too course he went no quality like old master and old mistress but he was a good kin man 
and he didn't have no trouble on de whole plantation all's had a christmas tree in de quarter just like de white folks and dey was presents for everybody nobody was left out big or little there was a meetin house on de plantation and old master had a rule that all de chillun had to go to sunday school soon as dey was big enough and dey had to go in clean white clothes too us shillings hate to see sunday come cause mommy and grandmommy dey wash us and near about rub de skin off gettin us clean for sunday school and dey comb our heads with a jim crow you ain't never see de jim crow hit most like a card what you card wool with what a card look like huff missy where you been raised ain't never seen a card dat crim joe show did hurt but us had her stand hit and sometimes at her all dat maybe she wrap our kinky hair with dead and twist so tight us's eyes could hardly shine my grandmummy her the head cook woman at de big house and us had to mind her like us did mammy i helped grandmummy in de kitchen after i got big enough and she sure did keep me on shillings had to mind the olders in dem days dey weren't like dey is now don't mind nobody not even de pa when de surrender come old master he told all the diggers dey was free now and some was glad and some was sorry and well they might be sorry if it day knowed what a hard time they gonna had knockin round the world by dissel no old master and no old mistress to look at her em and feed em when they sick and when they well look like to me when the surrender parted the white folks and the black folks it hurt em both they ought to be together just like the good lord tended they be aunt tildy sighed deeply and gazing afar off said if an old master was living now i'd be all right and not half a worry about nothing in spite of her eighty-four years aunt tildy makes her living as a midwife and serves as a doctor man in cases of minor ailments but her practice is so closely interwoven with conjuring that it is difficult to say which is the more important to her for example she prescribes wearing matches in the hair or a little salt on the mole of the head for headache her sovereign remedy for rheumatism is anoint the joints with a little kerosene oil and put some mullein leaves on it a good dose of turpentine is good for most anything to matter with you a coin with a hole in it usually a dime tied around the ankle will keep you from getting pison furthermore this same treatment warns against the ill effects of getting conjured if in you gets conjured the dime turn black and you can go to de conjurer doctor and get de conjure took off is you got to go missy come back again i's always proud to see you aunt tildy called after me from the edge of the porch end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. March 16, 2023, Westford, Massachusetts. Slave Narratives. A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Sarah Colquitt. Interview with Sarah Colquitt, Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama. She just can remember her husband's name. Sarah Colquitt, who used to till the fields in slavery days, now has a handmaiden of her own. Sarah does not know the date of her birth in Richmond, Virginia, 
but she says it was more than a century ago, 1937. The girl, whom her daughter has employed to take care of the nearly blind and helpless centenarian, is well past 80 herself, yet she keeps her charge neat and clean and the cabin in which they live tidy. Sarah's daughter works in the fields nearby at Opelika, Alabama, to keep the family going. Mr. Bill Slaughter and Miss Mary Slaughter was our master and mistress, and they had two chillins, Marsa Robert and Marsa Brat, Sarah said. I had four brothers and sisters, Tate, Sam, Jenny, and Tenor. Us lived in log cabins with dirt floors, and they was built in two long rows. Us beds was nailed to de wall at one end, and us used corn shucks and pine straw for mattresses. Miss Mary was good to us, but us had to work hard and late. I worked in de fields every day from four daylight to almost plumb dark. I used to take my littlest baby with me. I had two chillins, and I'd tie it up to a tree limb to keep off the ants and bugs whilst I hoed and worked the furrow. All us niggers was fed from the big kitchen and wasn't hungry, but sometimes us would steal more food than was give us anyhow. I was one of the spinners, too. I had to do six cuts to de reel at the time and do hit at night plenty times. Us clothes was homespun on Snaberg. What us would die, sometimes solid and sometimes checked. Sides working de fields and spinning, sometimes I'd hope with de cooking up at de big house when de real cook was sick or us had a passel of company. Us cooked on a great big fireplace what had arms hang out over de coals to hang pots on to bile. Then us had three-legged skillets what set right over de coals for frying and sich like. Us cooked sure enough bread in them days, ash cakes, the best thing you ever et. They ain't nothing like that these days. I was sold once it before I left Virginia. Then I was brung down to Alabama and sold from the block for $1,000 to Mr. Sam Rainey at Camp Hill, Alabama. I still worked in de fields, but I would cook for de white folks and hope around the big house on special occasions. Our overseer was Mr. Green Ross, and he was a bad one, too. Mean, my goodness, he'd whip you in a minute. He'd put you in de buck, tie your feet, and then set out to whoop you right. He would get us slaves up for day, blowing on his big horn, and us would work twelve plumb dark. All de little niggers get up too, and go up to de big house to be fed from wooden bowls. Then they'd be called again for us, come from de fields, and put to bed by dark. I used to stop by de spring house to get de milk. It was good cold, too, and toted up to de big house for dinner. I had two chillins. They was named Lou and Eli, and they was took care of like the rest. Us used to have some good times. Us could have all de fun we wanted on Saturday nights, and us sure had it. Cutting monkey shines and dancing all night long sometimes. Some would pat and sing, Key's not a running, Key's not a running. And us sure did more and dance, I'm telling you. Sometimes our mistress would come down early to watch us dance. Next to our dances, the most fun was corn shucking. Marcia would have the corn hauled up to the cribs and piled as a house. Then he would invite the hands round to come up and hop shuck it. Us had two leaders or generals and choose up two sides. Then us see which side could win first and holler and sing. I disremembers the hollers just now. 
My mind is sort of missing. Marcel would pass the jug around too. Then they sure could work and that pile'd just vanish. Us used to white folks church in the morning. I joined the church then, cause I always tried to live right and with the Lord. When the Yankees come through Dadeville, Alabama, us heard about it, and Marsa hid his money and lots of his fine things in the color folks' houses. They never found em neither. Let me see who I married. I mighty nigh forgot who it was I did marry. Now I knows it was Prince Hodnet. No em, I don't want no more slavery. I hope they don't have no more such, cause hit was terrible. Yes, um, I'd be proud to have my picture took. So pridefully Sarah's chair was dragged out onto the porch by her maid, and the picture was took. End of section 28section 29 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various, Section 29, Interview with Mandy McCullough Cosby, Margaret Fowler, Fruithurst, Alabama. They called us McCullough's free niggers. Manda McCullough Cosby puffed reflectively at her mellowed corncob pipe and began her story. My massa, Bryant McCullough, was a Chambers County man. He had so many slaves, I can't tell you the number. He didn't know himself how many he had. I is now 95 years old. And what I remembers most is the way the children roll around in the big nurse's room. Mandy lives at 1508 Pine Street, Anniston, Alabama. She was cutting collards for dinner and left her dishpan and butcher knife to receive her collar. Miss McCullough, he raised niggers to sell, and the little black children play round until about sundown. They is give they supper. A long trough out in a cool place in the backyard is filled with good cold buttermilk and cornbread crumbed in. And they each is give a spoon, and they each they fill. Then they is ready for bed. Some of them just fall over on the ground asleep and is picked up and put on the pallet in the big chillin's room. They was old woman called the nurse look after them. They get good care for the master expects they will bring good money. Old miss, she don't like to see them sold, and she cry every time. She's so tender hearted, but Miss McCullough is just like men's is today. He just laughs and go on. But he was good to his black folks. Folks called us McCullough's free niggers. Wasn't much whipping went on round our plantation, but on some places close to us, they whipped until blood run down. Some places they even mixed salt and pepper in water and bathed them with it. The salt watered hill, but when the pepper got in there, it burned like fire. And they'd as well get on to work quick, cause they can't be still no how. One woman on a plantation not so far from us was expecting, and they tied her up under a hackleberry tree and whipped her until she died. Most any time at night, if you go round that tree, you could hear that baby cry. I expect you could hear it yet. 
Everybody said that was murder and that something ought to be done about it, but nothing ever was. Miss McCullough always give his folks plenty of something to eat, and then he say, "I's looking for plenty of work. Niggers fat and greasy can't do nothing but work." My mother was a loomer. She didn't do nothing but weave. We all had regular stints of spinning to do when we come from the field. We sat down and eat a good supper, and every night until ten o'clock, we spin cuts of cotton and reeled the thread. And next day, the rolls was carded and packed in a basket to be wove. Spinning wheels was in every cabin. There were so many of us to be took care of. It took lots of spinning. End of section twenty-nine. Read by Carol Sutton, Knox, Pennsylvania. November fourth, two thousand twenty-two. Section thirty of Slave Narratives: A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume One, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives: A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume One. Alabama Narratives by Various Emma Crockett Interview with Emma Crockett Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, Alabama On the old east road from Livingston to Epps, about six miles northeast of Livingston, is the double house built of widely assorted materials where Emma Crockett lives. The older part of the house is the Sutton Room, where the stick-and-clay chimney of its earlier days has been replaced by a new brick chimney. A roof of corrugated sheet metal tops the warped, roughly-hewn logs which form the walls. The new room is built in the later shanty style, pine boards unplaned and nailed upright to a frame of two-by-fours, the cracks of the flat joints stripped with narrow siding. A roof of bought shingles covers this room. Connecting the two rooms is an open hall roofed with heavy boards ribbed from pine blocks. Despite its conglomerate architecture, this is a better colored folks' house than many in the Black Belt. These double houses often have no roof for the hall, and some also lack a floor, the hall being made entirely of earth, sky, and imagination. Emma settled herself on the top step at the front of the hall to talk to me after first ironing a tiny wrinkle out of her string apron with her hand. Miss, I'm about seventy-nine or eighty year old, she told me, and I belong to Mars Bill Hawkins and Miss Betty. I lived on their plantation right over yonder. My mammy was called Cassie Hawkins, and my pappy was Alfred Jolly. I was Emma Jolly, for I married old Henry Crockett. Us had five children and there's two of them living in Birmingham, Fanny and Mary. Sometimes I can't get my mind together so as I can tell nothing. I felt the other day and had a misery in my head ever since. I wish I could read, but I won't never learn nothing, exceptin' after surrender. Miss Sally Coates, she showed us how to read printin', but I can't read no writin'. I can't tell you so much about the war, "'cause my recollection ain't no count these days. "'All I knowed, twas bad times and folks got whooped, "'but I can't say who was to blame. "'Some was good and some was bad. "'I seed the patter rollers, and at the surrender, the Ku Kluxes. "'They comed in, but didn't ever bother me. "'See, I wa'n't so old, and I minded everybody, "'and didn't vex em none. Us didn't go to church none, but I goes now to New Prophet Church, and my favorite song is, Set down, set down, set down, set down, set down, set down, child, set down, soul so happy till I can't set down. Move to member, move Daniel, move to member, move Daniel. Daniel, member, don't move so slow. 
Daniel, member, don't move so slow. Got on my rocking shoes, Daniel. Got on my rocking shoes, Daniel. Shoes going to rock me home. Shoes going to rock me home, Daniel. Shoes going to rock me home, Daniel. Shoes going to rock me home, Daniel. Daniel. Shoes going to rock my faith. Shoes going to rock by faith, Daniel. Shoes going to rock by faith, Daniel. Love to member, move Daniel. Love to member, move Daniel. Got on my starry crown, Daniel. Got on my starry crown, Daniel. Ugh, <sighs> that's all I can tell you today, honey. Come back when the misery leave my head, and I gwine to think up some tales and old songs. But I didn't ever fool with no hoodoo and no animal stories neither. I didn't have no time for such foolishness. And I ain't scared of nothing neither. I lives here with my grandchild now, on Mr. Bob Davis's place. Us gets enough to eat, I reckon. But it's tight, I tell you that. End of section 30 Section 31 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States, from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various, Shenny Cross, Gittin' Ma Pension. From all accounts, Aunt Shenny Cross must be quite ninety years old. In during the war. She says, I had done long past my thirteenth birthday. Today, Aunt Shenny is a true reflection of slavery days and the Southern Mammy. Away from highways and automobiles, she lives several miles from Evergreen on a small farm in the piney woods with her baby boy. Talk with Aunt Shenny reveals that Evergreen City Marshal. Harry L. Riley put out to hope this old family servant who had tended to his father, George Riley, his mother, Miss Narcissus, and Miss Lizabel, his sister. She also helped bring his own chillin' into the world. Aunt Shenny had promised Mr. Riley that she would come in town on a certain Saturday morning in May. 1937, and would bring a letter from her young mistress for me to read. It was past noon on that particular Saturday when she came up the back steps, a little out of breath, but smiling. Lord, honey, she said, here it is past dinner time and I was just making my arrivement here. No, I don't want snow dinner. Thank you, just the same. What makes me so late here now? I stopped by Miss Ella Northcutt's. She's my folks too, you know, and she done made me eat all I can hold. But no, honey, I can't eat no cabbage. Me and cabbage never is set horses together much, but I will thank you for the iced tea. Settling herself down in a low chair, she sighed and began taking off her shoes. Honey, uh, you don't mind if I rests my feet, does you? My white folks is spelling me here today. I'll be looking for it tomorrow, too, and I won't be getting it. Her black eyes twinkled in her shiny, old, wrinkled face as she talked on. I told Mr. Harry I was coming, and here I is. How'd I come? 
I come on Mac and Charlie, that's how. Yes, ma'am, these two boys here, they brung me. Pushing her feet out for inspection, she leaned forward, smiling and pleased. These here foots, these Mac and Charlie. These my whole penance for getting about. Don't you worry none. Uh, Mr. Harry, he'll get me back home, gains dark, come on. No, honey, I don't want to know no better folks than Mr. Harry and Miss Emma. I follow them good folks clean up to Muscle Show. Yes, some I sure did. At first, I told them I couldn't go no how. But they pulled down on me so hard, looked like I couldn't hit myself. I stayed on up there at Muscle Show till I got so homesick to see my baby boy I couldn't stand it no more. Now, cause my baby boy, he was then the father of his own, a boy and a girl. But to me, that boy is still just my baby, and I had to come on home. Aunt Jenny's little old body shook with laughter as she leaned back and said, Yes, ma'am. I ain't been home no time at all, neither. Twelve here come Mr. Harry back to Evergreen with his own cell. Yes, Lord. I can see him now, coming up the big hardwood road, his head reared back, smoking a cigarette like he's a millinery. Lord, Lord. <laughs> Me nor Mr. Harry, neither one, ain't never gonna be contentious nowheres, but right here. And that's the God's truth. If and Mr. Harry hadn't come on back here, I never would have seen no pension. That's the God's truth, too. Nobody here didn't know my exact age, cause this wasn't my original home. All them what did no close on to my age done died out and I knows it. So when Mr. Harry put out to help me, I says in my heart, Thank God! I told Mr. Harry that if in anybody in the world know my age, it was my young mistress, and I didn't know exactly where she at, but her papa was Captain Purifier. Back yonder, he was the magistrate of our town, and he had all of them lawn books. I figured that my birthright would be down in one of them books. I knowed in reason that my mistress still got them books with her, cause they ain't been no burnings that I done heard about. I knowed, too, that Mr. Harry was gonna find out where she at. I members Captain Purifier just like a book. I does that. No, cause when he come on in home from the war, he didn't exactly favor his sister then. Cause when I see him coming round the house, he looked so ragged and ornery. I took him for the old bad man himself. I took out behind the smokehouse. And when I got a good look at him through a crack, it looked like I could recognize his favor. But I couldn't call his name to save my life. Lord, honey, she's a sight. All growed over and bushy. You couldn't tell if in he's man or beast. I kept on a looking whilst he coming round the corner. And then I heard him say, Jenny that you? I'm so happy I just melt down. Aunt Shenny was really living over her past. You see, it's like this, she said. My four parents, they was both. My mistress and my daddy's mistress too was Miss Mary Fields and my daddy was Henry Fields. Then the Carters bought my daddy from Miss Mary Fields. Well, they mix up and down like that. Twelve now, my young mistress. 
what used to be little Frances Purifier. She's married to Mr. Cunningham. I was brung up right in the house with my white folks. Yes, um, I slept on the little trundler bed what pushed up under the big bed in during the day. I watched over them chillin' day and night. I washed them and fed them and played with them. One of their babies had to take goat's milk. When she cried, my mister say, Shenny, go on and get that goat. Yes, Lord. And that goat show did talk sweet to that baby. Just like it was her own. She look at it and wag her tail so fast and say, <laughs> Then she lay down on the floor whilst us holds her feet and let the baby suck the milk. All the time that goat bees talking, <laughs> well, that baby got satisfied. When us chillin got tuck with any kind of sickness or diseases, us took as a fizzity and got it. You know, got it what smell like onions. Then we wore some round us necks that kept our fluids. These days it look like something tit don't taste like that we cooked back yonder. The coffee us used had to be fresh ground every day. And when it comes to buy, I put these here knees down on the floor before the fire and stir that coffee for the longest. Then my grandma, she hung that pot up on them pot hooks over the fire and washed the meat and drip it in. Time she done pick and overlook the greens and then rinch them in spring water. The meat was boiling. Then she take a great big mess of them fresh turnip greens and squash them down in that pot. They just melt down and go to season it. Next thing I know, here come my mistress. And she say, now, Shenny, I want some pound bread for dinner. Them hickory coals in that fireplace was all time ready and hot. There wouldn't be no fingerprints left on that poem when Shenny got the pattern out neither. Better not. Look like them chillin just couldn't get enough of that hard corn bread. Plenty of fancy cooking went on round the fireplace, but somehow the pot liquor and pond bread alongside with the fresh buttermilk stirs my memory worse than anything. All this good eating I uh, speaking about took place before the Yankees raided us. It was then, too, that my mistress took me down to the spring back of the house. Down there it was a hollow tree stump, taller than you is. She told me to climb up to the top of that hollow tree. Then she had me a big heavy bundle, all wrapped up and tied tight. It shows heavy. Then she say, Drop it in, Shanny. I didn't know then what she's up to, but that was the silver and jewelry she was hiding. Yes, honey, I remembers that Yankee red like it was just yesterday. I sitting there in the loom room, and Mr. Thad Watt's little gal, Louise, she's standing at the winder. She say, oh, oh, look, Nanny, just look down yonder. Baby, what is that? I says, them's the Yankees coming. Go and help us, I says. And before I can catch my breath, the place is kivered. You couldn't stir them up with a stick. Feet sounded like mutter and thunder. Them bayonets stick up like they just sitting on the move of their guns. They swords hanging on their side singing a tune whilst they walk. A chicken better not pass by. If then he do, off come his head. When they pass on by me, 
They put na shook me out of my skin. Where's the men's? They say and shake me up. Where's the arms? They shake me till my eyeballs loosen up. Where's the silver? Blood. Was my teeth strapping out? They didn't give me time to catch my breath. All the time, Miss Mary Jess look them in the eye and say nothing. They tuck them in filled rifles, half as long as that door, and bust in the smokehouse winder. They jack me up off in my feet and drag me up the ladder and say, Get that meat out. I kept on throwing out Miss Mary's hams and sausages. Fell they all and stopped. I come back and down that ladder like a squirrel, and I ain't stopped back until I reach Miss Mary. Yes, Lord. Them Yankees loaded up a wagon full of meat and took the whole barrel of lasses. Taking that lasses killed us chillin'. Our main amusement was making lasses candy. Then us cake walk round it. Now that was all gone. Look like them soldiers had to sharpen their swords and everything inside. The big crepe mullen bush by the parlor winder was blooming so pink and pretty, and they just stood there and whack off them blooms like folks' heads driving on the ground. I said the sergeant when he run his bayonet clean through Miss Mary's bestest feather bed and rip it slam open. With that, a wind blowed up and took them feathers ever which way for Sunday. You couldn't see where you was at. The sergeant, he just stowed his head back and laughed fit to kill himself. Then first thing snake, he done suck a feather down his windpipe. Lord, that white man show struggled. Them soldiers stowed water in his face. They shuck him and beat him and roll him over. And all the time, he's getting limber and blue. Then they jack him up by his feet and stand him on his head. Then they bump him up and down. Then they shuck him till he spit. Then he got to. They didn't cut no more mattresses. And they didn't cut nothing much up in the parlor. Because that's where the lieutenant and the sergeant slept. But they left the next day. The whole place was strewed with mutilation. I remember well back there in during the war, however, once a month that come round a big box, longer in our ears and wider too, was stuck to our soldier boys on the battlefield. You never see the lack of sausages that went in that box. With cake and chicken and pies and blood. The butter all rolled up in corn shucks to keep it fresh. Everybody from everywhere come to fix that box and help pile in the stuff. Then you hear him say, Poor soldiers, put it in here. Then everything looked sort of misty, and the heads droop over. Like, then you see a mother's breast heave with her silent prayer. Directly at her the surrender, the Ku Klux's show was bad at the Yankees. They do all sorts of things to aggravate them. There is continual tying grapevines across the road to get them tangled up and make them trip up and break their necks. That was bad, too. So them poor Yankees never specioned no better in that them vines just blowed down or something. Long about then, too, Seem like hunts and spirits was riding everything. They raided mostly round the graveyard. Lord, honey, I ain't hankering after passing by no graveyard. Cause I knows I got to go in there someday. But they do make me feel lonesome and kind of jealous. I remember one night, way back there, when I was walking down the big road with Bud, and he say, look, didn't you see me give that road? That I done pushed me clean out of my place. Now, let me tell you something. If and you ain't never been that close to a heart, 
You don't know nothing. I loud the one followed me home. When I got there, I shook mustard seeds down on my floor. When you sprinkle him like that, he can't get out of that room till he done count every last one of them seed. Well, sir, the next morning, all of us could see was something like a lump of jelly laying there on the floor amongst them seed. Looked like he done counted himself to a pulp. After that night, I put a big sifter down at my door. You know, Hans has to count every hole in that sifter before they can come through. Some folks put the Bible down there, too. Then the poor spirit has to read every word of that book before he crosses over. I reckon about the terriblest thing ever happened to me was that big looking glass. The looking glass was all laid out in the top of my trunk, waiting for my wedding day. One night I standing by the trunk with it wide open. I seed something black before my eyes and then a screech owl lit in my winder and screeched right in my face. I was so scared I saw it right down in the middle of that looking glass. It was in a million pieces. Mama sewed up her hands and hollered, Get up from here, gal. You're going to have seven years of bad luck. Shoot that hooting all the way before you dies in your tracks. Then I swoons off. I feel them hands getting ready to ride me clean down in my grave. About then, something kept saying to me, over and over, throw them pieces of looking glass and run water. Then say, burn your mammy's old shoe and the screech I'll leave. After I does that, my mind was at rest. Soon as my daddy hear him firing off for the surrender, he put out for the plantation where he first belonged. He left me with my mistress at Pine Flat, but went long till he come back to get me and carry me home with him. I hates to leave my mistress, and she didn't want to part from me. She say, stay here with me. And I'll give you a school learning. She said to Captain Purify, You go buy my little nigger a book. Get one of them blue back Websters, she say, so I can indicate her to spell. Then my daddy say, Her mama told me not to come home without her, and she has to go with me. I never will forget riding behind my daddy on that mule way in the night. Us left in such a hurry, I didn't get none of my clothes hardly. And I ain't seed my mistress from that day to this. End of section 31。Section 32 of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Narrator O.C. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. By various. Matilda Pugh Daniel. Matilda Pugh Daniel. Matilda was wed in the white folks' parlor. Near Eufaula, Alabama, on a bluff stands, a little three room cabin neatly furnished with plain, well worn, but nicely kept furniture. Surrounding the house are small beds of pretty flowers and rows of fresh vegetables. Here resides in peace and tranquility Aunt Matilda Pugh Daniel, an old Negro slave aged 96 years. Aunt Matilda was a full-grown buxom gal when the war between the states was raging. She belonged to the United States Senator, James L. Pugh, and was born on his plantation near Eufaula. Even though time has dimmed her sight and slightly diminished her hearing powers, she is still active of mind 
and accurate in her memories. We will let her speak for herself. Yes, uh, white folks. I remember lots of things that happened in the slavery days. I works around a house for the mistress, who was the daughter of General John Lingard Hunter, before she married the massa. When I was a little pigtailed nigger, I used to play around with Massa's chillins. We play engines in the woods and build dams down on the creek and swing in the yard. And sometimes we show do devilish things. We hear Red Pepper and old Black Bob's chewing backer, and you ought to see the faces he made. It makes me laugh still yet. Then we tuck in a skunk that us little white and black devils cotched and turn him loose in the slave quarters. You ought to see them niggas come a-flying out of there. They come out like a swarm of wet answers. After I grew up, I married Joe Daniel, a house nigger, and General Hunter, the Mistress Pappy, formed a ceremony. We was married in the parlor, and I wore a party dress of Miss Sarah's. It sure was purty made out in white tarlatan with a pink bow in the front. I had a pink ribbon round my head, too. And Joe, he looked proud of me. Out of the wedding, all the niggers on the plantation gathered about, and we had a soiree in the backyard. Me and Joe moved to the quarter then, but I still worked in the house. Mistis weren't going to let nobody wash them julep glasses but me. And weren't nobody a going to polish that silver but this nigger here. No, nah, sir. During the war, us weren't bothered much. But out of the surrender, some poor white trash tried to make us take some land. Some of them come to the slave quarters and talk to us. They say, niggers, you is just as good as the white folks. You is titled to vote in the elections and to have money, same as they. But most of us didn't pay no attention to them. Then Massa James and Mistis moved to Washington, and Miss Sarah wanted me to go with her to be her housemaid. She said she'd pay me money for it, but I couldn't leave my old man Joe, because he had a case of consumption. Joe died a year later and left me with four little chillings. Us stayed around on the plantation and the new Mazza paid us good money for working. But soon, the house caught fire and burned to the ground, and I have to move to Eufaula. I bought this little house with the money I saved. I has Ken's folks in Detroit that sends me a little money, and some good peoples in Eufaula helps me out some, so I was in pretty good financial shape. I ain't never associated with no trashy niggas, and I ain't never tend to. I is going to be a proud and good nigger to the last. End of section 32. Read by Narrator OC. Atlanta, January 2nd, 2023. Section 33 of Slave Narratives. A Folk History of Slavery in the United States From Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1, Alabama Narratives This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Narrator O.C. Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1 Alabama Narratives by Various Carrie Davis Carrie Davis Plantation Punishment Carrie Davis said, Honey, there was a lot of cruel things done in slavery times. She was washing when I arrived at her shanty near Smith Station, Alabama. She asked, as so many of the old Negroes do, has you come to help me? I said, no, Carrie. I want you to tell me about slavery. She shook her gray head, recalled, 
Them was good and bad times. Mistus, good and bad. I had a pretty good marster, but the marster on the plantation that Jen Arn was mighty mean. He was a bad man, no matter if the slaves behaved or not. Honey, I remember that he had regular days to whoop all the slaves with strops. The strops had holes in them so that they raised big blisters. Then they took a handsaw, cut the blisters, and washed them in salt water. Our old mistress has put salve on a heap of backs so they could get their shirts off. The shirts stick, you see. The slaves would come to our house for water, and mistress would see them. Asked about her life as a slave, she said, I was born in Harris County, Georgia, and was about 10 or 12 when freedom come. My mammy and pappy was Martha and Nathan Perry and had seven children. Besides me, there was Amy, Ida, Noxie, Jim, Abraham, and Franklin. Us lived in the Perry quarters. The cabins was made of split logs, put up edgeways and daubed with mud inside and out. They was about a hundred yards from the big house where Master Billy and Mistress Nancy Perry lived. Their children was Clara Maria, Melinda, Sarah, Alec, Jim, and Bill. They was real good to us, too. Us ate at the big house. Of course, the food was cooked on the fireplace, but us had meat and greens, but not much biscuits. Us had collard greens and cabbage, too. Sometimes, us would have wild game, cause the men hunted lots and caught rabbits, possums, and coons. They also caught a lot of fish. No, our beds weren't so good. They was homemade, and the sides were scantlings with legs nailed on. Then slats was nailed on top of it to put our shucking straw mattresses on. My grandparents was from Virginia. When I was a slave, I was used as a house girl and to help keep the yards clean and bring in water. Us wore mostly slips, woven homemade looms, and they was Osnaberg and homespun. We wore them Sunday and Monday the same. Us shoes was made at a tanyard and they was brogarns as hard as rocks. I remember that some of our white neighbors was poor and didn't have no slaves. They would help us work. The overseer couldn't whoop them, but he would make them work hard and late. I remember too that the overseer waked us up with a trumpet. They used to tell us that if us didn't work, they was going to sell us to help feed the rest. And bless your soul, us niggas go to work, too. Marster wasn't mean. He would just lock the slaves in the crib for punishment. When niggas was sold, I see many a nigga put on the block for five and six hundred dollars. Us couldn't leave the plantation without a pass. And you better not let them caught you with a book. Us walked to the white church and sat in the back. Mr. Davy Snell preach and baptize, and they have foot washings. Sometimes the niggas get so happy they would shout. Then they would be shouting in the fields next day and get a whipping. If a nigga got out without a pass, they sought the horns on you. And the patrollers tear you up too if you stayed out too late. Us had such good times on Saturday nights. Frolic, dance, and a corn shuckings. Most of them would be drinking and singing and holler. Sheeps in the cotton patch. Got them out Monday. Had it been a white man, got them out Sunday. Kid Kimbrough was our leader, and he could sing Dixie too. Christmas morning, us have a better breakfast, and they would give us rations at the big house. When any of the slaves got married, they went up to the white folks' house and jumped over the broom. 
That was the ceremony at the wedding. And if Marster wanted to mix his stock of slaves with a strong stock on another plantation, they would do the men's and women just like horses. I remember that when two niggas married, they got a big supper. All us chillins had a big time. Played Pretty Pauline, Turn Charlie, and Secklock. No, I never did see nor believe in ghosts. When us got sick, mistress give horse mint, life everlasting, golden rod, and holy teas, yes, em. And us wore asafetida and pop ball seed. When the Yankees come, they handcuffed our folks and took them off. Marster had his meat, corn, fodder, and sack hauled in the swamp near the plantation. Them Yankees went as straight to it as if they had seed us put it there. They burned it all up and took some niggas from the other farm. When freedom come, I remember that Marsta told us that us was free, but that we could stay on if we lacked. Most of us stayed with him for a spell. Now and then the Ku Klux Klan come around and beat on a nigga. I married Charlie Gibson and had two chillin'. 12 grandchildrens and nine great grandchildrens. Honey, I's heard Abraham Lincoln's name, but don't know nothing about him. I got tired living among wicked peoples, and I wanted to be saved. That's why I joined the church and still tries to the right. End of section 33. Read by Narrator OC. Atlanta, January 4th. 2023. Section 34 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Interview with Clara Davis. Francois Lugère Diard. And Clara Davis is homesick for old scenes. I was born in the year 1845, white folks, said Aunt Clara on the Motley Plantation in Bellevue, just north of Monroeville. Us had a mighty pretty place back there. Massa Mosley had about 500 acres and most near to 100 slaves. Was Mars Mosley good to us? Lord, honey, how you talk? Course he was. He was the best white man in the land. Us had everything that we could hope to eat. Turkey, chicken, Beef, lamb, pork, vegetables, fruits, eggs, butter, milk. We just had everything, white folks, everything. Jim was the good old days. How I longs to be back there with my old folks and playing with the chillins down by the creek. Tain't nothing like it today, no, nah, sir. When I tell you about it, you gonna wish you were there, too. White folks, you could have your automobiles and paved streets and electric lights. I don't want them. You can have the buses and streetcars and hot pavements and high building, because I ain't got no use for them no way. But I'll tell you what I does want. I want my old cotton bed and the moonlight nights a shining through the willow trees and the cool grass under my feet as I run around catching lightning bugs. I wants to hear the sound of the hounds in the woods, out of the possum, and the smell of fresh mowed hay. I wants to feel the sway of the old wagon a-going down the red, dusty road and listen to the wheels groaning as they rolls along. I wants to sink my teeth into some of that good old ash cake 
and smack the good old sorghum off of my mouth. White folks, I wants to see the boats a-passin' up and down the Alabama River and hear the slaves a-singin' at their work. I wants to see the dawn break over the black ridge and the twilight settle over the place, spreadin' a sort of orange hue over the place. I wants to walk the paths through the woods and see the rabbits and watch the birds and listen to frogs at night. But they took me away from that a long time ago. Twenty long before I married and had chillings, but don't none of them tribute to my support now. One of them was killed in the big war with Germany, and the rest is all scattered out. Eight of them. Now, I just live from hand to mouth. Here one day, somewhere else the next. I guess we's all going to die if in this depression don't let us alone. Maybe someday I'll get to go home. They tells me that when a person crosses that river, the Lord gives him what he wants. I done told the Lord I don't want nothing much. Only my home, white folks. I don't think that's too much to ask for. I suppose he'll send me back there. I've been a-waiting for him to call. End of Section 34「Slave Narratives – A Folk History of Slavery in the United States – From Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. – Slave Narratives – a Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. George Dillard Interview with George Dillard, Alice L. Barton I loved to pick that box. George Dillard, born in Richmond, Virginia, in 1852, now idles about his little home at Utah, and recalls days when he was a slave. The memories bring smiles to his wrinkled black face. Honey, there was a dance every Saturday night, he chuckled, and all the niggers nigh bought broke their legs at dancing. And didn't you dance just as hard as the others, Uncle George? Well, mistress, I was right spry, but I was at my best in the job of picking the banjer. I surely did love to pick that box while the other niggers danced away. George and his family came from Virginia to Mississippi, and that he came to Greene County about sixty years ago. His two masters were a Mr. Dillard and Bob Steele. George explained that he was a field hand and had to work hard most of the time. But us had plenty to eat, he said. The food was cooked in old Mr.'s kitchen and sought to, to feel on a big cart. I remember that a bell would ring for us to get up, and we would work as long as it was daylight. George said that Mr. Steele owned about two hundred slaves, and that he always had plenty of everything. The plantation, he said, consisted of about two thousand acres. Oh, Massa had a church right on the plantation for us niggers, he continued. Many's the time I danced late in the night, and then had to get up and go to church with the rest. All of us had to go. A white man would preach, but I always enjoyed the singing most of all. George believes earnestly that ghosts exist, the myths they have never bothered him. They is all around, he maintains, but they don't follow me. No, I's not afraid of em, but I knows plenty of niggers that'll run if a ghost so much as brushes by em. The old darkie said that Adder freedom came to de war. He continued to live with his master and worked a share crop. He said that Mr. Steele was always fair and good to him, always giving him the best of everything. George married Celia Shelton, and to them were born twenty-four children. It was a bunch of dem, he said, 
but I loved every one. I had a nice wedding, and de white folks helped me to get myself a woman, and then to get married to her. End of section thirty five. Section thirty six of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume one Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. By Various. Ella Dilliard. Personal Interview with Ella Dilliard, 756 Canal Street. Mobile, Alabama. Isla B. Prine. Ella's white hen is heaps of company. Ella Dilliard, an old Negro woman who lives at 756 Canal Street, Mobile, says she was a small girl during slavery time and does not know the hardships of it because she was owned by good people. Her mother's name was Mary Norris, owned by Mrs. Calvin Norris, who lived in Selma, Alabama, but had a homestead in Mobile. Her father belonged to people by the name of Childress, and his name was Green Childress. She doesn't remember much about him because his white people took him to Texas. Ella said that her mother was her madam's hairdresser and that Mrs. Norris had her mother taught in Mobile. So Ella's life was very easy as she stayed around the big house with her mother, although her grandmother Penny Ann Norris cared for her more than her mother did. One of the things she remembers quite distinctly was her grandmother's cooking on the fireplace and how she would not allow anyone to spit in the fireplace. She said her grandmother made corn pone and wrapped it in shucks and baked it in ashes. Ella said she did not know many colored people since the quarters were quite a ways from the big house and that the plantation was managed by an overseer. She said the quarters were built in rows, with streets between them. She also remembers the first boat she ever saw. That was when she was brought to Mobile after the surrender, and when she saw the boat, she said to her mother, Look at that house sitting on the water. Ella said that there were three cooks at the big house, their names being Hannah, Judy, and Charlotte, and the gardener's name was Uncle John. Ella also said that one thing that she remembers so well about the kitchen in the big house was a large dishpan that had a partition in the middle of it. One side you washed the dishes in, and the other side was used for scalding them. The slaves always had Saturdays to wash their clothes and do things for themselves. Ella, not having lived among Negroes, does not know much about their habits and customs, but she does remember seeing the big white covered wagons that the slaves were carried in to be sold, and remembers hearing talk of the patty rollers. She said when the slaves were sold, they were put on a block, and that the man who were buying would look in their mouths just like they did horses. Ella said she was born in Greensboro, Alabama, but the plantation where she later lived was on the Alabama River near Selma, Alabama. She doesn't know how many acres it comprised or how many slaves that her master owned. She remembers her madam made her stop calling her mother Mammy and her father Daddy. She said, You know, miss, that the white children nowadays call their parents Mammy and Daddy like the colored people used to. The children now do not respect their parents as they should, and in fact everything is so different, the truth done be under the table. You know, miss... I am telling the truth, because the Bible says, Woe be unto the one that lies. Judgment is on the land. In those days, people had to work to live, and they raised most everything they used, such as cattle, hogs, cotton, and foodstuff. Then the women spun the thread out of cotton and wove the cloth. Ella helped her grandmother at the weaving by picking up the shuttles for her. She said they generally used the cloth as it was woven. The shoes were made on the place and were called red brogans. As for the churches, the white folks had the brush arbor camp meetings where the people would go and camp in little cabins for weeks 
so they could attend the church. They had newspapers then, Ella said. But course they ain't like you have now. There weren't so many as there is now. You asked me something, miss, about medicines. I don't remember much about any medicine, because Mr. Calvin Norris was a doctor, and he always treated us when we were sick. There was a Dr. Browder who tended the plantation. Ella is a bright-colored, small woman whose eyes are very keen. She says that a short time ago she had some trouble with her eyes, and she got something from the drugstore to bathe them with, but it did not help them. So she caught some pure rainwater and anointed her eyes with that, and now she can see to thread a needle. Her life has been very colorful in many respects. She recalled as a small child that during the war, a mini-ball came through a brick wall of the servant house where they were living, but it fell without harming any of the servants. She said when Wilson's raid was made on Selma that the Yankee men went through the house just like dogs taking whatever they wanted. I remembers Mr. Parkman putting two sacks of money down in his big well and him getting it out with hooks after the Yankees left. Later, when she was brought to Mobile, she worked for Judge Oliver Sims for 20 years. Judge Sims was the son of Admiral Raphael Sims, and she said he was a blessed, good man. For the past 14 years, she has been working for the Frank Lyons family of Mobile. Ella lives in a double tenement house, having one room and a small kitchen. The room is full of old furniture and odd things. On the mantel is a lovely old china pitcher that once was owned by Judge Sims and which Ella prizes very much. The thing that puzzles Ella most among the modern inventions, she said, are the aeroplanes and the way ice is made. She said, Miss, we never had any ice away back yonder. We had nice old open brick wells and the water was just like ice. We would draw the water and put around the milk and butter in the dairy. It's a mystery to me how they make that ice, but my goodness, I guess I need not worry my head about things because I am not here for long. All my family is dead and gone now, and the only companion I have is this here little white hen. Her name is Mary. You see, I bought her last year to kill for Christmas, but I couldn't do it. She is so human, and you ought to see the eggs she lays. I even have a few to sell sometimes. I just keeps Mary in the room at night with me, and she is heaps of company for me. End of section 36「Section 37 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Rufus Dirt Interview with Rufus Dirt, Woodrow Hand, Birmingham, Alabama. Rufus would talk a lot for a dime. Forward This Negro, Rufus Dirt, was found in one of Birmingham's busiest streets begging for coins. Because of his inability to read, he was unable to give the number or location of his home. All he knew was just somewheres on South Side, boss. I'll drop a dime in your hat, uncle, if you'll stand here and talk to me for a few minutes. Show, sure, boss, if in you wants. I'll talk all day for dat much money. I's been here for a long time, and I knows plenty to talk about. What does you want to know? I explained my interest in slavery days and my search for ex-slaves but he began telling me before I had time to finish. His ability to talk had somehow escaped what his age had done to his hair, which was sparse as well as snowy white. His eyes were a glazy red. One hand and arm seemed to be crippled, but the other waved around in the air as he talked, 
and finally settled on my shoulder. Boss, uh, I don't really know just how old I is. I was a driver, Negro boss for other slaves, during slavery, and I reckons I was about uh, twenty-something. I don't remember nothing in particular that caused me to get dat driving job, sippin' hard work, but I knows dat I was proud of it cause I didn't have to work so hard no more. And then it sort of made the other niggers look up to me, and you knows us niggers, boss, nothing makes us happier than to strut in front of other niggers. There ain't nothing much to tell about. We just move one crop at the other till lay and by time come, and then we'd start on the winter work. We done just bout the same as all the other plantations. My massa's name was Digby, and we lived at Tuscaloosa before the war. And bout that war, white folks, them was some scary times. The nigger women was afeard to breathe out loud come night, and in the daytime they didn't work much cause they was always lookin for the Yankees. They didn't come by so much cause after the first few times. There wanted no reason to come by. They had done it up everything and toted off what they didn't eat. They took all massa stock, burned down the smokehouse, ere they took the meat out, and they burned the barn, and we all think every time that they going to burn the house down, but they must have forgot to do that. When the war was finally over and I was free, my family went to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where we made a living first one way and then another. I don't know how long we stayed there, but I was living in Birmingham when there wa'n't nothing much here at all. I watch all the big buildings round here go up, and I see them build all the big plants, and I still watchin'. But I still don't know how to tell folks where places is, cause I don't know how to read numbers. I goes anywhere I want to go, and I don't ever get lost, but just the same I can't tell nobody where I am. I don't even know where we is standin' talkin' like this right now. And, boss, I ain't beggin' cause I's too lazy to work. I's worked plenty in my time till I crippled this arm in the mines, and before my eyes got so bad. And with a grace and gentleness that may be called the characteristic of his generation, he added, I hope I's told you what you wants to know. He had. I felt well repaid for the dime I had given him. As he walked off down the street, I noticed for the first time the large crowd that had gathered around us. Evidently, slave tales carry more interest than this writer realized. End of section 37「Section 38 of Slave Narratives – A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves – Volume 1 Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Florence Short. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives by Various. Catherine Epps. Interview with Catherine Epps. Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama. Cabins as far as you could see. Ma Epps sat on the steps of her weather-beaten, unpainted little cabin, duplicate of the dozens that make up Rat Row, Negro Quarter of Uniontown, and looked down the vista of memory to her childhood when she lived in where the log cabins stretched as far as you could see into slave quarters. Despite her 87 years, Catherine Epps, known to everyone as Ma, came as sprightly to her tiny porch as her rotund body would permit. She smiled broadly at her interviewer and seated herself slowly. Sure, honey, I can tell you more anything you want to know about the big fight. Cause I been here a long time, she began her story. They ain't many left to tell about them days. My mammy and pappy was Peter and Emma Lines and us all belonged to Marsa, Frank, and Miss Sarah Lines. I was born under plantation five miles below Fawnsdale, about 1850, so they tells me. I is right, oh, but thank God I still got my teeth and my air left. Proudly, the old woman unwrapped her head rag 
to display a thick mop woolly white but neatly parted into squares dozens of little plaits wrapped with yards of twine just as her hair had been dressed in the slave quarters before the war adorned her head she sat with uncovered head unblinking in the bright june sunshine as she took up the tale of her health i sees pretty good too but i so heavy i ain't able to tow myself round as pert as i used to it was different back in dem days when i belonged to rich white folks they had plenty of niggers and they was log cabins in de quarters just as far as your eyes could see massa frank and miss sarah was good to de black folks too de son young massa frank fit in de big war atter de war was over i stayed on the lines place twell atter i married and old miss gin me my wedding dress and a long veil down to my foots when us children's in de quarters we did a mighty lot playing us used to play sail away raleigh a whole lot us would haul hands and go round in the ring getting faster and faster and dem what fell down was out of game my mammy walked in de big house a spinnin and a nussin de white chillins all of dem called her mammy i remembers one thing just like it was yesterday miss sarah went to mospolis to visit with her sister and whilst she were gone the overseer what go by de name of allen whooped my mamma across her back twill de blood runned out when miss sarah come back and found it out she was de maddest white lady i ever seed she sunk for de overseer and she say allen what you mean by weapon mammy you know i don't allow you to touch my house servants she jerk her dress down and stands there looking like a soldier with her white shoulder shining like a snow bag and she say i'd rather see dem marks on my own shoulders than to see em on mammy's they wouldn't hurt me no worse then she says allen take your family and get off of my place don't you let sundown catch you here so he left he wasn't nothing but white trash no how ma epps sat silent for a time as she recalled the vision of miss sarah standing straight and regal in her dismissal of the overseer finally she turned with an abrupt change of subject honey is you a christian she asked earnestly i hopes you is cause you is too fine looking for to go to hell i belongs to the baptist church and they calls me ma epps cause i's de mother of de church i loves to sing de gospel hymns she began to sing in a high cracked voice her body swaying with the rhythm the song rose until her neighbors had gathered to form quite an audience with much moaning between every line she sang i am a soldier of de cross a follower of de lamb i'm not a fear to own his name nor to fend his cause i want you to come i want you to come i want you to come and be saved she was still singing as i left her the neighbors joining in the choruses suppers would be late in the row of weather-beaten cabins because the spirit of song was on the gathering end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Reuben Fitzpatrick. Interview with Reuben Fitzpatrick, Mabel Ferrier, Montgomery, Alabama. A Horn for a Headache. Reuben Fitzpatrick of Eugene Street, Montgomery, was born January 9, 1854, 83 years old. He says, My master was Mr. Golson from Bullock County. 
He had lots of slaves, cause he was a rich man. I was just a boy ten years old, and he was a squire that tried cases, so he rode all over the country to difficult places. I rode with him to hold his horse. He wore a high top black hat and had a buggy with a top that let back. When we went, we was gone a long time, and when night come, he would fix it for me to slip with some of the niggers in the quarters where we stopped. I sure liked to go about with him. My mother was the cook. She had rule over all the cooking. She spin thread and reeled it off, too. When the Yankees come through the country, I see them all running, so I thought it was judgment day, and I run and hid under the chimney and stayed there till night. They didn't tarry long, but they drove the horses right up on the piazza and throwed everything out at the houses, even knocked down the smokehouse doors. That's the truth. One time, I was taken to the slave market and was screwed on the block, and Mr. Martin bought me and my mamma. The man who was selling us would holler, Who a bid? Who a bid? He was supposed to be spry and fidgety so as to make the men want to buy us. My first master was Wash Jones. He wanted good to us. He would hit us with his cane just as if it had been a switch. Ben Jones didn't like the way Mars Wash treated us niggers. He bought us for his son. We didn't have no doctors much in them days, but us had a horn us use when we got sick. If us had the headache, that horn would go right over the spot, and it wouldn't be no time for the pain to be gone. We'd use that horn any time we was ailin', and it'd show do the work. I used to have the horn, but I don't know just where it is now. End of section 39section 40 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various Haywood Ford Interview with Haywood Ford, Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama Haywood Ford tells a story. Why, folks, said Haywood Ford, I was going to tell you a story about a mean overseer and what happened to him during the slavery day. It all commenced when a nigger named Jake Williams got a whooping for staying out at a time on his past don't give out. All the niggers on the place hated the overseer worse than prison, cause he was so mean and used to try to think up things to whoop us for. One morning the slaves was lined up ready to eat their breakfast and Jake Williams was a petting his old red bone hound. About that time the overseer come up and see Jake a petting his hound and he say, Nigger, you ain't got time to be a foolin' long that dog. Now make him git. Jake tried to make the dog go home, but the dog didn't want to leave Jake. Then the overseer picked up a rock and slammed the dog in the back. The dog, he then went a howlin' off. That night, Jake, he come to my cabin, and he say to me, Haywood, I is gonna run away to a free state. I ain't a gonna put up with this treatment no longer. I can't stand much more. I gives him my hand and I say, Jake, I hope you gets there. Maybe I'll see you again sometime. Haywood, he says, I wish you look out of my hound, Belle. Feed her and keep her the best you can. She a mighty good possum and coon dog. I hates to part with her, but I knows that you is the best person I could leave her with. And with that, Jake slip out the door and I seed him a walking toward the swamp down the long furrows of corn. It didn't take that overseer long to find out that Jake done run away, and when he did, he got out the bloodhounds and started off at her. It weren't long afore Jake heard them hounds a howling in the distance. Jake, he was too tired to go any further. He took around and doubled on his tracks so as to confuse the hounds, and then he clumb a tree. Turned long afore he see the light of the overseer coming in 
through the woods, and the dogs was a-getting closer and closer. Finally, they smelled a tree that Jake was in, and they started barking around him. The overseer lift his lighter pine knot in the air so he could see Jake. He say, Nigger, come on down from there. You done wasted enough of our time. But Jake, he never move nor make a sound. And all the time the dogs keep a howling, and the overseer keep a swearing. Come on down, he say again. If you don't, I's coming up and knock you out of that tree with a stick. Jake still, he never moved and the overseer then began to climb the tree. When he got where he could almost reach Jake, he swung that stick, and it come down on Jake's leg and hurt him terrible. Jake, he raised his foot and kicked the overseer right in the mouth, and that white man went a-tumbling to the ground. When he hit the earth, them hounds pounced on him. Jake, he then lowered himself to the bottom limbs so as you could see what had happened. He saw the dogs a-tearing at the man, and he holler, Hold em, Bell. Hold em, gal. The leader of that pack of hounds, white folks, weren't no bloodhound. She was a plain old red bone possum and coon dog, and the rest done just like she done, tearing at the overseer's throat. All the while, Jake he a-hollerin' from the tree for them dogs to get him. Turt long afore them dogs tore that man all to pieces. He died right under that maple tree that he run Jake up. Jake he and that coon hound struck off through the woods. The rest of the pack come home. I see Jake after us niggers was freed. That's how come I knowed all about it. It must have been six years after they killed the overseer. It was in Kentucky that I run across Jake. He was a-sittin' on some steps of a nigger cabin. A hound dog was a-sittin' at his side. I tells him how glad I is to see him, and then I look at that dog. That ain't Belle, I says. No, Jake answers. This her puppy. Then he told me the whole story. I always did want to know what happened to him. End of section 40. Read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, April 1st, 2023. Section 41 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States. From Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States. From Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1. Alabama Narratives by Various Bert Frederick Interview with Bert Frederick Preston Klein Wants my friends to go with me Wants my friends to go with me New Jerusalem Wonder if I'll ever get to heaven New Jerusalem Nappy-headed, humble little Bert Frederick sang the old song in a voice that trembled and broke on the high notes. His black face beamed when he had finished, and the old times came flooding back into his mind. Honey, old Mast tells us to sing that good song to us niggers, and he always could sing it so pretty. Uncle Frederick, like all the other gray-bearded negroes of the old South, is occupied most of these days with getting ready to meet the sweet Jesus. As well as he can remember, he was around twelve years old when the horn of freedom sounded. He shook his white head when the interviewer asked his age, a slow smile spreading over his face. Hey, child, you axed me a riddle. I disremember about that. The best I can tell you is that I is eighty-odd. But as to Zachness, I can't tell. Some years ago, Uncle Frederick suffered a broken back in an accident. Since then, he has been unable to stand erect, but can straighten his back when seated. Therefore, he politely asked me to sit down when he was asked to pose for a picture. His first master, he says, was Dr. Rich Vernon, who lived in Chambers County. Afterwards, he was sold to William Frederick. He chuckled 
as he recalled the old days. I was a shirt-tail nigger, he laughed. That is, I wore just a long shirt till I was a big scamp, more than twelve year old. Honey, I was a sight to look at. What did I do about the plantation? Well, I drive the cows and sheep to pasture, and see that the no eagles caught the lambs. Us had big eagles round in, and us had to be careful with the small stock. If us want, old eagle would swoop down and tote off a whole lamb. Us had a time in them days. I members that us had to pen to catch wild turkeys in, and us caught a few of them too. Uncle Frederick's mother was Harriet Lumpkin, who lived below Opelika. He had three sisters, Mary Dowdell, Anne Carlyle, and Emma Boyd, but all are dead. When the Yankees came to Alabama, he recalled, old massa told the niggers to hitch up all the wagons and load all the food and such on em. Us had about forty acres of swamp land, so it was hid the stuff there. For long I see a long string of black and white horses with mules behind em. They had packs on their back. In the packs was grub the Yankees had took off at the white people's. Did you enjoy the old slavery days, uncle? Yes, child. They was good days. Some of the white people's was bad to the niggers. But my old massa weren't that kind. That the reason he would let all the niggers sit around whilst he was a singing, and he could sing. Uncle Frederick putters about his tiny home in Opelika, managing to grow a profusion of flowers and vegetables, despite his bent back. He was hoeing in his garden when the interviewer came upon him, but he eagerly laid down the hoe and told what he sought. Uncle, I want to talk with you about the old times. Lordy me, child, he beamed, his eyes twinkling. You done found the right nigger. End of section 41《セクション42 of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Delia Garlic Interview with Delia Garlic Margaret Fowler, Fruithurst, Alabama Dem days was hell. Delia Garlic lives at 43 Stone Street, Montgomery, and insists she is 100 years old. Unlike many of the old Negroes of the South, she has no good words for slavery days or the old masters, declaring, Dem days was hell. She sat on her front porch and assailed the taking of young children from mothers and selling them in different parts of the country. I was growed up when the war came, she said, and I was a mother before it closed. Babies were snatched from their mother's breasts and sold to speculators. Chillins were separated from sisters and brothers and never saw each other again. Course they cry. You think they not cry when they were sold like cattle? I could tell you about it all day, but even then you couldn't guess the awfulness of it. It's bad to belong to folks that own you soul and body, that can tie you up a tree with your face to the tree and your arms fastened tight around it, who take a long curling whip and cut the blood every lick. Folks a mile away could hear them awful whippings. There was a terrible part of living. Delia said she was born in Powhatan, Virginia and was the youngest of thirteen children. I never seed none of my brothers and sisters, except Brother William, she said. Him and my mother and me was brought in a speculator's drove to Richmond and put in a warehouse with a drove of other niggers. Then we was all put on a block and sold to the highest bidder. I never seed Brother William again. Mammy and me was sold to a man by the name of Carter, who was the sheriff of the county. Norm, there were no good times at his house. 
He was a widower, and his daughter kept house for him. I nursed for her, and one day I was playing with the baby. It hurt its little hand and commenced to cry. And she whirled on me, pick up a hot iron, and run it all down my arm and hand. It took off the flesh when she done it. After a while, Master married again, but things weren't no better. I see his wife blacken her eyebrows with smut one day, so I thought I'd black mine just for fun. I rubbed some smut on my eyebrows and forgot to rub it off, and she cotched me. She was powerful mad and yelled, You black devil, I'll show you how to mock your betters. Then she pick up a stick of stove wood and flails it again my head. I didn't know nothing more till I come to, lying on the floor. I heard the mister say to one of the girls, I thought her thick skull and cap of wool could take it better than that. I kept on staying there, and one night the master came in drunk and sat at the table with his head lolling around. I was waiting on the table, and he looked up and see me. I was scared, and that made him awful mad. He called an overseer and told him, took her out and beat some sense in her. I began to cry and run and run in the night, but finally I run back by the quarters and heard Mammy calling me. I went in, and right away they come for me. A horse was standing in front of the house, and I was took that very night to Richmond and sold to a speculator again. I never seed my mammy any more. I has thought many times through all these years how mammy looked that night. She pressed my hand in both of hers and said, Be good and trust in the Lord. Trusting was the only hope of the poor black critters in them days. Us just prayed for strength to endure it to the end. We didn't expect nothing but to stay in bondage till we died. I was sold by the speculator to a man in McDonough, Georgia. I don't recollect his name, but he was open in a big hotel at McDonough and bought me to wait on tables. But when the time came around to pay for me, his hotel done fail. Then the Atlanta man that bought the hotel bought me too. For a long though, I was sold to a man by the name of Garlic down in Louisiana, and I stayed with him till I was freed. I was a regular field hand, plowing and hoeing and chopping cotton. Us heard talk about the war, but us didn't pay no attention. Us never dreamed that freedom would ever come. Delia was asked if the slaves ever had any parties or dances on her plantation. No, she replied. Us didn't have no parties, nothing like that. Us didn't have no clothes for going round. I never had an undershirt until just before my first child was born. I never had nothing but a shimmy and a slip for a dress, and it was made out of the cheapest cloth that could be bought. Unbleached cloth, coarse, but made to last. Us didn't know nothing except to work. Us was up by three or four in the morning, and everybody got their something to eat in the kitchen. They didn't give us no way to cook, nor nothing to cook in our cabins. Soon as us dressed, us went to the kitchen and got our piece of cornbread. There wasn't even no salt in them last years. That piece of cornbread was all us had for breakfast, and for supper, us had the same. For dinner, us had boiled vittles, greens, peas, and sometimes beans. Coffee? No, us never know nothing about coffee. One morning, I remembers I had started to the field, and on the way I lost my piece of bread. I didn't know what to do. I started back to try to find it, and it was too dark to see. But I walked back right slow and had a dog that walked with me. He went on ahead, and after a while, I came on him lying there guarding that piece of bread. He never touched it, so I gave him some of it. Just before the war, I married a man named Chatfield from another plantation, but he was took off to war, and I never seen him again. After a while, I married a boy on the plantation named Miles Garlic. Yes, am Massa Garlic had two boys in the war. When they went off, the Massa and Mrs. cried. But it made us glad to see them cry. They made us cry so much. When we knowed we was free, everybody wanted to get out. The rule was that if you stayed in your cabin, you could keep it. But if you left, you lost it. Miles was working at Wetumpka, and he slipped in and out so us could keep on living in the cabin. 
My second baby soon come, and right then I made up my mind to go to Wetumpkin where Miles was working for the railroad. I went on down there, and I settled down. After Miles died, I lived there as long as I could and didn't come to Montgomery to live with my son. I was eating white bread now and having the best time of my life. But when the Lord say, Delia, well done, come up higher, I'll be glad to go. End of section 42. Section 43 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shushan. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various, Section 43. Angie Garrett, Interview with Angie Garrett, Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, Alabama, Mules Be Eaten and Niggers Be Eaten. She sat in the door of her small cabin a short distance from Livingston, Alabama in philosophical reflection. Time has not softened her memories. As she told these facts, an occasional expression of bitterness passed over her face. As Angie Garrett, she said, I was about 16 years at beginning of the war. I was born in DeKalb, Mississippi. My mother was Betty Scott, and I didn't know my father's name. I had four brothers, Ember, Johnny, Jimmy, and Henry, and three sisters, Delphi, Lizzie Sue, and Frankie, and my grandmother was Suki Scott. She lived five miles from Gainesville across Nuxabee Creek in Fall Oak and Nuxabee, and I lived with her. Never asked about my granddaddy, case went no telling. My mamma lived right here in Gainesville and belonged to Mr. Sam Harwood. I belonged to the Morins and Captain Morin run on a boat to Mobile from Aberdeen, Mississippi. T'was on the Big Bay River, and t'was called the Cremonia. I was the house gal and nurse, and I slept on a pallet in old Mrs. Room. I had plenty to eat long as us was on that boat, and that show was good. But when us was in the cow, vittles was give out at the smokehouse, a slice of meat and piece of bread and peas, and t'was sarned out to the field. Mules be eatin' and niggers be eatin'. I nursed the Morin's little boy Johnny, the little gal had died. Mr. Scott and the cow had bout fifty slaves and a big plantation and a overseer named Barnes. He was a haughty man, and niggers was scared to death cause he would come in a cussin'. Us would get up for daylight, T'was dark when go out, dark when come in. Us make a little fire in the field some mornings, it be so cold. Then us let it go out for the overseer come. If he seed ye, he'd make ye lie down flat on your belly, foots tied out and hands tied out, and whoop ye with the slap of leather strap with a handle. But I was laid cross a cheer. I been whooped till I tell lies on myself to make him quit. Say they whooped till I'd tell the truth, so I had to lie about myself, keep them from killing me. This here race is more like the chillin of Israel, except they didn't have to shoot no gun to set em free. I was sold to Mr. John Mooring, cause the property was in debt. And then first, I belonged to Mrs. Scott at the Cowb, and her sold me, and I sure was glad. I walked here to Gainesville from DeKalb, Mississippi. Us wasn't allowed to learn nothing. Sometimes us sing and have a little prayer meeting, but twas mighty easy and quiet like. Grandma Suki used to sing, Travel long, travel long, soon be over. If any us died in them days, bared us quick as they could and got out of there and got to work. At night, they blowed the horn for em to bring in the cotton what the women spend. They made all the cloth. Us worked nights too, but us rested Sundays. 
us didn't get no presents at Christmas. Sometimes us had a corn shucking and no celebration for no marriage. Dat was called jumpin' de broom, just taken up with him. They all want you to have plenty of chillin' though. Us wore asafetida round us neck, keep off the smallpox and measles. Us didn't have much medicine, and some of em was always full of bad complaints, like Carrie, my neighbor, what you asked about. I be's a hurtin', but I can't never get in edgeways for her. Always got a lot of excuses. Don't one never specs to die without folks knows what ails her. But she brought me some black-eyed peas today, and I likes em, cause they boil soft. And I say, if the devil brought it, God sent it. Sometimes I be's hungry, and I say, what is I'm going to eat? And along comes somebody with something. Wish you could have heard that calliope under Cremonia. They danced some time most all night, but they didn't act like they do now. Twas nice behavior. Looked like everything going back to heathenism and hits on the way now. But the good Lord helps me. He holds my hand. I ain't got nothing gin nobody. I don't see no need of fussin' and fightin' and a drinkin' whiskey. Us livin' in a new world, and I go on makin' the best I can of it. Some I like, some I don't. I got one daughter, Fanny Watson, a good washer and ironer right here in Gainesville, and I got a son too, say so he ain't gonna marry till he can treat the woman good as she can treat herself. I makes him wait on me, and he gets mighty raw sometimes. But I tells him I'm just much older than he is now as I was when he was born. Then he gives me a old dirty dime, but now with these here tokens, you gotta pay some of it for spending. They tells me it's the governor, and I say, let him carry him. He can tote him. I ain't able. Well, once ain't always, and twice ain't forever. No, um, I don't go to church no more. The preachers here has gone blind about money. They ain't interested in their soul. Some folks belongs to the church and ain't been changed. The church ain't all of it. I'm members day of emancipation. Yankees told us we was free, and they call us up from the field to sign up and see if us wanted to stay on with them. I stayed that year with the Morins, then I bargained for land, but couldn't never pay for it. Turned loose without nothing. But they was a coal black freeborn nigger named George Wright had a floating mill right here on the Big V River, stayed at the point of the woods just above the spring branch, and it did a good service. But he got in debt and he sold his five boys. They was his own children, and he could sell them under the law. Their names was Eber, Eli, Ezekiel, Enoch, and Ezra, and he sold them to the highest bidder right yonder front of the post office for cash. And Jack Tom was another free nigger here, and he bought some of them, and the others the white folks bought, and I never heard no complaint, and I see them long as they lived. They was a heap of things went on, some I lacks to remember, some I don't. But I'd rather be free now. I never seed Mr. Lincoln, but when they told me about him, I thought he was partly God. But Mr. John Rogers right here, he's dead and gone now. He was what he was, and he wasn't seatful. Go to him after you got into anything, and he'd more nap to tell you what to do. He was wild when he was young, but he settled down, and he was the best white man to the niggers I ever knowed. He'd help me right now if he was living and seen me wearing this here rag nasty. He sure would. End of section 43. Section 44 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from interviews with former slaves, 
Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Henry Gary. Interview with Henry Gary. W. F. Jordan, Birmingham, Alabama. Mr. Renfro hangs on a china berry tree. Howdy, Cap'n. Can you tell me how to find your jabs caught? I know exactly where hit was in the old courthouse, but I gets all bumfuzzled trying to find anybody in des new building. His name was Henry Gary. He wore a suit of faded and extensively patched Confederate gray, and a cap of the regulation porter style. His face bore the expression worn only by those of his race who had lived and toiled in the much earlier, and in many instances, happier day. In the presence of white folks, he was at ease, indicating an intimate association and relationship among them and in their service. What business have you in Judge Abernathy's court? You don't look like a criminal, was the response. Oh, no, sir. I ain't never done nothing to nobody in no time. But I sure don't know what this new generation of niggas coming to. It were bad enough when they couldn't get nothing but bootleg con liquor. Now they can buy all the gin they wants right here in Bumminham. And them rapscallions get out on Saturday night. Fill up on gin and get all lit up like a meeting house. Then the first thing they know they gets tangled up with somebody with a razor or a meat axe or something long come to law, locks em up, and they doubles to pay. But why should all that disturb you? They haven't run you in, have they? He was asked. Nah, sir. It's that trifling nerve of mine. That boy kin shall get into Mokin's trouble than a pet monkey. He in jail now for some debilment or other and I spect I's gwine to have to get him out again. That's what I's gwine to see Judge Ab about. Wished I could get that boy back down in Sumter County, on Mars John Rogers Plant. That's where he belong at. Betcha Mars John wouldn't take none of his foolishment. Are you familiar with the people and history of Sumter County? He was quizzed further. Lord, man, I was born in the back yard where... Mars John Rogers live right now. That was right either the surrender, and my mammy belonged to the Vandergraaf family who was to live down and own all that plantation. My daddy's name was Daniel Grady. They come from Virginia long time for they war. All them old peoples is dead now. Only skin folks I have left down da is a cousin. She most a hundred years old and still lives on her little farm a few miles from Gainesville. And Cap'n, when I sight libs, I mean libs. Ain't nothing that grow out in the ground or in the ground in Alabama that's good for folks to eat. But what she got it, and plenty. I goes down dar to visit her twice a year. And man alive, it am a sin the amount of grub I puts away and during them two weeks I stays dar. Yes, sir. I's about due to go down da now. "'Cause that garden sassin brings spring chickens bout ripe. "'My mammy was a seamstress for the Vandegraaff plantation "'and made all the clothes for both black and white. "'She never did leave the plantation after the slaves was freed, "'but stayed right thar till she died. "'She and my daddy both. "'But they was good homes, respectable, church-going people. "'My daddy and mammy was.' The little log chat house is still dar and the nigger still keeps up the services. The old pastor nearly a hundred years old now. It would surprise you how spry he gets about and conducts the meetings. I don't know about the other parts, but from what my mammy tell me, the slaves in Sumter County must have had a mighty good time, had plenty of everything and nothing to worry about. Seems like dar weren't no trouble amongst the whites and blacks. Twelve out of the war. Some white men's come down from the north and mess up with the niggers. I was a mighty little shaver. But I members one night after supper. My daddy and mammy and us chillins was settin' under a big tree by our cabin in the quarters when all at once lickety-split he come gallopin' down the road. 
what looked like a whole army of gozes. Must have been about a hundred and they was with the men and horses, both robed in white. Cap'n, the men looked like they ten feet high and they horses big as elephants. They didn't bother nobody at the quarters, but the leader of the crowd ride right in the front gate and up to the big duck well back of our cabin and holler to my daddy. Come here, nigga. Ho, ho, cause we scared. Yes, sir. Looked like our time done come. My daddy went over to where he's settin' on his hoss at the well. Then he says, Nigga, get a bucket and draw me some cool water. Daddy got a bucket, fill it up and hand it to him. Cap'n, would you believe it? That man just lift the bucket to his mouth and never stopped till it empty. Did he have it off? He just smack his mouth and call for more. Geez, like that. He didn't stop till he drunk three buckets full. Then he just wipe his mouth and say, Lordy, that show was good. It was the first drink of water I've had since I was killed at the Battle of Shiloh. Was we good, Cap'n? From then on, there wasn't a nigger that stick his head out the door for a week. The next day, we find out they was Ku Kluxes, and they found the body of a white man hanging to a post oak tree over by Grand Prairie. His name was Billings, and he come from the north. He'd been over around Livingston, messing up the niggers, telling them they'd been promised forty acres and a mule, and they ought to go ahead and take em from the white folks. But that carpetbagger couldn't do nothing but old Slick Doe. Slick? Yes, yeah, sir. That would everybody call him. He hang round the courthouse at Livingston and listened to the lawyers argufy. He tried to remember all the big words them lawyers use. When that carpetbagger come to town, that nigger Slick was carrying his bag to the hotel. And when they passed the men were well in the street, the men asked Slick, What that water good for? Have it been tested? Slick say, Oh, yes, yeah, sir. That water had been scandalized by the best phenologists in the country. And they say it's three-quarters carbolic acid gas, and the other seven-eighths is hydrophobia. Yes, yeah, sir. That old cannon in the courthouse, Jade at Livingston, was drug out and out the Tombiki River, while the Yankees done sink at time of the war. The men's used to load her up and shoot her off on big days at Livingston. They had to spike the old gun, though, to keep the Balish boys round town from shooting it off just for fun. Get rid of the carpetbaggers. Oh, yes, sir. They vote em out. Well, sir, tell you how they done that. The publicans done paid all the niggers poll tax and give em a receipt so they could vote same as the whites. They made up to elect the officers at the courthouse, all niggers, and then send the other ones to Montgomery to make the laws. Same day the election came off, there was a circus in Livingston, and the Democrats swayed the boss of the circus to let all Sumter County niggers in they show by showing their poll tax receipts. Yes, sir, when they show was over, the election was over, too, and nobody was elected except the white Democrats. Cause that made Sumter County a mighty unhealthy place for carpetbaggers and uppity diggers. You ask me about the old songs the slaves used to sing. Well, I don't remember as many of them. I had to surrender all the old slaves would stay on the plantations round Gainesville. You sit or gather at the land and dar waitin' to see the steamboats pull in from the Tombaugi on their way to Columbus, Mississippi. And somebody started a song on Ma oh, man, how would them niggers sing? Here when I heard my mammy sing so much I learned it. Read in the Bible, understand. Methusala was the old man. He lived nine hundred and sixty nine, then died and go to heaven in the Lord's due time. Methusala was a witness for my Lord, for my Lord. Read in the Bible, understand. Samson was the strongest man. Went out to battle to fight one time, kill the thousand of the Philistines. Samson was a witness for my Lord, for my Lord. Daniel was a Hebrew child, went to the Lord to pray a while. The Lord told the angels the lions to keep, so Daniel lay down and went to sleep. And that's another witness for my Lord, for my Lord. 
now about de ghost tales i never heard many ghost yarns set about de chinaberry tree where they hung mr steve renfro he was elected high sheriff that time they got all de niggers to go to circus instead of goin to the election he a fine lookin man and ride a big white hoss and everybody like him but except a few de carpetbaggers and bother some niggers no matter what if he met one of em he look em square in de eye for a minute then about all he say would be get de hell out of here and man if in day we could fly that would be too slow travelin for them gettin out de country but at a while he got in trouble about money matters they say he got color blind couldn't tell his money from de connie's so they rest him and put him in jail but he bust right out and run off at a while he sneaked back and case his ku klux friends wouldn't help him out of the trouble when he got back in jail he gave him away and tell what their name was one night a gang took him out of the livingston jail and go about a mile out in town and hang him to a chinaberry tree i a heard if and you go to that tree today and kind of tap on hit and say renfro renfro what did you do de tree say right back to you nothing no sir folks down round gainesville didn't pay much mind to signs and conjo and all that stuff my mammy wouldn't let us tote an axe on our shoulder through the house and she wouldn't low umbrella to be opened in the house say it bring bad luck she never failed to have cornfield peas and hog jaw for dinner on new year's day she say hit a sign you have plenty to eat balance o d a she put a ball of asafetida on a string and make all us chillin wear it round our neck to keep away sickness if i'll begin to hoot over in tom Beaky bottom too close to de house she put de shovel in de fire to make him stop well sir i came to bummingham most forty years ago when mars josiah morris finished de morris hotel i first run de elevators a while then they walked me in de saloon what used to be just back of de office i been here ever since i speak bout de last thing that'll happen to dis old nigger will be to haul him away from de morris hotel in a black box but lordy cap'n got to get up to judge's abs court listen cap'n if and i gets dat no count nephew out of jail i should wad like to get him a job you don't know anybody what don't want to hire nobody to do nothing does you End of section 44section 45 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by rebecca eden walker slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various georgia interview with georgia goethe Couric. they planted the silver in the field no honey i never seed my mammy she died when i was born and my mistress mary mitchell raised me in the big house i was named after her sister miss georgia i slept in her room and i was a house nigger all my days i never went to a nigger church till i was grown and married didn't associate with niggers cause i was a nursemaid i raised miss molly her last baby i was born at elmerland massa americus mitchell's place more than ninety years ago and after freedom i stayed there till old massa died and my mistress moved to eufala to live with her son mas mary about all i know of the war is when they said the yankees is coming the yankees is coming i sure was scared 
and there'd be some fast doings bout the place. All the cattle and hogs and hosses we drive to the swamp on the North Creek, and the feather beds down there too, and hid em in the brush and leaves. My mistress tied her trinkets in sacks and put em in outlandish places like the hen house and the hayloft and the silver they planted in the field. End of section 45. Section 46 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various Fanny Gibson Interview with Fanny Gibson J. R. Jones, Columbus, Georgia Fanny Gibson was born the slave property of Mr. Benninger Goff, a planter near Roanoke, Alabama. She says that during her girlhood she piddled in the fields and helped in the kitchen of the big house. She has very pleasant memories of slave days and wishes to God that she was as comfortably comfortably fixed now as she was then. Her antebellum owner she pictures as a very humane, Christian gentleman, a man that took great interest in the material and spiritual welfare of his slaves. Two hymns sung by Aunt Fanny for her interviewer are appended. Going home to live with the Lord. Going home soon in the morning, going home soon in the morning, I's going home to live with the Lord. In the morning so soon, in the morning so soon, I was going home to live with the Lord. I was going home to live with the Lord. I was going home to live with the Lord. I was going home soon in the morning. Oh, the Lord is a-waiting for me. Oh, the Lord is a-waiting for me. I was going home soon in the morning. Where were you when you found the Lord? My brother, where were you? My brother, where were you? My brother, where were you when you found the Lord? I was low down in the valley. I was low down in the valley. I was low down in the valley when I first found the Lord. My sister, where were you? My sister, where were you? My sister, where were you when you found the Lord? I was low down in the valley. I was low down in the valley. I was low down in the valley when I first found the Lord. This song can be extended indefinitely by addressing the question to various members of one's family and to friends. End of section 46. Section 47 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Frank Gill Personal Interview with Frank Gill, 708 South Hamilton Street, Mobile, Alabama Isla B. Prine, Mobile, Alabama A slave boy escapes whipping by pulling tail of frock coat. A low, stout, sleek-headed negro man sat in an old rocking chair in an end room of a long row of rooms of a tenement house at 708 South Hamilton Street, Mobile, Alabama. This old darky said, when asked by the writer if he lived during slavery times, I not only lived during slavery times, but I was here before a gun was fired, and before Lincoln was elected. I tells you, miss, the first time I remembers anything, a tale of any kind, I was living in Vicksburg, Lee County, Mississippi, and my ma and pa's name 
was Amelia Williams and Hiram Gill. I couldn't tell you where they were from, though, but I do knows that Mr. Arthur and George Foster owned us up till I were a big boy. The way it was, their mother, old Missy, was a widow, and her had these two boys, and she had money. I tells you she had barrels of money. So when the two boys got old enough, she divided the slaves and property between them. Me and my ma fell to Arthur Foster, and some of our kindred fell to George Foster. Mr. George was a captain in the army and was killed near Vicksburg. Though Missy's place sure was big, I couldn't say how many acres there was, but it run four or five miles, and she owned hundreds of slaves. She had lots of log cabin quarters, what had the cracks daubed with mud, and then sealed with boards. I was telling you they was twice as warm as the houses we live in now. They had chimbleys built of mud and sticks, and had big wide fireplaces that we cooked on, and the beds was homemade, but Lord, they was heaps stronger than they is now in these times. Them beds was mortis together. As I said, before I was a boy between fourteen or fifteen years old, before the slaves was divided, and when I was on the old Missy's place, I stayed around the house and wait on them and tend the horses. Another thing I had to do, they would send me for the mail. I had to go twelve miles out of it, and I couldn't read or write, but I could bring everybody's mail to them just right. I knowed I had better get it right. You see, I could kind of figure, so I could make out by the numbers. Oh, Missy and Mr. Arthur both was good to me and all the slaves. They allowed the slaves to make their own patch of cotton and raise chickens, and he would sell it for them. Cotton was the main crop in them days. It would sell as high as 25 cents a pound. Of course, they raised corn, pears, and other things on the plantation, too, but they made the cotton. Master Jesus, they sometimes made from 50 to 150 bales. I remembers how all the women had looms, both black and white, weaving clothes for the cloths, and then they raised sheep to get to wool to make them gray uniforms. Lord, at sheep shearing time, it was big times, let me tell you. Miss them uniforms was made out of all wool, too, but can't remember what they used to dye them gray. But I remembers they dyed with red oak bark, walnut bark, and also a brush what growed down on the branch. Also, they used the laurel leaves to dye yellow, as well as clay. They soaked the dye with salt, and it really stayed in. Let me tell you, they really fed us slaves good. Up till such a link of time, after the war broke out, them food began to get scarce. You see, the government taxed them, and they had to give so much to feed the soldiers. Even then, us had a good time. I remember how the little children played ball and marble, especially marbles. It was our big game. Even at a night, they had a big light out in the backyard, and us would play. Sometimes us would hunt at night. And, well, I remember one Saturday night, I went hunting with my uncle, and didn't get in till daylight next morning. And I was sleepy and didn't get the shoes all clean before church time. So old Massa called me and took me to the carriage house to give me a whipping. Old Massa's boy was about the same age as me, and he begged his pa not to whip me, and I was begging too. But he carried me on, and when we got into the carriage house, old Massa had to climb up on the sidewall to get the whip. And he had on one of them long tail coats, and it left them tails hanging down, so I just grabbed hold of him and made him fall. And then I run to old Missy's room, because I know when I get in there that old Massa would never hit me. The old Missy got up out of the bed, wouldn't let old Massa whip me, and she got so mad that she told him that she weren't going to church with him that morning. And that liked to kill the old Massa, because he sure loved and was proud of old Missy. She was a beautiful woman. That ended the whipping, and that's the only time I remember him trying to whip me. Old Missy didn't allow them to whip the women either, and they wouldn't allow the women to roll logs either. But they did work them in the fields. Of course, they kept the young women with the babies around the house, and they eat the same grub as the white folks eat. Talking about log rolling, them was great times, because if some of the neighboring plantations wanted to get up a house, they would invite all the slaves, men and women, to come with their masters. The women would help with the cooking, and you may be sure they had something to cook. 
They would kill a cow or three or four hogs and then have peas, cabbage, and everything that grows on the farm. And if there was any meat or food left, they would give that to the slaves to take home. And just before dark, the overseer or old master would give the slaves all the whiskey they wanted to drink. Sometimes out of their day's work, they would have a frolic, such as dancing and old-time games. They would have these same kind of gatherings at corn chucking time and cotton picking time, but there weren't so much foolishness at cotton picking time, because they didn't call on one another then, except when the cotton got so far ahead of them and was about to set in for a wet spell or rainy season. You asked me about the paddy rollers. You see the city policeman walking his beat? Well, that's the way the paddy rolling was. Only each county had their paddy rollers, and they had to serve three months at a time. Then they was turned loose. And if they caught you out without a pass, they would give you 39 lashes, because that was the law. The paddy rollers know nearly all the slaves, and it weren't very often they ever beat them. You know, folks was just the same then as they is now, both black and white. Some folks you could neighbor with then, just like you can now, and there was good folks then, just the same as they is now. Christmas time was the best of all, cause us allus had a big dinner, and the old master give the women calico dresses and shoes, and the men shoes and hats, and would give us flour and sugar, molasses, and would buy beer, whiskey, and wine. The old master took good care of us too. When any of us got sick, he sent for the doctor. Then when they ordered the medicine to be given at night, he see that us got it. But nowadays, if you get sick, you have to get the doctor and then pay him yourself. Then the old master had to find clothes and shoes for us. But now, us has to scovel and get them the best way us can. You know, miss, I's been here a long time. I even remembers Jefferson Davis. I seen him many a time. He had a home between here, Mobile, and New Orleans. And you knows he first took his seat in Montgomery and then moved to Richmond, Virginia. I remembers, too, how I used to think that the Baptist was the only religion. You see, John the Baptist come here baptizing, and everybody had to offer up sacrifices, a goat or a sheep or something, just like the man who was going to offer up his son for a sacrifice. But you knows, Jesus come and chained all that, the folks in them times didn't have nobody to worship, and then one came, who said, Father, hand me a body, and I'll die for them. That's Christ, and he was baptized, and God gave Jesus this whole world. So I believe that was the only religion. I remember how us would have big baptizings and shout. Us all us went to church in the white folks' church. They had church in the mornings. Us had ours in the afternoons. Us would have to have a pass, though because the church was eight miles away from the plantation. There was plenty of old songs us used to sing, but I can't remember them. There is this one that goes, Wonderful Peter, wonderful Paul, wonderful Silas, who for to make a my heart rejoice. On good shepherds, feed on my sheep. Don't you hear the young lambs a-bleatin'? Don't you hear the young lambs a-bleatin'? Don't you hear the young lambs a-bleatin'? Oh, good shepherds, feed on my sheep. End of section 47. Read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, December 30th, 2022. Section 48 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States. From Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives. By Barius. Jim Gillard. Interview with Jim Gillard, Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama. Sold at three months for $350. Jim Gillard was 11 years old when the war between the states began. Thus, the memories of the conflict are fresh, with the retreat from Rome, Georgia, to Salem, Alabama, as a refugee 
transcending the others. Jim was born on a plantation at Pendleton, South Carolina, and was sold for $350 when he was only three months old. He was one of eight children belonging to James and Hannah Gillard. Atter being sold, I uh, first lived about three miles from Rome, Georgia, Jim recalled. Then, when the Yankees come into Georgie, us refuged fused to Atlanta, then to Columbus, and later to Salem. Us was at Salem when the war ended. Jim remembers catching partridges as a boy, taking them to the train, and selling them to Charlie Crowder for ten cents each. Game was plentiful in them days, he said, and I never had any trouble catching them birds. No, our houses wasn't nothing to brag about. They was built of hewn logs and had slab floors, having two rooms and a shed cook room. Us beds was lack tables with four legs nailed on to the sides and then corded over the top with ropes that was tightened with a big key. Us had shuck mattresses to sleep on. Us cooked on a great big fireplace. I remembers that there was plenty of meat in the winter. Case old Marster used to kill as many as thirty hogs at a time. I said meat and bread and homemade light bread and de white folks was mighty kind. I remember as us was carried to Sunday school every Sunday at three o'clock in the evening. Oh, Miss Dust teached us de lesson. De white chillins had their Sunday school at nine o'clock in the morning. I always went to Sunday school but on the weekdays us little niggers would slip off and go a-hunting when we could. Jim recalls that the little niggers ate from tin plates on the plantation, but declared he didn't mind that because the food was always good. Yes, um, us had pretty good clothes. They was dyed brown with walnut leaves and hazelnut bush, and on Sunday us had striped gingham pants and shoes. My father was the shoemaker, and had a government tan yard where he would make old hard brogans for eight dollars a pair my master and mistress was stephen and lisbeth wilson they first lived in a big log house but then moved into a planked house they had nine chillin anne stephen william liza Humi, eddie laura mary and lizzie i remember lots about mistress lizabeth cause she used to read their bible to us niggers she would talk to us about the good book and have a prayer meeting with us. My dad used to look at her to feel hands. No, he weren't no overseer, but old Marster always had confidence in him. I remembers that when there would be a funeral, us sing, marching before the body, for us get to the grave and singing, hark come to tune a doleful sound, my ears a tender cry, a living man come view the ground where you both shortly lie. Us frolics on Saturday night was fine, and us to dance twelve months day. Marster's brother would fiddle for us, and at Christmas time us would have six days to frolic. Us also had a big time at the corn shuckings, and us to whoop and holler and sing most all night. The big niggers had plenty of liquor the boss give em. High tables was filled up with corn, and the niggers would shuck twelve it was all done. My aunt married up at the big house, and they gave her a big dance. They had the fiddle, and a great big time. They just jumped over the broom to marry. So out of slavery, they had to get married again. I acted as houseboy in slavery times, and all the little niggers did have lots of fun. When the slaves got ailing, I remembers that Marster had Dr. Word and Dr. Dunwoody to come see us. I remembers, too, how the Yankees come to Spring Valley about eight miles from Opelika, and said to some men's, Halt! The men's wouldn't stop, so the Yankees throwed their guns on them. Two white ladies threw a white flag, and they wouldn't shoot, but they carried Mr. John Edwards to Spring Villa and made a cross on his wrist, then turned him loose, in case his wife was real sick. When the Yankees come, us niggers buried a cigar box with the jewelry in it under a certain pine tree, till they went on. Added the big war, I married Jane Davis first time, then Carrie Cooper. I had two children and one grandchild, Emmanuel Trotter, ten year old. Yes, Mr. Abraham Lincoln died a warrior for this country. 
I belong to the church, because if a man dies out of the ark, he's not saved, and I wants to be saved. End of section 48「Section 49 of Slave Narratives – A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves – Volume 1 – Alabama Narratives – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker March 16, 2023, Westford, Massachusetts. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Mary Ella Grandberry. Interview with Mary Ella Grandberry. Levi D. Shelby, Jr., Tuscumbia, Alabama. Today's folks don't know nothing. Life as a child is not clear in the 90-year-old memory of Mary Ella Grandberry, who lives in Sheffield, but she remembers that she did not have time to play as do the children of today. I don't know just how old I is, Mary Ella said, but I knows that I'm summers near nigh 90 years old. I was born in Barton, Alabama, my father and mother come from Richmond, Virginia. My mammy was named Margaret Keller, and my pappy was Adam Keller. My five sisters was Martha, Sari, Harriet, Emma, and Rosanna, and my three brothers was Peter, Adam Jr., and William. Us all lived in a little two-room cabin just off the big house. Life weren't very much for us cause we had to work and slave all de time. Massa Jim's house was a little old frame building lack of ordinary houses now. He was a single man and didn't have so terrible much, it seemed. He had a whole lot too, but just to look at him you'd think he was a poor white man. There was a lot of cabins for de slaves but they wasn't fitting for nobody to live in. We just had to put up with them. I don't remember much about when I was a child. I disremembers ever playing like children's do today. Ever since I can remember, I had a water bucket on my arm, toting water to the hands. If and I didn't do that, I was chopping cotton. Chillin's nowadays sees good time to what we did then. Every morning, just about hip of day, the overseer was round to see that we was ready to get to the fields. Plenty times us had to go without in breakfast, cause we didn't get up in time to get it for the man done come to get us on the way to the field. Us worked twelve dinner time just the same before we got anything to eat. The food we et was fixed just like it is now. My mammy fixed our grub at home. The only difference between then and now was us didn't get nothing but common things then. Us didn't know what it was to get biscuits for breakfast every morning. It was cornbread twelve on Sundays. Then us get four biscuits apiece. Us got fat back most every morning. Sometimes us might get a chicken for dinner on Sunday or some day like Christmas. It was mighty seldom us gets anything like that though. We lacked possums and rabbits, but they didn't come twelve winter time when some of the men folks run crossed one in the field. They never had no chance to get out and hunt none. There was no such thing as having different clothes for winter and summer. Us wore the same thing in summertime as in the winter time. The same was true about shoes. Us wore brogans from one year to the other. 
My old master was a pretty good man, but nothing extra. One thing about him, he wouldn't loan none of the overseers to whoop none of us, lessen he was dared to see hit done. Good thing he was like that too, cause he saved the blacks a many a lick what they'd got if in he hadn't been dar. Massa Jim was a bachelor, and he ain't never had much truck with the women folks. If in he had any chillins, I never know nothing about them. The overseers was terrible hard on us. They'd ride up and down the field and haste you so twell you near bout fell out. Sometimes and most engineerly every time you hin the crowd you got a good lickin with the bull whip that the driver had in the saddle with him. I heard Mammy say that one day they whooped poor Leah twell she fall out like she was dead. Then they rub salt and pepper on the blisters to make em burn real good. She was so twelve, she couldn't lay on her back nights, and she just couldn't stand for no clothes to take back whatsoever. Massa Jim had bought one of the biggest plantations in that section. I guess he had nigh under hundred blacks on the place. I never knowed exactly how many there was or how big the place was. The folks nowadays is always complaining about how they's having such hard times, but they just don't know nothing. They should have come up when I did, and they'd see now they is living just like kings and queens. They don't have to get up for day when it's so dark you can just see your hands for your eyes. They don't know what it's like to have to keep up with the leader. You know they was always somebody who could work faster than the rest of the folks. And this fellow was always the leader. And everybody else was supposed to keep up with him or whatsoever it was. If in you didn't keep up with the leader, you got a good thrashing when you gets home at night. It was always good dark when the hands got in from the field. Cause if in dar was a lady, what had a baby at home, she could just leave a little for the sunset. Youngins nowadays don't know what it is to be punished. They think F and they gets a little whooping from they mammy now that they is punished terrible. They should have had to follow the leader for one day and see how they'd be punished if and they gets too far behind. The biggest thing that us was punished for was not keeping up. They'd whoop us if in we was caught talking about the free states too. If in you want whooped, you was put in the nigger box and fed cornbread what was made without and salt and with plain water. The box was just big enough for you to stand up in, but it had air holes in it to keep you from suffocating. There was plenty of turning round room in it, too low to change p- your position ever, once it in a while. If in you had done a bigger knot thing, you was kept in the nigger box for months at the time, and when you got out you was nothing but skin and bones and scarcely able to walk. Half the time a slave didn't know that he was sold twill the master call him to the big house and tell him he had a new massa from then on. Every time that one was sold, the rest of them say, I hope next time it'll be me. They thought you could get a chance to run away to the free states. I heard my mammy say that when she come from Virginia, that she come on a boat built out in logs. She say she never was so sick in all her life. 
I see the whole wagon load of slaves come through our farm one day, what was on their way to Arkansas. They was most I ever see travel at the same time. The white folks didn't allow us even look at a book. They would scold and sometimes whoop us if in they caught us with our heads in a book. That is one thing I surely did want to do, and that was to learn to read and write. Master Jim promised to teach us to read and write, but he never had the time. There weren't but one church on the place what I lived on, and the colored and the white both went to hit. You know, we was never allowed to go to church without some of the white folks with us. We weren't even allowed to talk with nobody from another farm. If in you did, you got one of the worst whippings of your life. After Freedom Massa Jim told us that they was afraid we'd get together and try to run away to the north. And that was way they didn't want us getting together talking. A few years for the war, my pappy learnt to read the Bible. Mary Ella apparently forgot her previous comment on penalties for learning to read. Whenever we go to church, he would read to us and we'd sing. About the most two popular songs they sung was Steal Away and I Wonder Where Good Old Daniel Was. Steal Away is such a popular song what everybody knows it. The other one is Mott Nigh Played Out so I'll sing it for you. It goes like this. I wonder where was good old Daniel. I wonder where was good old Daniel. I wonder where was thinking, Peter. I wonder where was thinking, Peter. Of course. I'm going away, going away. I'm going away, going away. I wonder where was weeping, Mary. I wonder where was weeping, Mary. I'm going away, I'm going away. I'm going away to live forever. I'll never turn back no more. The slaves would get tired of the way they was treated and try to run away to the north. I had cousin to run away one time. Him and another fellow had got way up in Virginia for Massa Jim found out where they was. Soon as Massa Jim found the wire box of George, he went after him. When Massa Jim gets to George and um. George pretended like he didn't know Master Jim. Master Jim asked him, George, don't you know me? George, he say, I never see you for in my life. Then they asked George at M, where did they come from? George and this other fellow look up in the sky and say, I come from above where all is love. If in they had owned, they knowed Massa Jim, he could have brung them back home. Ma Pappy tried to get away the same time as George and them did, but he couldn't see how taking all us chillin' with him, so he had to stay with us. The blacks and the whites would have the terrible battles sometimes. That would be when the blacks would slip off to the north and was caught and brung back. The patrollers catch the colored folks and lock them up until the owner came at them. If in a slave was caught out after nine o'clock, he was whipped. They didn't allow nobody out at her. It was dark, lesson he had a pass from Damascus. One night for George and this fellow, I disremembers his name, but I thinks it was Ezra, runned away. George tried to get over to the bunk where he lived, and one of the overseers seen him, and they put him in the nigger box for three weeks. Just as soon as he got out again, George and this Ezra slipped off. 
they had a sign that they would give each other every evening night at her sundown. George would hang the lantern in the window, and then he would take it out in the window and hang it right back in there again. I couldn't never make no sense out in it. I asked him one day what he was doing that for. He said that for long I'd know exactly what it's all about. This was the sign of how long they have to wait for they try to get away. After the day's work was over, the slaves didn't have nothing to do but go to bed. In fact, they didn't feel like doing nothing else. On Saturday, they sought up and washed so they could have some clean clothes to wear the coming week. We walked all day, every day, except in some Saturdays. We had a half day off then. Us didn't get many and only when us asked for them. On Sundays, us just laid round most all day. Us didn't get no pleasure out going to church, cause we weren't allowed to say nothing. Sometimes even on Christmas, us didn't get no rest. I members on one Christmas, us had to build a lime kiln. When us get a holiday, us rested. If in there was a wedding or a funeral on our plantation, us went. Other ways, we don't go nowhere. The war come when I was a big gal. I remember that my uncle and cousin jeaned in with the Yankees to hope fight for the freedom. The Yankees come to our place and runned Master Jim away and tuck the house for a hospital. They took all of Master Jim's clothes and give them some of their friends. They burned up all the cotton, hay, peas, and everything that was in the barns. They made the white folks cook for the colored and then serve them while they ate. The Yankees made them do for us like we done for them. They showed the white folks what it was to work for somebody else. They stayed on our place for the longest when they did leave, there weren't a mouthful to eat in the house. When the war was over, Massa Jim told us that we had to find summers else to live, cause some of my folks had already gone when he come home. Us left Massa Jim's and moved to another farm. We got pay for the work what we did on this other place. Rat adder de war, de ku clucks got adder de color folks. They would come to our houses and scare us most to death. They would take some of the niggers out and whoop em and those that they didn't whoop they tied by their fingers and toes. These ku clucks would come to our windows at night and say, Your time ain't long a comin'. The Ku Klux got so bad that they would even get us in the daytime. They took some of the niggers and throwed them in the river to drown. They kept this up till some folks from the north come down and put a stop to it. I married Nelson Granberry. The wedding was private. I don't have no chillins, but my husband got four. I haven't heard from any of them in a long time now. I guess they all dayed. Abe Lincoln was the best president that this country ever had. If it hadn't been for him, we'd still be slaves right now. I don't think so much of Jeff Davis, cause he tried to keep us slaves. Booker T. Washington was one of the greatest niggers that ever lived. He always tried to raise the standard of the race. I joined the church because the Bible says that all people should join the church and be Christians. 
Jesus Christ set up the church and said that everybody would wanted to be saved to come unto him. Sin is the cause of the world being in the fix that it's in today. The only way to fight sin is to get together. If and we can do away with sin right now, the world would be paradise. In the church, we learn the will of God and what he would have us do. There was no poor white trash in our immunity. They was kept back in the mountains. End of section 49. Section 50 of Slave Narratives A Folk History of Slavery in the United States From Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1, Alabama Narratives This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Narrator O.C. Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States From Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various Esther Green Esther Green Us chillin' wore shoes like grown-ups Aunt Esther Green of 554 Texas Street, Mobile, Alabama was all too ready to talk about her slavery days in spite of her assertion that she didn't remember much about the war. I was just a child, she says. You could figure for yourself. Somebody told me I was born in 1855, so I couldn't have been very old. I was born in State Line, Mississippi, and was owned by Edward Davis. He owned my mother, Rachel Davis, and her mother, Melinda Davis. I never did know who my pappy was, because I never did see him. To the best of my recollections, my white folks was all us good to us niggers. He never allowed no overseers, and he never whipped none of them, excepting maybe a switching once in a while for us little ones when we didn't behave. I never saw a grown-up nigger whipped in all my life. Old Massa just didn't believe in that. Massa was surely a good man. Lots of times, he would get us little niggas on the porch at the big house and have us dance for him. We sure used to have a big time out on them big white porches. I never had no work to do myself, because I always stayed in the big house with the Miss Mary Davis, old Massa's wife. I was in the house one day, and the old Massa asked me if I wanted to eat at the table with them. So I pulled up a chair, in spite of the fact there was all kinds of good stuff to eat in front of me. I called for lie harmony. I sure did love that stuff better than anything else I ever ate. Old Mazza and the rest of them just laughed fit to kill. I reckon they thought I was crazy, sure enough, but I ate harmony just the same. As to the number of slaves old master had, I never knew. Us had log cabins to stay in. The cracks was chinked up with yellow mud to keep the cold out, and the chimney was made of straw and the same kind of mud. But them cabins was warmer than the house is nowadays. We didn't have no furniture, except in a homemade bed which was nailed to the wall on one side and two legs out in the middle of the floor. The mattresses was made of straw and hay, and all the cooking was done on the big open fireplaces where had big pot racks to hang the pots on. Mazza rationed out the food every week, and we usually got a peck of meal. We had plenty of taters and peas and other vegetables that we had grown on the place. At Christmas time, we was give meat and molasses to make cakes. Us always had plenty of plain food. And two, the men would go hunting at night and come back with lots of big fat possums and rabbits by the dozen. And most of the time, 
they would even catch a coon. And old Ben, a nigger who had turkey traps, was always bringing in lots of them big fat birds. The men and women worked in the field all day, but I never picked a bit of cotton all my life. At night, the women would spin and weave cloth, but I never did learn to do that. Then they would dye the cloth different colors, mostly red and blue though, and make them into clothes. Us chillins had a one-piece dresser slip. Our shoes was all homemade, too. Mazza had one man who tamed the leather. He would take it and put it into a long trough for a long time. And then whatever was done that was supposed to be done, he would take it out and cut it and make shoes. Us chillins had shoes same as the grown folks. On Sundays, we would got to the white folks' church. There was a shed built onto the church, and we would sit on benches out under the shed and listen to the preacher. The white folks would have lots of big baptizings, but I never did see no niggers baptized then. Old Mazza had a big family, three boys and six girls. My own ma had eight chillings. Us was always healthy and never had to have much medicine. About the only thing I remember's ever taken was tea made from the root of a china berry tree. It made good tea for worms, but was to be used only at certain times of the moon. My man also used Jerusalem oak seed for worms. I never fools with trying to doctor nobody's chillings nowadays. Things is all so different. My grandma, Melinda, an old Ben and his wife was three old people Mazza freed long time before the war. When all the niggas was freed, Mazza called them up to the house and told them that they was loose to go wherever suited them. But most of them stayed on the place for two or three weeks. And then one morning, I woke up and all of them had left during the night. I was the only nigga left on the place and I just cried and cried, mostly because I was just lonesome for some of my own kind to laugh and talk with. I don't remember exactly what I did after the surrender, but it was about four years afterwards that I come to Mobile, and I've been here ever since. I was a member of the Mobile, Delaware Baptist Church, but I can't attend very regular count of being all crippled up with the rheumatisms. I reckon that ailing is natural, though, because I've been here a long time and I've got 40 grandchildrens and more than that, many great grandchildrens. End of section 50. Read by Narrator O.C. Atlanta, January 1st, 2023. Section 51 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various Jake Green Interview with Jake Green Ruby Pick and Start, Livingston, Alabama I conjure what didn't work. Yes'm, the niggas sure was scared when old Buck showed up in the field. Jake Green, former slave, laughed with a vigor that denied his 85 years as he described a conjure what didn't work. Jake has a vivid memory of those days, before the Civil War, though he was only a small boy when it started. Me and my mother and father belonged to old man, Lamb Whitehead, just a few miles from Coatopa, about ten miles east of Livingston, Alabama, he began. My mother was Molly Whitehead, my father was Dan Whitehead. I don't know nothing about my grandmammy and grandpappy, but I had a heap of unkies. Mr. Whitehead owned Dirt and Ferry down to Belmont, 
and they had a darky there named Dick, were claim sick all the time. So the master man said, Dick, damn it, go to the house. I can't get no work out in you. So Dick went on. He was a fiddler, so they just took his vittles to him for seven years. Then one day, old master said to the overseer man, Let's zip up there and see what Dick doing. So they did, and there saw Dick, fat as he could be, a playin', the fiddle and a singin', fool my massa seven years, gonna fool him seven more. Hey diddle, de diddle, de diddle, de do. About that time, old massa poked his head in the door, said, "Damn if and you will." Come out of there, you black rascal, and go to work. And I ain't never heard of Dick complaining no more. But they won't so me. Sometimes us got whipped, but Massa had four men he didn't allow nobody to hit, white or black. They was Uncle Arch, he was the main carriage driver, my father, he was the house servant, Uncle Julius, the foreman of the plow hands, and Uncle Edwards, the foreman of the hoe hands. Whenever anybody wanted to hire anybody to work for him, the master sent them for out and hire him by the day to chop cotton or pick. And them four niggers could chop much cotton in a day as the mule could plow. Whenever they'd stop the plow at twelve o'clock, them niggers was right there to lay the hoe handles on the plow, and that's chopping. All four could pick a bale of cotton a day. Whenever anybody say, Mr. Whitehead, I want a bale of cotton picked today. He'd send them four men, and they could pick five hundred pounds apiece and leave the sun still running. They was pickers in them days. Course they had to begin, and all us got up for day. Twain't nothing strange to be standing in the field by your plow, waiting for the sun to come up. Everybody was early risers in them days. They was pretty good to us, but old Mr. Buck Bracefield, what had a plantation gin in us and was so mean to his and that twa'n't nothing for him to run away. One nigger, Rich Parker, runned off one time, and whilst he gone, he seed a hoodoo man. So when he got back, Mr. Bracefield took sick and stayed sick two or three weeks. Some of the darkies told him, Rich been to the hoodoo doctor. So Mr. Bracefield got up out of that bed and come a-yelling in the field. You thought you had old Buck, but by God he rose again. Them niggers was so scared, they squatted in the field just like partridges, and some of em whispered, I wish to God he had a die. Twain't long out of that comes Srenda. But that nigger done left there, and didn't nobody know where Parker was at. Some of the niggers done bought and paid for their mule, and me and Pappy was settin' and workin' on sneers. When here come Parker, just hired about Srenda. He say, why didn't somebody come tell me twas Srenda? Then he started singing. Slavey chain, slavey chain, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. But that won't none of old Mazza's niggers. He had one, they call him John, and it come a traveler and stayed all night. Old Mazza pointed out John and said, he ain't never told me a lie in his life. The traveler bet Mazza a hundred dollars against four beds he'd catch John in a lie before he left. Next morning, at the table, the mice was pretty bad. So the traveler caught one by the tail and put him inside a kiver lid dish, what was sitting there on the table. And he told old Massa, tell John he could eat something out of every dish out of they got through, but that kiver lid one, and not to take cover off in it. And John said, no sir, I won't. But John just naturally had to see what was in that dish, so he raised the lid and out hopped the mouse. Then here come old Mazza and asked John if and he done what he told him not to do. And John nighed it. Then the traveler looked in the dish and the mouse wasn't there. And he said, See there, John been lying to you all the time. You just ain't noted. And I reckon he right, cause us had to lie. End of section 51 David Only, Portland, Oregon, January 11th, 2023. Section 52 of Slave Narratives. 
a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by florence short slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various charity grigsby interview with charity grigsby r p tart i knows i's eighty five but specs i's more than that charity grigsby lives in a tumble-down shanty about nine miles from livingston on the old epps road she was sewing on a quilt when i arrived humming an old plantation song that ran angels in the water walking by the light poor sinners stand in darkness and cannot see the light a broad smile flowed across her black face as i entered the cabin she placed her needle aside exclaimed lord me honey i's always proud when de white folks drop around and dat's directly so charity i said i want you to tell me about slavery times she lowered her head in thought a moment said honey what would i tell just all you remember charity and this is what she told honey i was born charity grigsby but i married nelson gregory ain't much distinguished into dames but twas a little my pappy was daniel grigsby and my mammy was mary moore see us belong to old mr jim moore right up yonder above sumterville near ramsey station you goes up to gainville and livingston road and turns off at the cross road about nine miles from livingston then you goes due west it ain't far from dere about six miles i reckon twa'n't no big plantation bout a dozen of us dere and marse jem didn't have no overseer like the rest he had dem boys of his'n what seed to us dey was john and william and jim dey was all tolerable good to us but they would whoop us if we wasn't obedient just like a mother raisin a child i can't say how old i is it's done got away from me but i was a stroppin gal during the war i knows i's eighty-five and i specs i'd more than dat i's de mammy of eleven shillings i knows dat but ain't but five of dem a livin as you knows i lives with two of em mattie and evie they treats me good hattie and ellen and my boy lives in bessemer dat is all my individual shillings but i's got a few others i can't recollect much to tell been a good while since de war but when you calls it up to my remembrance i can think it up honey damn nigger dogs they sure did run sometimes they cotched a nigger but they didn't never run me i was in de house weavin and spinnin like mistis showed me and i didn't never get in no trouble with nobody and then again marse jim was purty tolerable good to us but mr irvin lavender was sure mean to his diggers and his plantation warn't far from ourn he had a pack of dogs what run de niggers and dem was skeery times i tell you us didn't learn no schoolin nor go nowhere nor have no corn shuckin nor nothin just quire to stay in de cabins i heard about brer rabbit and hoodoo but i never takes up no time with dat foolishness never seed no sense in it us got all right without dat some of the other niggers sides me was all the time in trouble though mr fulton who lived close to mr lavender had a nigger driver and overseer named sanders and i bet he was de meanest one of dem all you know honey dey planted wheat fields in de fall and dem days and cut it in the spring it would come off in time nuff to make corn dere was a flock of birds that black birds only dey was wheat birds and dey went in droves and fly way up yonder 
us had planks to slap together to keep the birds out of the wheat because they ate it up well em one day mr sanders told one of the women what was one of the sucklers on the place that if she wouldn't do what he axed her to day was a black coffin over her head she fruised him so when he was loading his gun there in the wheat field he was holding the gun barrel propped under his chin just so and the other end sitting on the ground well sir it went off and he killed hisself stead of dat sucklin woman and dat was an awful time cause de niggers got scared and run and dey sought mr lavender's pack of nigger dogs on him the dogs caught some and chewed em nigh about to death it were none of us but it were close us laid low didn't go out nowhere us wasn't loud to couldn't go to prayer meetin or nothin you ax what dat song i singin when you come dat was all of it and dat's nuff for me cause it's true what they gwine to be no more for just angels in the water walkin by the light poor sinners stand in darkness and cannot see the light i don't want no more myself just dat that's all how come you want some more don't dat much satisfy you but honey de sun gettin low and my shillings will soon be comin from de swamps ain't no bread cooked for em i tell you some more when i gets my mind on it cause it's been a good while since de war yes em us had enough to eat but if us could get any more us would like it you know how tis can make out wid mighty little us eats greens lookin forward to roast in years comin in end of section fifty two section fifty three of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Charles Hayes. Interview with Charles Hayes, Mary A. Poole, Mobile. Sure, I believe in spirits, says Charles. Mrs., said Charles Hayes from his porch in Maysville near Mobile, Alabama, I was a little bitty nigger when the war broke out, and I belonged to Massa Ben Duncan, who lived at Day's Landing on the Alabama River. Massa Ben's house was the regulation plantation with slave quarters. Most of the things us used was made right there on the plantation, such as beds, buckets, tools, soap, brogans, breeches, and chairs. Our mattresses was either made out in corn shucks or cotton bowls. Us cooked on an open fireplace, and every Saturday night us would go to the big house for supplies. Mazaben was good to his slaves, and he allowed them to have a little plot of ground next to the cabins where they could raise their own little crop. My mammy was a field hand, and my pappy was a mechanic, and he used to be the handyman around the big house, making everything from churns and buckets to wagon wheels. My pappy also used to play the fiddle for the white folks' dances in the big house, and he played it for the colored frolics, too. He sure could make that thing sing. Us used to have all sorts of cures for the sick people. For instance, us used a Jerusalem weed cooked with molasses into a candy for to give to the children to get rid of worms. Then us had boiled the root and make a kind of tea for the stomach worms. You know, the kinds that little puppies and little children has that eats all the food that goes into the stomach and makes the child or dog eat plenty but don't get no benefits from all they are eating. Whorehound that grow wild in Clark County was used for coals. Mullen tea was used for coals and swollen gents. Then there was the life everlasting tea that was also good for coals and horseman tea that was good for the chills and fevers. Course, mistress, us niggas had a regular family doctor that tended to us when we were showing off downright sick. 
But these remedies I was telling you about, us used when weren't nothing much ailing us. It was always to the owner's interest, mistress, to have the niggers in a good, healthy condition. Does I believe in spirits, she says? Sure I does. When Christ walked on the water, the apostles was scared he was a spirit. But Jesus told him that he weren't no spirit, that he was alive as they was. He told him that spirits couldn't be touched, that they just melted when you tried to. So, mistress, Jesus must have meant that there was such a thing as spirits. Out of the war, my pappy and mammy stayed on the Duncan plantation and worked on share crops. There was a school on the grounds for us slave children, and my grandmammy, Selina Duncan, taught the Bible, because she's from Virginia and had been learned to read and write by her mistress up there. My first wife was named Alice Bush, and us had ten children. My second one was named Caroline Turner, and us didn't have but eight. Both my old womans is dead now, white folks, and I stays here with one of my daughters. You see, my eyesight is almost gone due to one day when I was working in the forge, a hot piece of iron flew up and landed in my eye. Short long before it started to hurt in my other eye, now both is about to give out. End of section 53. Read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, January 4th, 2023. Section 54 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Lizzie Hill. Interview with Lizzie Hill. Gertha Couric. The Story of Aunt Lizzie Hill. Aunt Lizzie Hill, 94 years of age, moved from the Spurlock Plantation, four miles out, to the city of Eufaula about 20 years ago. She was of such vigorous constitution that until recently she carried on her regular occupation of laundress or washwoman as she calls herself. Too feeble to work regularly, she now is cared for by a niece with whom she lives. Sitting before the fire in a rocking chair, smoking a clay pipe, her neat clothing, snow-white hair, and wrinkled, kindly face make a pleasing picture of contentment. Her mind is apparently unimpaired, and she readily responds to her recollections of slavery. Sure, Missy. I remember's about it. I was most grown when freedom come. My master, Richard Dozier, and my mistress was good to all day niggers, and they raised me right. I had two little mistresses about as old as me, and I played with them all the time and slept on a pallet in their room every night. They slept on the big bed. My clothes was just as good as Dan, and I ate what they ate. The little girls, she explained, were about six and eight years old when this association began and it continued until close of the war, when all were nearly grown. After freedom come, continued Aunt Lizzie, Mammy moved to Cuthbert and took me away from old mistress. But I runned away and went back to mistress and walked all the fourteen miles down the big road at night. I runned most of the way. <laughs> Three times I done that, but Mammy came and took me back to work in the field every time. I wanted to stay with old mistress. They called her Miss Everleen, and everybody liked her. Both my little mistresses got married, and then old master and old mistress moved off to Texas, and I ain't ever seen none of them no more. I've had a hard time working in the field since the war. For freedom come, I never worked excepting in the house. I was a house girl and didn't do no field work. End of section 54. Section 55 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States. From Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives by Various. Gabe Hines. Interview with Gabe Hines. Goethe Korik. Gabe was kidnapped by carpetbaggers. Old Gabe had been long in this world, close to one hundred years. He had experienced much, but one incident had outlasted all the others, even the stroke that made him older and more feeble. That experience had caused Gabe and his old woman to stray far from the fold and to walk all the way back to its shelter. That was back in Reconstruction days, when he was not bandy in his knees, and long before Anna left him alone in his cabin with just memories of earlier and happier days. Gabe was birthed in Cassetta, Georgia, the son of two faithful old slaves, Hetty and Gabe Hines, and they all long to Marsa William Ship and Miss May. He told his story thus. In Doran of the war, I was big enough to be water totter on the plantation. No, little missy, I don't exactly know how old I is, exceptin by the squeakin and achin of my bones. I members lots about those days. Them was happy times, little missy. Arter we all was freed, I went to Silver Run to live, and dar a married Anna. She left me nine years ago and that broke the happiness. I miss her everywhere, just keepin' a miss of her, though nine years, yeah, he's gone since they took her from the cabin and left her up there on the hill. There's nights when the misery in these old bones just gets past standin', and on sich nights she come to me and help me with the limit, just as she used to do. But she can't stay long when she come. I was a tell her about Silver Run, Arter we was married and was getting used to being free niggers and happy in our cabin. One night a gentleman from the north was to see us, and he told us if we go with him he'd pay us big wages and gin us a fine house to boot. For two nights we sat there by that chimbley a thinking a sight to do or to don't, and pondering this way and the other way. Then we sighed to go. We left everything there exceptin what we tied up in a bandana handsheaf, and we tied that onto a stick for the gentleman from the north wouldn't let us take no baggage. We was going to Columbus, Georgia, but we didn't know that. Little Missy, when we got thar, while he was a talking us, we found the big wages to be fifty cents a month, and that fine house turned out to be more like a stable, instead of our cabin and garden and chickens in our trees. We had a terrible place, out under the hot sun with water miles away down the hill. And he weren't no gentleman from the north. Missy, I never will be able to tell myself what made us do hit no more than I'll ever be able to tell how I scared I was in one night when the wind howled and the lightning was spraying over the place, and the rain was so terrible hit was a sobbing in the fire. We knowed the devil was ryin' to wind that night. We was a sittin' dar before the fire, me and my old woman. We heard a stompin' like a million horses had stopped outside the door. We tipped to the door and peeked out. And little missy, what we seed was so terrible, eyes just most popped out our head. There was a million horses all kivered in white, with the eyes pokin' out, and a settin' on the horses was men kivered in white too tall as giants, and the eyes was a-pokin' out, too. There was a leader, and he held a burning cross in his hand. When we see that, we fell on our po' knees, scared most to death, and we axed the great master to help two poor old niggers and hop em quick. The first thing we knowed, them Ku Kluxes had the gentleman from the north out of his hiding place, hind our house, and a-settin' on one of them hosses. They never spoke with him. They just took him off somewhere. We never knowed what, but he didn't come back no more. Little Missy, we heard afterwards that this gentleman 
from the north was no quality at all, that he was the worst leader of all the debilement being done, one of them carpet bagging men. Next day, Otter de Ku Kluxes cotched his man. His wife left Columbus in a hurry, saying she couldn't associate with the Columbus ladies, cause they was so poor. They were poor, they is no denying that. We all was poor, cause the Yankees done runt Columbus. But little Missy, there's a big difference in being poor and quality and being just poor white trash. What did I do then? Well, little Missy, we left Columbus order what happened and we walked to Eufaula, where it was safe to be. For forty years I worked for the city, and Anna, she took in washing. During that time we was getting along pretty likely, when one day Gabriel blew his horn for Anna, and Gabe was left alone. My old woman's gone. Little Missy, most everyone I knowed is dead. Dis here cabin and home to me no more. It's lonely everywhere. Maybe I'd oughter be thinking about Canaan, but hits old times crowds this old darky's heart. Little Missy, maybe when I gets to where Anna is, it will be old times all over again. End of section fifty five. Section 56 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Adeline Hodges Personal Interview with Aunt Adeline Hodges, 3 Fry Street, Mobile, Alabama. Isla B. Prine. Hungry for pumpkin pie. Aunt Adeline, a tall, gaunt, bright-skinned Negro woman, lives on Fry Street, Mobile, Alabama. The day I called, she was nodding in a cane-bottom rocking chair on a wide porch that extended across the front of a cottage almost hidden in a grove of giant oaks. She opened her eyes, which were covered by a pair of steel-rimmed glasses with one lens badly cracked. The news that a search was being made for old people who had lived during slavery days acted like an electric shock on the old woman, who immediately sat up straight and said, Lord, yes, am I lived in those days, and I tells you I remembers all about them. Do come in and sit down. The first white people I belonged to was a man named Jones, who was a colonel in the war. But I can't tell you much about them, cause I was just a little gal then. I was just big enough to tote water to the field to the folks working, and to mind the gaps in the fence to keep the cattle out when they was gathering the crops. I don't spec you knows anything about those kind of fences. They was built of rails, and when they was gathering the crops, they just took down one section of the fence so the wagons could get through. After the war broke out, old Mr. Jones went off to it, and I remembers the day he left. He came to the field to tell all the hands goodbye with a big white plume on his hat. That was in Bolivar County, Mississippi. After old Mr. Jones left for the war, then the nigger drivers and overseer began to drive us around like droves of cattle. Every time they would hear the Yankees was coming, they would take us out in the woods and hide us. Finally, they sold us after carrying us away from Bolivar County. Some of us were sold to people in Demopolis, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia, and some to folks in Meridian and Shibuta, Mississippi. I don't any more know where my folks went than you does. I remember before leaving old Mr. Jones' place how they grabbed up all the children that was too little to walk and putting us in wagons. Then their older folks had to walk, and they marched all day long. Then at night, they would strike camp. I seen the young niggas that was liable to run away with their legs chained to a tree or the wagon wheels. They would rake up straw and throw a quilt over it and lie that way all night while us children slept in the wagons. When us come to the big river at Demopolis, Alabama, I remember seeing the big steamboats there, and they said that the soldiers was going away on them. He was in Demopolis, us was sold, and a man named Ned Collins of Shibuta, Mississippi, bought me. 
Aunt Annalide said that the houses the slaves lived in on the Jones plantation were board houses and that Mr. Jones owned a big plantation and lots of slaves. She said that they had homemade beds nailed to the walls with mattresses made out of shucks. After being sold to Mr. Collins of Shibuta, Mississippi, Aunt Adeline said that life was very hard, not so much for herself, but she saw how hard the other slaves worked. She was the house girl and helped clean house, wash dishes, and take care of the children. After finishing that work, she had to spin thread. Each day she would have to spend so many cuts, and if she did not finish the required number, she was punished. She said that her mistress kept the finished work on top of a large wardrobe, and Aunt Annaline said that many times she would steal a cut of thread off that wardrobe to complete the day's task to keep from being punished. As she grew older, she did have to go to the field and pick cotton. Aunt Adeline does not remember it pleasantly. She said, I just hate to have to weigh anything today, because I remember so well that each day that the slaves was given a certain number of pounds of cotton to pick. When weighing up time come and you didn't have the right number of pounds set aside, you may be sure that you was going to be whooped. But it wasn't all bad times, because us did have plenty to eat especially at hog killing time. They would have days of hog killing and the slaves would bake their bread and come with pots, pepper, and salt. After cleaning the hogs, they would give us the livers and lights and us would cook them over a fire out in the open and it sure was good eating. The usual allowance a week of pickled pork was six or seven pounds and if you had a big family of children, they'd give you more. Didn't they give you a peck of meal, sweet taters, sorghum syrup, and plenty of buttermilk. At Christmas time, they give you extra syrup to make cakes with and sweet taters to make your tater pone. And Lord, they would have big cribs of pumpkins. It makes me hungry to think about them good old pumpkin pies. And did they raise chickens? You know it was in Mississippi that minks was bad about killing them. I remember one time the minks got in the chicken house and killed nearly every chicken on the place. Old Mr. Jones had to cook to clean and cook them, and he come out in the field and eat with them to let the slaves know that it was all right. Then us had them good old cushaws at lie harmony too. The clothes was made out of homespun in one piece. I remember I always had mine split up the side so I could get about in a hurry. The women had pantalettes made and tied to their knees to wear in the fields to keep the dew off their legs. The shoes was made of cowhide and was called red russets. The way they got them darker was to take a hog gristle and hang up in the chimbley. When it got full of soot, we rubbed the shoes with that. Then they used the darker shoes for their Sunday best. You asked me about hunting? Lord, yes, they hunted in them times. Up in them swamps in Mississippi there was bears as big as cows and deers are plenty. They both was bad about coming into cornfields and tearing down the corn. You could hear them at night out in the fields. They also caught plenty of possums and coons. Of course us got sick, but they had a doctor. In those days, the doctor would cup you and bleed you. I seen many a person cupped. The doctor had a little square-looking block of wood with tiny little knives attached to it. On top was a trigger like as on a gun, and the doctor would put the block of wood at the nape of their neck and pull that trigger. Then he have a piece of cotton with something on it to stop the blood when he had cupped you long enough. They would always give us calamus, calomel, to clean us out. And then the next morning, they give us a big bowl of gruel made out of meal and milk. Then us be all right. The slaves weren't allowed to go to church, but they would whisper around and all meet in the woods and pray. The only time I remember my pa was one time when I was a little child. He set me on a log by him and prayed, and I know that was where the seeds of religion was planted in my mind. Today I was happy to tell folks about Jesus and thank him for his goodness to me. It won't be long till I meet him face to face and thank him. End of section 56Section 57 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by florence short slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various caroline holland interview with caroline holland mabel farrier caroline holland had many masters yes sir i was a slave spoke aunt carrie from her vine-shaded porch at number three sharp street montgomery alabama i was born in eighteen forty nine on mr will wright's plantation on the mount meggs road massa will had a big slave house and us niggers sure used to have a good time playing round down at the slave quarters we had a row of houses two stories high and day was filled with all sorts of niggers when i was twelve year old i was made nuss for my mistis's little girl and at de fuss i couldn't do nothing but rock de cradle i didn't know how to hold the baby us niggers had guardians dat look after us like they did after de hosses and cows and pigs one night after we had all gone to bed i heerd a noise at de window and when i look up dere was a man a climbin in he was a nigger i could tell even do i could scarce see him i knowed he was a nigger i could hear my mistis a breathin and de baby was sound sleep too i started to yell out but i thought dat de nigger would kill us so i just kept quiet he come in de window and he see us asleep in dere and all of a sudden i knowed who it was jade i whispers what you a doin here he come to my bed and put his rough hand over my mouth listen you black pickaninny you tell him that you saw me here and i'll kill you he say i throwed your hide to de snakes in de swamp now shut up with that he went to de dresser and taken mistis money bag at that he went to de window and climbed down de ladder and i didn't do nothing but shake myself nearly to death from fright de next day de overseer and de body rollers went a searchin through de slave quarters and de found de money bag under jade's cot dey took em and whooped em for near fifteen minutes we could hear him holler way up at dat big house jade he never got over dat whippin he died three days later he was a good nigger pears to me like and de best blacksmith in de whole county i keep a wondering what made him want to steal dat purse then i found out later that he was a going to pay a white man to carry him over de line to de northern states jay just had two big ideas for a nigger i used to see jade a ghost a walkin out in de garden in de moonlight sometime he sit on de fence and look at his old cabin then sometime he stroll off down de cotton field when de lord get through a punishin him for a stealin dat money i guess he won't make us no more visits he just go right on in heaven dat's what ghost is is you know people dat can't quite get in heaven and dey had a stroll round little longer on de outside repentin soon atter dat my guardeen took me to tallassie when de massa died my guardeen was a good man he was always a-making speeches for de slaves to stay under bondage till day was twenty-one one day he was in front of a store talking about de slaves and a man come up to him and said he don't like de way captain clinton talk dat was my guardeen's name captain clinton asked him what he going to do about it and de man took out a pistol and killed de captain right there on de spot then i was sold to another man a mr williamson bout de time de war broke loose and massa williamson took me over to live with some more peoples he said he had more slaves than he could take care of dis was de abernathy plantation 
while the bastard was a standin in the slave quarters a talkin to mr abernathy i noticed the boy with a bad eye i didn't like him at all and i told the master i don't want to stay cause i didn't like the way that boy lum with the bad eye looked at me then mr abernathy brung a boy about seventeen year old a big strong lookin boy named jeff he say jeff look out after carrie here don't let her get into no trouble from dat time on till about five year ago jeff he always look after me cause atter de war i married him now i ain't got nobody but myself End of section 57section 58 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various jane holloway they brung weapons on themselves jane holloway was ill for weeks she had been in bed and the untidy condition of her cabin brought profuse apologies when i entered jane do you remember me i asked i don't know honey i've been sick so long with the flus i can't remember much of anything she answered peering up at me from her pillow suddenly she smiled Shut. Cause I members you, honey. Your daddy show was good to my boys. What worked for him so long? Brace yourself in that chair, and I'll tell you all about myself and slavery times what I can recollect. I's all alone now, said it for my grandson. He ain't but twelve and he cannot much. But I guess I got no rat to complain. I guess I done got me plenty out of life. I was born up in North Alabama. My mammy was Carrie Holloway and my pappy was Trailer Holloway. I had a brother, Marilyn. There never was but the two of us. Us lived in a mud and log house. Just one room, but it sure had a big fireplace. Us had a good old time then. If it us just had known it, Kilas was always fed good. They had long wooden troughs, what they poured our bread and milk in, and us eat it with a wooden spoon. When they yelled, Chillin', chillin', bread you bet we just burnt the wind getting there cause alice was always hungry we had high tester beds in all the houses what was about a mile from the big house it had four rooms and was all planked up mr billy taylor was mighty good to his niggers he didn't have so many slaves he just had a little plantation. Our overseer was good, too. He had to whip some of them sometimes, but they wouldn't work. They brung it all on themselves. When the Yankees come in during the war, the men come a-running and a-screaming that the Yankees coming. And they did come on horseback and took all our provisions what was in the smokehouse. 
they took everything we had in the way of victuals in stock too. I joined the church when I was 10 years old because I was trying to live right and do what the Bible said. The white folks had their services in the morning and in the evening would let us niggers have our. Jane forgot her misery long enough to come out to the porch of her comparatively comfortable cabin, and she was plum proud to have her picture took. End of section 58section 59 of slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Joseph Holmes 1. Personal Interview with Joseph Holmes Grand Avenue, Pritchard, Alabama Isla B. Prine, Mobile, Alabama Day Keep Niggas in Good Condition to Sell Standing in the middle of the road at Pritchard, suburb of Mobile and gesticulating while talking to a small group of interested listeners, an old Negro man ended his talk to the small gathering and punctuated his last sentence with a spat of tobacco. Know him, he continued, after I'd put in my appearance and asked him a question. I doesn't know whether I was a slave, but just the same, I see General Grant's army when it went through Virginia. Just as sure as you stand in there, Lady, I see dem men's all dressed in blue suits, a marching side by side, going down the road past our place. It took him three days to go by our house. And I remembers when dem Yankees came to our old mister's house and take a ladder and climb up to the roof and tear the boards out of the ceiling to get dem big hams and shoulders my white folks done head hid up there. When the Yankees find that stuff, they give it all to the niggers. Then out of the soldiers left, Ole Miss called us to her and told us we was free. But for us to give back some of the meat and things that the Yankees don't give us, cause she didn't have nothing to eat round the place. Course, we was glad to do it, cause Mrs. Shaw was good to us. I remembers every Sunday morning that she'd make the older slaves bring all the little niggers to the big house so she could read the Bible to him, and then she'd give us plenty of them good biscuits and taters that Suzanne cooked for us. She'd say, get round there, Suzanne, and help them little niggas' plates. I really thought Mistress was an angel. Talking about niggas being free, all Miss told us was free, but it was ten or twelve years out of the surrender before I knowed what she meant. I was a big boy going to school before I had an understanding as to what she meant. Ole Miss taught the niggers how to read and write, and some of them got to be too good at it, cause they learned how to write too many passes so's the paddy rollers wouldn't catch them. And on them occasions was the onlyest times that I ever seed one of our niggers punished. Mistress never allowed no mistreatin' of the slaves, cause they was raising slaves for the market and it wouldn't be good business to mistreat them. Lord, miss, my white folks was rich. They had as many as five or six hundred niggers, men, women, and childrens. The plantation was big, but I doesn't remember how many acres it was. But I does remember that the cabins was all built in rows, and there was streets laid out among the cabins. The chimneys was built out of dirt and sticks, and you know, up in Virginia, it got powerful cold. So when they built the cabins, they throwed up dirt under them to keep the wind and snow out. I was born in Henry County, Virginia, near Danville, 
and I's been to Vicksburg and Petersburg many a time with my pappy to the wheat and backer market. Lower honey, Virginia is the best place on earth for good eatin' and good white folks. If anybody tells you that the white folks was mean to their niggers, they never come from Virginia. Cause us was too near the free states, and I done already told you that they raise niggers to sell, and they keep em in good condition. In those days, white folks and black folks was black folks. Just like Booker T. Washington was a river between the niggers of this generation and learning. He had all that was fine and good, and he give the best to his people if and they would take it. That was the way with the white folks did. They didn't do no whooping. I was the onlyest rat left in the pond, and cause I ain't hung in the smokehouse, folks thinks I was not as old as I say I is. But child, I has been here a long time. I remembers how Black Sam used to preach to us, and when I growed up, I used to think weren't nobody Christian, cephin us Baptists. But I know better now, and the longer I lives, the more I realizes that the churches go away cause they leaves off the ordinances of God, although us has a Bible and more Christus reading than ever before. My mammy's name was Eliza Rowlitz, and my pappy was Joseph Holmes. My pappy had the same name as the peoples that owned him, and my grandmammy name was Lucy Holmes. Grandmammy Holmes lived to be over a hundred years old, and she was the first person I ever see dead. In them days, it took three days to bury a person, cause they dug the graves as deep as the corpse was tall. Land sakes a living, us had great times, and I forgot to tell you that us had homemade beds with two sides nailed to the wall, and the mattresses was made out of wheat straw. As for hunting, I done plenty of it, and one thing I got to give forgiveness for was when I left for Jenny, I left about fifty or sixty snares set to catch rabbits and birds. My mammy had eight children, and we was raised in pairs. I had a sister who come along with me, and if and I jumped in the river, she done it too. And if and I go through a buyer patch, here she come along too. About the fruit, it makes my mouth water to think about them cheese apples. That was yellow like gold, and those Abraham apples, and the cherry tree as big as these oaks here. I was eating many a big sugar and sweetheart cherry. But there was another kind called the gorilla that growed as big as the yellow plums down this way. Now let me tell you something about Virginia. They had their laws about drink. They had the best peach and cherry brandy and most any kind you ever heard of. But they didn't allow you to make drink out of anything you could make bread with, such as corn or rye. Us had our brandy same as you would coffee. Cause it was cold and some mornings my pappy would get the brandy out and my mammy would put a little water and sugar with it and give it to us children's. Us never thought nothing about drinking. I kind of believes like that old infidel Ingersoll who said that anything that was a custom was their religion. Now you asked about hog killing time? That was the time of times. For weeks, the men would haul wood and big rocks and pile them together as high as this house. I then have several piles like that round a big hole in the ground, what had been filled with water. Then, just a little after midnight, the boss would blow the old horn and all the men's would get up and get in them pig pens. Then they would sort that pile of wood on fire, and then start knocking them hogs in the head. Us never shot a hog like us does now. Us would use an axe to kill him with. Out of knocking the hog in the head, they would tie a rope around his leg, and out of the water got to the right heat, from those red-hot rocks, the hog would be thrown in and drug around a while, then taken out and cleaned. After he was clean, he was cut up into sections and hung up in a smokehouse. Lousy lady, they don't cure meat these days. They just use some kind of liquid to brush over it. We used to have show sure enough meat. Then come corn chucking time. My goodness, I would just love to be there now. The corn would be piled up high, and one man would get on that pile. 
It was usually a kind of nigger foreman who could sing and get the work out of the niggers. This foreman would sing a verse, something like this. Poke and Clay went to war. Poke come back with a broken jaw. Then all the niggers would sing back at him with a kind of shouting sound. Near about all the times the foreman made up his own songs by picking them out of that shucking. It wore the jug that they brung around every hour. That's the onlyest time the slaves really got drunk. In them old days, I went to plenty of dances and candy pullings during the Yule season. But I doesn't do that no more. I's a preacher, and when I first left Virginia, I come to Georgie and stayed there twenty years, where I kicked up plenty of dust. I even taught school there. Then I come to Alabama and lived in Evergreen for about twenty more years. Since I've been in Mobile, I's worked for such men as Old Simon, Damrich, and Van Ernterp, and all their children's has been in these here arms of mine. I's been a square citizen, and there hasn't been a time that I has had to call on nobody but Uncle Sam when old man Prussian cost me. But thank the Lord I is still able to get about and have all my senses set my eyesight, and it's just a little poly. I has got all my teeth set one, and my mammy was always proud of my hair. See how silky and fine it is? Not quite white, though. I hope I lives long enough for it to turn white as snow. I think St. Peter will like it better that way. 2. Personal Interview with Joseph Holmes, Grand Avenue, Pritchard, Alabama. Isla B. Prine, Mobile, Alabama. Twelve years till I understood surrender. In the middle of the road, near Pritchard, an incorporated suburb of Mobile, stood an aged Negro man, gesticulating as he told a tale of other days to a small audience. Tall, straight, with gray hair and mustache, he was a picturesque figure. He does not know whether he was born in slavery, he said, but he knows his age to be about 81. I doesn't know whether I was a slave, but just the same, I see General Grant's army when it went through Virginia, he said. Just as sure as you always standing there, lady, I seed him, and I seed them men all dressed in them blue suits, a marching side by side, going down the road past our place. It took them three days to get past our house. And as I remember when them Yankees come to old Mrs. house, and took a ladder, and climb up to the roof, and tear the boys out of the ceiling, to get them big ham and shoulders, they hid up there? I sure does. The women folk makes the slaves hide with the meat. And when them Yankees find that stuff, they just give it to all the niggers. And I remembers too, how old miss calls us all to her out of they left, and told us that us was free. But she told us that us have to give back of the meat, and says cause she didn't have a bit to eat. Course we was glad to do it, "'cause Ole Miss sure was good to her slaves. "'I remembers, every Sunday morning, "'that she made the oldest slaves "'bring all the little niggers up to her big white two-story house, "'so she could read the Bible to us, "'and then she'd give us plenty of them good biscuits and taters "'that she had to cook, Suzanne, cook for us. "'She'd say, get round there, Suzanne, "'and help them little niggers' plates. "'I really thought Ole Miss was an angel.' Talking about niggers being free, Ole Miss told us us was free, but it was ten or twelve years out of the surrender before I knowed what she was talking about. I was a big boy going to school before I had any understanding as to what she meant. Ole Miss taught the niggers how to read and write, and some of them got to be too efficient with the writing, because they learned how to write too many passes so the patty rollers wouldn't get them. That was the onlyest time I ever knowed Ole Miss to have the slaves punished. Ole Miss never allowed no mistreating the slaves, cause they was raising slaves for the market, and it wouldn't be good business to mistreat them. Lord, my white folks was rich. They had as many as five or six hundred niggers, men, women, and children. The plantation was big, but I don't remember how many acres... I does remember the cabins was all built in rows, and streets was laid out between the cabins. The chimbies was built out of dirt and sticks, 
And you know, up in Virginia, it got terrible cold, and the snow would pile up. So when the cabins was built, the men throw dirt up under the house to keep the snow and cold out. You might think that dirt would wash out from under the house, but it didn't. It just made them so warm and comfortable we didn't suffer. That was the way with the white folks then. They didn't do no whipping and mistreating of the slaves. Oh, once in a while Ole Miss might slap the cook's face and tell her to bear down round there, and if she wanted the servant boys to hurry, she would say, Cut it, meaning for them to cut some steps and get bout in a hurry. I was the oldest rat in the pond. And cause I ain't hung in the smokehouse, folks thinks I's not as old as I say I is. But child, I's been here. I remembers how Sam used to preach to us when we was at Ole Miss place and when I growed up. I remembers how I used to think nobody was a Christian sepping us Baptist. But I knows better now. And the longer I live, the more I realize that the churches go away cause they leaves off the ordinances of God. Though us has got the Bible and more Christian literature than ever before. My ma's name was Liza Rowlitz, and my daddy's name was Joseph Holmes. My daddy had the same name as the people what owned him, and my grandma's name was Lucy Holmes. Grandma Lucy lived to be a hundred years old, and she was the first person I ever see dead. It took three days to bury a person then, cause they dug the graves as deep as yo is tall which means more than five feet deep. Lord sakes of living, us had great times. I forgot to tell you that us had homemade beds with two sides nailed to the wall, and the mattresses was made out of wheat straw. That reminds me that there weren't no poor cattle in them times, cause you could go what they thrashed the wheat and get all the straw you wanted and feed the dry cattle on it, and you wouldn't believe the fruit us did have. You don't never see the like down this way, such as apples, cherries, quinces, peaches, and pears. As for hunting, I done plenty of it, and one thing I got to get forgiveness for was when I left Virginia, I left about sixty or seventy snares set to catch rabbits and birds. My ma had eight children, and we was raised in pairs. I had a sister who come along with me, and if I jumped in the river to swim, she did it too. If I clumb a tree or went through a briar patch, she done it right behind me. Ma wanted to know why her clothes was so tore up, and when day was pretty, we'd make it right with Ma by having a rabbit or coon with us, and sometimes a mud turtle. And as for possums and coons, us catch them in plenty. About the fruit, it makes my mouth water to think about them cheese apples. That was yeller like gold, and those Abraham apples, the like of which ain't now to be had, and those cherry trees as big as these oaks, with long limbs and big sugar and sweetheart and black heart cherries. Then there was another kind of cherry called a gorilla, that was round and growed as big as the yeller plums down this way. Now, let me tell you something about Virginia. It had its own law about drink. They made the best peach and cherry brandy, and most any kind you ever heard of. Seppin' they didn't allow you to make drink out of anything you could make into bread. Now you understands, such as corn and rye. Us had our brandy same as you would coffee. In case it was cold, and some mornings us would get up, and the snow would be halfway up the door, and the men would have to ditch it out, so us could get out of the house. On them real cold mornings, my daddy would get the brandy out, and my mom would put a little water and sugar with it, and give it to us children. And then she'd take some in her mouth, and put it in the baby's mouth, and it would open its eyes and stamp its foot rail, part like. Us never thought nothing of drinking. I kind of believes that old infidel Ingersoll, who said that anything that was the custom, was the religion. Folks was a heap kind of hearted den, they is now, cause they keep big dogs to hunt up people lost in the snow. They all seem more happy, cause they was all busy. At night, instead of wasting their time, they would go to the big house and spin and weave and make clothes. I can hear that old loom humming now, 
and see great cards of cloth coming out, and them was closed in that was made from it. It took fire to get them off in you they was so strong. I doesn't remember what they used for dye, but I knows they used Copera's as sizing to hold the colors. Some of the cloth was dyed red, blue, and black. I just can't remember about the dye, but they used Copera's. That was the qualification of the intelligence of the primitive age, and using that Copera's. They not only made our clothes, but also made out hats. Of course, they wasn't very hatty. They was more cappy. They made them with tabs over the ears and tie under the chin, and was they warm, I'll say. Now, when you ask us about hog killing time, that was the time. For weeks, the men would haul wood and big rocks and pile it all together as high as that house, then have several piles like these round a big hole in the ground, what had been filled with water. Then just a little after midnight, the boss would blow the old horn, and all the men would get up and get in them hog pens. Then they would set that pile of wood on fire and then start knocking them hogs in the head. Us never shot a hog like they does now. Us always used an axe to kill him with. At a knock in the hog in the head, they would tie a rope on its leg, and out of water got to the right heat from those red-hot rocks, what had been pushed out of that pile of new in the wood into the water. They would throw the hog in and drag it around a while, and take him out and have him clean in about three pair of minutes. At he was clean, they hung him up, and then later cut him up and hung him in the smokehouse and smoke em with great old clogs. Huh, they don't cure meat now. They just use some kind of brush-on liquid. But they don't have meat like us did. Didn't come cone shucking time. My goodness, I just would love to be there now. The corn would be piled up high, and one man would get on that pile. It usually was one was kind of nigger foreman that could sing and get to work out of the other niggers. This farmer was singing verse something like this. Poke and Clay went to war, and Poke came back with a broken jaw. Then all the niggers would sing back to him, and hello, a kind of shouting sound. Generally, this farmer made up his songs by picking them up from what he had heard white folks tell of wars. But, miss, you know what was the motor power of the corn shucking? It was the old jug that was brung round every hour. That's the onlyest time... Any of the slaves really got drunk. I wish I could remember those old songs, but all that hello done left me, cause the onlyest singing I hears now is the good old sisters singing and saying Amen. In days gone by, I went to plenty of dances and candy pullings, but I doesn't do that any more. I was a preacher, and when I first left Virginia, I came to Georgia and stayed there twenty years, and I kicked up a plenty of dust in Georgia. I even taught school and built a plenty of churches there. Then I come on to Alabama and lived in Evergreen for about twenty more years, and I built a two-story brick church there. Since I's been in Mobile, I's worked by that Bineville Square for twenty-eight years, for such men as Old Man Simon, Damrich, and Van Antwerp, and all their children has been in these arms. I's been a square citizen and there hasn't been but one time in my life I's had to call on anybody, and that was when I had to call on Uncle Sam when Old Man Depression got me. But thank God I was still able to be about and have all my faculties, except that my eyesight is a little poorly. I still has all my teeth, except in one, and my ma always took pride in my hair. You see how fine and silky it is? And it ain't snow white yet. There is one thing to be thankful for, that is, cause I so near home. End of section 59, read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, February 10th, 2023.